This novel is possible because of a Patreon member request. You can become a Patreon member if you want to request. The link to my Patreon account is given at video discretion. It helps a lot thanks for watching this video. Also if you want to support the author of this novel, the link of the author's credit is given below. Chapter 126, Kryptonian? Are you talking about me? Equals 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 equals. The spaceship crashed on Earth, and there's a dying alien with purple skin. This should be Aubin S.U.R. David waved his hand, and the gravitational field, like a giant hand, smoothly grabbed the escape pod from the seawater to the beach. He looked at the ring on his finger. I just don't know whether it was Clark or I who got the Green Lantern ring that should have belonged to Hal Jordan. Hey, how are you feeling? After seeing the alien being in a daze, Clark quickly opened the transparent pod door and tried to stop the bleeding by pressing Aubin Sir's chest. Don't die soon, I'll take you to the hospital right away. Although he knew the hope was slim, maybe this alien with bleeding purple blood had a body structure similar to humans. No. Aubin Sir weakly shook his head, struggling to fulfill the final duty of a Green Lantern. Cough, cough, my name is Aubin Sir, the guardian of the Green Lantern Corps in Sector 2814 of the universe. The power of fear was eroding his body, and he couldn't hold on for much longer. Don't speak anymore, now you need to conserve your strength. You'll be at the nearest hospital in five seconds. Listening to the horrifying sight of him coughing up blood while speaking, Clark wanted to pick up Aubin Sir and hurry to the nearest hospital. Let him speak, Clark. David held his shoulder to stop him and shook his head. The medical facilities on Earth can't save him. As one of the most advanced technological creations in the universe, the lantern ring itself had healing capabilities. If it could heal, it wouldn't activate the process of choosing a successor. There was nothing he could do for the life of this honest and upright green lantern. Even the Dionysian factor might not be of any use. David's gaze swept over the terrifying power of fear, which was like maggots on Aubin Sir's horrifying injuries. I don't have much time, Aubin Sir nodded with difficulty. Clark looked complicated. An alien who was still alive, although it was impossible to be of the same race as him, was the only alien visitor he had ever encountered, and yet they had just met, and the other was about to die. According to the Corps' regulations, I, I must choose a successor for the Lantern Ring before I die. This time is somewhat special, with me also having the Lantern Ring of my comrade Vontara of Sector 2811. Aubin Sir first looked at Clark, then at David again. David understood that the ring on Clark's hand should belong to Aubin Sir, which confirmed his earlier guess. As Superman, Clark has been sought out by the Lantern Ring more than once in the comics, and even initially, when Aubin Sir was on the brink of death, the strong will the Lantern Ring sought was Clark's. But because of his Kryptonian identity, Aubin Sir had to find someone else, and he got Hal Jordan. They didn't know what the outcome of this situation would be. David's eyes brightened slightly, and he suddenly thought that the members of the Green Lantern Corps all possessed extraordinary abilities and played crucial roles in the universe, and they might offer more emotional points than Atlantis. What makes it even more special is not just the decision to choose successors for two Lantern Rings but also your identities, a Kryptonian and an unknown, powerful race. The Lantern Ring selection process had somehow chosen two aliens on this planet full of billions of native life forms, and Aubin Sir didn't know what to say. Kryptonian? Are you talking about me? Clark pointed to himself, looking somewhat surprised. Nearly 20 years had passed, would he finally have a chance to learn about his own heritage? But what was going on with his brother's unknown, powerful? I'm from Earth, David said, shaking his head slightly. David knew it must be his mutant eternal physique that caused Aubin Sir to fall into a misunderstanding. All his other templates were from Earth, only the Thanos template was different. The ring has chosen you. Wear it, put on the ring, aim it at the lantern, recite the oath, and you will become a member of the Green Lantern Corps, bearing great honor and responsibility. Aubin Sir didn't have time to determine if they were suitable candidates or not. It looked like neither of them were greedy nor malicious people. Seeing an alien in a high-tech spaceship on the verge of death, they had no ulterior motives. One of them even wanted to save him. He tremblingly pointed his finger at the lantern under the seat of the escape pod, which charged the lantern ring. The universe needs you. I have fulfilled my last duty as a green lantern. I hope. I hope the universe can survive this crisis. There had been a long and unpleasant history between Krypton and the Green Lantern Corps, almost to the point of enmity. A Kryptonian not being allowed to become a lantern was an unwritten rule, even though it was not explicitly stated in the Corps' code. However, in the face of the current universal crisis, Aubin Sir felt that this was one of the rare times when he could break the rules. The universe needs more powerful Green Lanterns to protect it. After silently reciting the last sentence in his heart, Aubin Sir, one of the greatest Green Lanterns, closed his eyes and passed away. Core members? Hope that the universe will survive the crisis. Clark was at a loss as he stared at the lifeless body in front of him. He instinctively resisted joining any core, but it seemed like the universe was in danger. He looked at David, hoping to get some answers from his brother. Although David shouldn't know about alien matters, the impression his brother always left him with was that there were very few things he didn't know. The Green Lantern Corps, led by the Guardians of the Universe, claims to be responsible for maintaining order in the universe. They wield the power of will as their weapon. David briefly introduced the Green Lantern Corps. As for the so-called universal crisis, it should be referring to the entity Parallax. It sounds like a core of selfless people, worthy of respect. 
Upon hearing Clark's words, David had a faint, contemptuous smile. In brightest day, in blackest night, no evil shall escape my sight. Let those who worship evil's might. Beware my power. Green Lantern's light. Is this enough? The ring had transmitted the oath. In the attic of the farm, following David's lead, Clark hesitantly aimed the lantern ring at the Green Lantern and recited the oath. After a burst of green light, the full functionality of the lantern ring was officially unlocked. A suit of armor woven from the power of will covered Clark's body. This feels very uncomfortable, Clark said, feeling uncomfortable as he looked at the green light emanating from his suit. He hated the color green. Clark didn't have any intention of joining a universal core and leaving his family and home planet to protect the peace of the universe. However, what Avin Sir had said about the universal crisis before his death made him care. Earth is also a part of the universe. If something happens to the universe, Earth can't escape it. Furthermore, he wanted to know about his own heritage, and why he, as a baby, had been sent to Earth through some kind of program many years ago. What about his family, his people? After the ring was unlocked, a lot of information related to the lantern ring flooded into Clark's mind, and he quickly learned about the things related to the Green Lantern Corps. A lantern of the Kryptonian race, David, who was standing nearby, crossed his arms and had a slightly strange expression. This was probably something that had never happened in the million-year history of the Green Lantern Corps. How is this possible? As he browsed through the information stored in the ring, Clark couldn't help but change his expression when he finished reviewing the information related to Krypton. His expression changed and he looked at his brother in panic. I, I am a descendant of a naturally cold-blooded cosmic colonial empire. Seeing Clark's reaction, David was shocked and waved his hand, and the information recorded in the lantern ring materialized into a holographic screen. Unlike the detailed information about cosmic races or factions in the universe, the entry about Krypton was short, only a short page and a few sentences. Krypton, located in Sector 2183 of the universe, was a life-bearing planet in the Andromeda Galaxy. It no longer exists. As former colonizers of the universe, the time period Kryptonians thrived the most, when they still existed, was when countless inhabited worlds were colonized by them. It was a long dark era of the universe. The internal system of Kryptonians was ancient and decadent, with innate limitations on their abilities. How much they can achieve is determined at their birth. The ruling class suppressed individuality, and social hierarchies were unmovable. Each Kryptonian was born as a naturally cold-blooded and powerful machine. David raised an eyebrow, understanding why Clark had reacted that way. No one would feel comfortable knowing they were descendants of colonizers who had brought dark years of humiliation to the universe. My home world is destroyed, and I'm the descendant of naturally cold-blooded cosmic colonizers. Is this, is this true? Clark looked at David, urgently seeking answers. He couldn't help but recall Lady Cassandra's prophecy once again. After returning home, David told Clark some of the things he knew, such as the fact that this planet was not as simple as it seemed and hides ancient things and races older than human civilization. He had had some contact with the Atlanteans and had learned things that ordinary people didn't know. As for his conquest of Atlantis and becoming the ruler of the Seven Seas, David didn't feel the need to discuss it further. Half of it is true, he nodded. Krypton was indeed a former colonial empire in the universe, and it had colonized almost every known inhabited world at its most powerful. The group of little blue people who claim to maintain the order of the universe is also those who group of people called themselves the Guardians of the Universe, leading the Green Lantern Corps to fight against the Kryptonians. However, a hundred thousand Kryptonians are said to possess the power to destroy the universe, and there were far more than a hundred thousand Kryptonians on Krypton at that time. The Lanterns, who have been through countless battles and tempered by life or death trials, couldn't even defeat an ordinary Kryptonian who had been casually exposed to a yellow sun, David said. As for the outcome of that battle, the little blue smurfs didn't speak much about it, but when they did, they described it as the darkest era they had ever experienced, and the results were self-evident. The Green Lantern Corps, who had always claimed to maintain universal order, did not bravely sacrifice themselves in the face of the evil enemy that was colonizing the entire universe. Instead, they formed an alliance with Krypton, claiming to maintain universal peace together. This was why David couldn't control his laughter when he heard Clark say that before. From what I know, the internal structure of Kryptonians is indeed decadent and corrupt. The son of a general is born to be a general, and the son of a scientist is destined to be a scientist. However, that's a far cry from being born naturally cold-blooded. David shook his head and said seriously, Clark, you are who you are, and you don't need others to define you. Can't you feel what kind of person you are? It was normal that those little blue idiots inserted their own biases into their own army's internal information. Those shameless smurfs were notorious for double standards, claiming to maintain universal order. In fact, many crises that nearly destroyed the universe were caused by them. With David's comfort and reassurance, Clark felt much better. As for the fact that Krypton had long been destroyed, it was shocking, but the impact wasn't as great as it might have been. He had previously guessed what could have happened to make a baby be sent on a spaceship to another planet, and over the years, no one from his family or people had come looking for him. Looking up at the direction of the Andromeda galaxy in the night sky, he couldn't help but think about when his homeland had also shown there, but now it was gone. Clark lowered his head, feeling a sense of loneliness. But then he thought about it, his own family was right here with him. 
What mattered now was protecting his loved ones and his hometown. So, you two were chosen by rings from outer space, brought in front of a dying alien, and selected to join a core that maintains peace in the universe. After breakfast, Jonathan was sipping hot tea, and he almost spewed it out with a weird expression on his face. If he didn't know how special his two sons were, he would have thought they were making up nonsense. But even knowing his son's abilities, the idea of some alien core and whatnot, Jonathan couldn't help putting down his teacup and sitting up straight. That's right, Clark nodded bravely, despite his discomfort. A core. Martha looked worried. It won't be dangerous, David reassured her. He and Clark had originally not planned to tell their parents about this. However, when they saw them being taken away by the green light on TV, they had to explain. Actually, we don't plan to join them. David had suggested that they shouldn't mention the cosmic crisis to avoid worrying their parents. Clark hesitated for a moment but also agreed. Avin Sir spoke of it in a terrifying way, the crisis of the entire universe. David shook his head subtly. Although the parallax, an entity representing one of the seven emotional spectrum powers in the universe, the power of fear, was powerful enough to destroy civilizations, it seemed like an exaggeration to say it could affect the entire universe. The so-called cosmic crisis was probably just referring to the destruction of the Blue Little Smurfs and the Green Lantern Corps and the imbalance in the universal order caused by the absence of the Green Lantern Corps. However, whether the universe will be in danger is uncertain. Earth, on the other hand, is definitely under imminent threat, David said. He knew that according to the plot, Parallax would track the severely injured Obinsur to Earth, as he was the legendary Green Lantern who had once defeated it. Even though Obinsur was not worth mentioning being far weaker than it after absorbing the life forces of two planetary civilizations. However, Parallax had accumulated endless hatred for Avinsur while imprisoned within the core of a planet, and it wouldn't rest until it saw Avinsur dead and his body reduced to ashes. Mom, Dad, we might need to leave for a while. Clark hesitated, go, and solve the problem of our core identities. How could Clark sit still when he heard that the universe was facing a crisis? He wanted to go to the core headquarters on OA, as recorded in the Green Lantern Rings data, to find out what was happening and see what he could contribute with his powers. For the sake of the universe, and for Earth, he clenched his fist silently. David fell into a brief silence, unsure of how to explain that Parallax would soon be chasing them to Earth. However, he suddenly sensed something through the gravitational field and turned to look. A figure, drastically different in bodily structure from a human, with fish-like fins on its head and bald, shiny skin, was flying towards the farm. The figure wore a sleek suit of armor and had a green lantern ring on his hand. Maybe we won't need to, someone's here, David said. Equals 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 equals. Don't forget to send your power stones. Chapter 127, Guardians of the Universe. Equals 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 equals. Oh wait, within the cold and majestic open air temple. Above each towering stone pillar, there stood a cosmic guardian with blue skin, resembling old elders of a cultivation sect, they were the masters of OA, the founders of the Green Lantern Corps. Their faces are indifferent, as if devoid of any excess emotion, as they looked down below. A huge pillar of light has vanished from the cosmos. Looking up at the stone-like guardians of the universe, Sinestro felt sorrow for his mentor, who was both a teacher and a friend and at the same time felt anger. The inhabitants of two planets have been annihilated by an unknown enemy, the one who wields the power of yellow fear, and we still don't know who it is. Avinsur only uttered one phrase before his demise the parallax. Sinestro glared angrily at the guardians of the universe, hoping they could provide an answer, something more than the simple order given to core members to search for the enemy and prepare for battle. We are aware, and we will assess this disaster before deciding whether to invest on a larger scale. The voices of the guardians of the universe, who have lived from the beginning of the universe until now, remained unwavering. Assess, guardians, I can lead the core to confront this formidable enemy. I will prove to you that our golden age has not passed. But I want to know what you're truly hiding. Sinestro's tone was intense. The members of the Green Lantern Corps joined the Corps to safeguard cosmic order and justice, not to become mere robotic soldiers blindly following orders without knowing the details. The Guardians fell silent for a moment. Guardians, no one knows how long you've lived or how powerful you are, but one thing is universally acknowledged, that is, you possess knowledge as vast as the universe itself. There is almost nothing you do not know, but this time why? Why is the message conveying the mission so brief? Taking two steps forward in excitement, he loudly questioned, almost unable to control his emotions. The lives of core members can be sacrificed for the safety of the universe, but they should not die meaninglessly, oblivious to everything happening. The power of will has always been the core's weapon for us to combat the darkness in the universe. However, when this power is insufficient. Finally, one of the guardians spoke. Among us, there has been intense debate about whether to utilize the power we have sworn never to use the power of fear. The Green Lantern Corps has maintained order and peace in the universe for billions of years, but the dark forces in the universe have not always succumbed below their green light, as seen with Krypton or the New Gods. Although Sinestro did not know the past history of the core, he suspected a connection between this and the cryptic dark ages mentioned in the Book of OA. The power of fear is too unpredictable, with a high risk of corruption. Another guardian looked at a broken pillar in the temple and continued. 
The emotional spectrum of power in the universe red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet becomes less influential on its users as they approach the center of the spectrum. For example, the green power of will has almost no effect on its user, while the other types of power vary in their impact. One of us, in an attempt to prove that fear can be controlled, had noble intentions but a naive perspective. He delved directly into fear itself, ultimately being consumed by it and becoming our enemy. This is the origin of parallax. Before it grew powerful by feeding on fear, the Guardians had asked Obin Sir to imprison it deep underground on a lifeless planet. But now, it has escaped and grown increasingly powerful. Sinestro, who had become arguably the strongest Green Lantern since Obin Sir's death, raised an eyebrow and remained silent for a small while before asking, is the power of fear stronger than the power of will? One of the Guardians of the Universe nodded. The power of will derives entirely from one's own will. The strength of one's own will determines the extent of power that can be harnessed, but it often has limits. Fear, on the other hand, is different, it can draw strength from the fear of others. Infinite life, infinite fear, symbolizes infinite power. The Green Lantern Corps has upheld cosmic justice for countless ages, and its reputation resonates throughout the universe. Just catching a glimpse of the Corps' light is enough to make countless evildoers tremble. You can only imagine the kind of power that represents. Parallax may have absorbed the fear of multiple civilizations. His strength, can our warriors resist it? Sinestro's complexion changed slightly, his brow furrowing. Suddenly, he realized something crucial. The guardians of the universe exchanged glances and fell silent for a moment. In this case, we have no choice. We must combat fear with fear. Sinestro wondered how the guardians of the universe truly regarded the core members? If he didn't ask, what would be the result? The lives of the fearless and righteous warriors of the cores would be regarded as the consequence of the secret the guardians wanted to hide. Sinestro clenched his fist tightly to suppress his anger, and a few traces of respect appeared on his stern face. I believe we need to forge a yellow power ring. The ring is right here, take it. One of them extended an open palm, and a yellow power ring floated towards Sinestro, its gleam reflecting in his eyes. The power of fear and the power of will share the same source. You don't need training to harness its power. Core members have determined that Parallax is on its way to a life-bearing planet called Earth. He waved his hand to display an image the Parallax, resembling a flowing desert of death, flying through the cold void of space, heading in a specific direction with great momentum. Your task now is to use the core's reputation built over billions of years to solve this crisis for the universe. The guardian of the universe warned, but remember, be cautious of the corruption of fear. I will, Sinestro affirmed. With the yellow power ring clenched in his hand, Sinestro's heart raced. He dared not put on the ring in the temple, holding back his excitement, turned and swiftly departed. In the ancient temple, only the guardians of the universe who guarded the order of the universe remained. After a long silence, a voice devoid of emotion broke the stillness, the reputation accumulated by the core over countless years will make him incredibly powerful, but he may not necessarily be able to defeat and capture Parallax. Don't worry, there are still powerful life forms such as the Kryptonians and that unknown race. One of them gazed apathetically at the vast cosmic nebula. I've arranged for someone to guide them. Boom, Tomar re soared in from outer space, following the directions indicated by the flashing lantern ring. He was about to enter the small town to meet with the two newly chosen candidate lanterns. However, he suddenly encountered a powerful resistance, as if he had fallen into a quagmire, making it almost impossible to approach. He became vigilant, thinking he had encountered an enemy. The green light quickly condensed into a high-tech suit resembling spacesuit. Why didn't the lantern ring give a warning? The powerful and invisible force filled the airspace above the small town, leaving Tomari astonished by its magnitude, his gaze darting around in vigilance. Two green figures ascended from the town. David looked at the alien before him and slightly frowned. Just now, he didn't want a random stranger to run over to his home, so he used his gravity manipulation to stop the person outside the town. In the Green Lantern Corps, most lanterns are honest, fearless, and trustworthy people. But the little blue guys who lead the Corps are not. In midair, Clark Kent experienced a wonderful sensation. He was flying effortlessly, just like a bird without flapping its wings. It reminded him of the feeling of flying in his dreams, T slash N, I think Clark hasn't learned flight in this FIC. Though it could be plot hole if it was mentioned in previous chapters. New recruits, I'm Tomari of Sector 2813. It seems you're adapting quite well. Tomari sounded surprised. Many of those chosen by lantern rings are initially scared and disoriented by the ring's power. He was keenly aware that these two successors chosen by the ring seemed to be extraordinary, like the strange force he had encountered earlier. Wait a minute, are you a Kryptonian? Hovering a few meters away, Tomari saw Clark and received a notification from the lantern ring, and felt as if he had seen a ghost. Isn't Krypton supposed to be destroyed? Every member selected by the Lantern Ring undergoes familiarization with the ring and combat training before formally becoming a Green Lantern, usually through a mentorship system. The Corps' orders didn't tell me I'd be training a Kryptonian, Tomari glanced at the sun overhead. And you are a Kryptonian who has been under a yellow sun. And you, are an unknown species in the universe, not recorded in the Power Ring's database? The Ring's assessment of you is an unknown life form with potential rivaling that of a Kryptonian. Tomari felt that the surprises he had encountered today were already enough. 
What could he even teach these two? I'm afraid only the experience of using the lantern ring. In fact, we don't plan to join your corps, David stated, facing the alien who had just delivered a lengthy speech just after meeting and resembled a fishman. He had no interest in leaving the Earth behind and putting out fires all over the universe under the leadership of those little blue smurfs. Are you the same? Tomari looked at Clark, who was looking at him with curiosity. He was no stranger to such looks, having been assigned responsibility for over 80,000 star systems in his sector. Joining the Corps is entirely voluntary. But I suggest you both take some time to learn more. You have no idea what an honor it is to be a part of the Corps. Tomari was about to provide a detailed introduction to the history of the Green Lantern Corps. Meanwhile, David stroked his chin, deep in thought. This Tomari was just an ordinary member of the Green Lantern Corps. He might not be aware of the message that the Lantern Ring had transmitted to the central headquarters on OA. However, it was highly unlikely that the Guardians of the Universe were ignorant of Clark's presence. Do the Guardians, knowing that Clark is a Kryptonian, treat him as an ordinary candidate for the Corps, have they given up the millions of years-long rejection of Kryptonians? David was skeptical that the situation was not as simple as it seemed. He suspected that a major conflict might be looming, with the Guardians intending to exploit Clark and his powers. Abin Sir informed us that the universe appears to be facing a crisis, Clark interjected, getting straight to the point. David felt somewhat resigned, but his brother was eager to let others take advantage of him. Abin Sur. Tomari sighed with emotion, thinking about his deep friendship with Abin Sir, as their sectors were adjacent, and they had developed a strong bond over the years. It wasn't just the loss of his dear friend, the Green Lantern Corps had lost a fearless and great lantern. You're right. Parallax roams this sector of the universe, consuming life through fear wherever he goes. When he accumulates enough strength, he might attack away. For millions of years, no single person has dared to launch an offensive against us. His expression grew solemn, and he pursed his lips, speaking softly to himself. I suspect this is why the guidance mission was so hastily organized. Under normal circumstances, the process of guiding new recruits involved bringing the backup lanterns to OA first, where they would complete their training. At the very least, it was essential to give the new recruits a glimpse of the Corps' past glory and history, helping them understand the honor and responsibility that came with being a lantern. All right, those responsibilities will be handled by our official Corps members. We already have people searching for Parallax's whereabouts, Tomari said, his attitude indicating that while they were facing a powerful enemy, Parallax was not necessarily an insurmountable disaster. He smiled and continued, Now, let me introduce you to the abilities of the Power Rings. David shook his head inwardly. Tomari had not encountered Parallax, and in fact, almost no existing Green Lanterns had. Even if Parallax was a creation of the Guardians, one thing the Guardians were skilled at was concealing their dark history. To this day, members of the Green Lantern Corps remained unaware of Parallax's power. Ordinary Green Lanterns are like a candle in the wind when facing Parallax. The emotional spectrum, one of the fundamental sources of energy in the universe, was an energy field generated by the emotions of all living beings in the universe. Each type of emotion had a corresponding conscious energy entity known as a lantern entity. Lantern entities need to bond with a life form to fully harness their powers. Parallax is the lantern entity of the power of fear, and its current host was originally one of the guardians. However, the Green Lantern Corps members at the forefront of this situation were in no rush, and David shared their patience. As one of the entities in the emotional spectrum, Parallax's power and importance to the fate of the universe are undeniable. If he could make Parallax resentful, he might be able to provide a substantial amount of emotional points. A glint flashed in his eyes. Moreover, Parallax itself is a very high-level entity, and his current body couldn't display his full strength at all. Right now is a rare opportunity. However, Parallax had not yet arrived on Earth, so there was no need to rush. While Clark was anxious to act because of the potential danger into universe, he noticed that Tomari didn't seem overly concerned. He realized that the Green Lantern Corps had safeguarded the universe for countless eons, and they should be incredibly powerful. As an outsider, he didn't want to appear more worried than the intergalactic law enforcement officers. Clark remained skeptical and didn't say anything more. Tomari led them to a quiet and uninhabited wilderness, where he demonstrated the power of the Lantern Ring and recounted the history of the Corps using its power. The Guardians use the power of will as the Corps' weapon, and it's the most potent force in the universe. Across the 3,600 sectors of the universe, peace and order are maintained under the green light of willpower. If you can master it proficiently, you can accomplish almost anything. Anything. Clark had to voice his doubt. Wouldn't that be the same as the Almighty God? On the other hand, David remained calm, knowing that Tomari's words weren't an exaggeration. He lowered his gaze to the power ring in his hand, his eyes gleaming with curiosity. The emotional spectrum is the power of idealism, and as long as a lantern's willpower is strong enough, with a single lantern ring, you can reach the upper limits of willpower's potential. Shattering planets, creating stars nothing is out of reach. David paused for a moment, thinking to himself. I wonder how much of the power of willpower I can unleash with this lantern ring. Equals 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 equals. Don't forget to send your power stones. Chapter 128, Taste the Wrath of This Planet? Equals 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 equals. Lantern Ring can turn fantasies in the mind into reality, create everything, simulate nature. 
from something as vast as a black hole or a star to something as small as a handsaw or a screw, but their power and hardness depend on your will. Tomar rewaved his hand, and the power of his will materialized into a glass bottle suspended in midair. He flicked his finger, and it produced a crisp sound, as if it were a genuine glass bottle. Now, you two try, he encouraged, looking at the two with a smile. Clark extended his hand in amazement, holding his breath as he tried. The green light was shaped by his mind and a slightly crooked glass bottle appeared midair. Compared to Tomari's construct, his looked like a defective product. Imagine more details, it's normal to be unskilled at the beginning. Tomari commented, then turned to David. David raised his hand, and the green light condensed. In an instant, a slender-necked Klein bottle appeared in the air. He raised an eyebrow, looking at the lantern ring in his hand. It's a wonderful feeling, like controlling a universal printer with your thoughts. Oh. Tomari looked at David in surprise, moving his gaze away from the strange bottle. I've never seen a newcomer grasp the power of will so quickly. If there weren't records of David in the lantern ring, he might have thought an experienced lantern was standing before him. David remained calm. Among the abilities he possessed, controlling energy, especially manipulating gravity, required extremely precise manipulation. It was similar to manipulating the power of will in its own way. Now, let's see how strong your wills are. Tomar re-manipulated the bottle to collide with Clark's bottle, the most direct way to test whose will was stronger. The sound of clashing rang out, Clark's bottle shattered, and the remaining bottle also developed cracks, breaking into scattered points of light. He was somewhat surprised. Leaving aside the fact that Clark's lack of attention to detail when constructing the bottle was lacking, both bottles broke together. Doesn't it mean that this young man in front of him has a stronger will than a seasoned lantern who has experienced many battles? Tomari didn't harbor any doubts either. Everyone has willpower, but in peaceful environments, it's generally not easy to highlight their strength or weakness. Although the young man before him may have grown up in a peaceful environment, still not having ventured into society and appearing somewhat naive, he might have immense potential. When encountering difficulties, he might unleash an impressive and powerful will. Very impressive. Now it's your turn. If the young Kryptonian before him were to join the Corps, he might achieve even greater success than he himself did in the Corps. Tomari nodded in approval and turned to David, creating another glass bottle to collide with David's. Crack, crack. Several cracks appeared, but it wasn't the bottle that David, a novice, had constructed. Tomari's glass bottle shattered into pieces, while the strangely shaped Klein bottle created by David remained intact in midair. Tomari was taken aback, his eyes widening. Are all the newcomers nowadays monsters? He kept glancing between the two. Yet another person with stronger willpower, but he didn't know who among these two newcomers was stronger. David maintained a calm expression and dispelled the bottle with a wave of his hand. He once killed the son of Zeus, the ancient god of war, frightened away a host body housing the power of the six demon kings of hell, single-handedly captured the island created by the gods known as Paradise Island, and conquered the Atlantean race that ruled the seven seas. A bit of amazement from an alien was hardly something to make him happy. As Tomari prepared to impart some tips on using the lantern ring's power to the two newcomers, his own lantern ring suddenly lit up with a message from the OA headquarters. After reading it, his face froze, finding it somewhat unbelievable. The parallax entity has arrived at Sector 2814, on the life-bearing planet known as Earth. Tomari, responsible for Sector 2813, you need to lead two new core members and, alongside the imminent arrival of parallax, stop and eliminate the entity, ensuring the protection of Earth's civilization from destruction. Having rookies who are just starting to familiarize themselves with the lantern rings engage in battle immediately, and against such a powerful enemy rarely seen in the history of the core. What's the difference between this and teaching someone to pull the trigger and then immediately throwing them into a meat grinder battlefield? Tomari quickly moved aside and communicated urgently with the headquarters through his lantern ring, expressing his doubts and concerns. However, the response he received was an unquestionable command from the founders of the core. The powerful enemy threatening the entire universe is currently at large. If we allow Parallax to continue to grow in power, no one in the universe will be spared from the disasters it will unleash. The Green Lantern Corps must mobilize all available resources to eliminate the darkness. Now, there's some very bad news for you. With the fate of the universe hanging in the balance, Tomari began to speak but hesitated as he walked up to the two of them. Parallax is heading towards this planet under our feet, and I know this is extremely unfair to you, but the Corps needs both of you to intercept Parallax. We will meet this monster in a while, and you will follow my command. The creature called Parallax? Is it on its way here? Clark was greatly shocked. If it's a universal disaster, why is the Earth the precise center of conflict? On the other hand, David was somewhat calm because he had known that Parallax was coming. Wait a moment, it seems like it's already here. David's face turned serious as he quickly turned his head to look in a certain direction. Clark closed his eyes and used his super hearing to search and listen. In his ears, he heard the chaos from a city miles away, with people screaming and crying in the midst of the bustling urban area. What's that? Monsters? Help. It's Coast City, David said, using his gravity field sense to perceive the chaos in the city miles away and the huge creature hovering in the city's skies, Parallax. Where are the Green Lantern Corps' members? Clark impatiently asked. The massive monster had already arrived on Earth and was wreaking havoc in the city. 
He had limited experience dealing with this type of creature. They might still be on their way to Earth, Tomari replied, his face tightening with a hint of embarrassment. For now, it might just be up to us. Earlier, he had assured them not to worry about Parallax, as it would be the responsibility of the official Green Lantern Corps members to handle it. However, now that the monster was on Earth and disaster was unfolding, the Corps members had yet to arrive. The three of them quickly ascended into the sky, heading towards Coast City. David glanced at the anxious Clark beside him. Clark was in such a hurry to save people that he didn't realize he was flying faster and faster, far surpassing his still inexperienced lantern ring flight abilities, breaking through hundreds of times the speed of sound within the blink of an eye. David effortlessly kept pace, but Tomari, the veteran lantern, struggled to keep up. His face turned red as he pushed his lantern ring to its limits, but he still couldn't match the speed of the other two. We'll go ahead, David said, and then he began to speed up, with Clark following suit. In the blink of an eye, Tomari could only watch as the two rapidly flew far away, his expression filled with shock. Recalling his earlier words, he suddenly realized that when facing Parallax on the battlefield, it might not be him who was doing the protecting. Above Coast City, the massive and menacing form of Parallax floated in the air, with its thousands of tentacles writhing and grabbing at anything they could reach, and one of them grasped a freshly unearthed corpse. The familiar face was none other than the body of Obinsur. Obinsur, you're finally dead. It's a pity I didn't get to see your face one last time before you died. Dead bodies didn't experience fear, and he couldn't absorb life energy from Obinsur's corpse. Crack, crack, the sound of bones breaking filled the air. Obinsur's body was crushed into a bloody pulp and dropped from the sky, while Parallax's malevolent and greedy eyes turned towards the city below. You can't stop me anymore, Obinsur. Let me show your corpse how I'll suck these fearful bugs dry. Help? Someone come and save us? Oh, God. In the streets of Coast City, cars were overturned, and terrified people who came out from the vehicles looked up in shock, frozen in place. Under the leaden gray clouds that covered the sky, the city was shrouded in the shadow of the gigantic monster. The dark yellow space monster seemed like an embodiment of fear. A single glance at it sent uncontrollable fear surging through one's heart and mind. People's spirits and even their bodies were controlled by fear, causing them to tremble incessantly. Countless frightened people, their hearts pounding and skin crawling, turned to flee. However, they quickly realized in despair that they couldn't outrun the speed at which the monster extended its tentacles. Hiss, it's the smell of fear, Parallax exclaimed with fascination as it deeply inhaled. Its eyes gleamed with malice as it opened its gaping, dark maw, starting to absorb the life energy of the people through their fear. One by one, those who were too close had their faces twisted in terror, and their life energy was drained, leaving behind nothing but skeletal remains scattered on the ground. Stop, Parallax. A booming voice rang out as two figures streaked across the sky, leaving a long trail of air behind them as they flew at breakneck speed from the horizon. This is Parallax who possesses the body of a guardian of the universe. It looks like a space octopus. After a brief look, his eyes emitted thick, purple energy beams that struck Parallax. Clark was covered from head to toe in a green battle suit, and like David, he chose to hide the Green Lantern core symbol on his chest, and his eyes burned with fury. Monster, you will not harm another life. He shouted, and his eyes fired heat vision to attack Parallax. Two beams of light, one red and one purple, streaked across the sky above the city. Accompanied by the terrifying heat that evaporated steel and a continuous barrage, they struck Parallax. The entity howled in pain and was forced back in midair. It's Superman. And the purple light man. The terrified crowd looked up at the two figures in the sky with shining eyes, seeing them as their saviors. They were excited and their faces turned red as they cheered for them. Although Clark had almost exclusively fought crime in Metropolis, and David had rarely appeared in public, both were the subject of much discussion as the only two superpowered people exposed to the public eye. Anyone who browsed the internet would be well aware of them. You insignificant bugs dare to attack me. Parallax was furious. The most important reason was that in the vast sea of fear, he didn't sense a trace of fear emanating from the two men. He roared and unleashed a beam of light formed from the power of fear, sweeping across the sky. Bang, bang, bang. Parallax, having absorbed the life forces of two civilizations, possessed formidable strength. David and Clark raised their arms to defend. Clark was sent flying and tumbled through the air but managed to quickly regain control. His green battle suit was damaged, and his arm was throbbing, turning bright red, but he had suffered no significant injuries. Supported by the power of his gravity field, David was like a nail in the sky, completely unaffected by Parallax's onslaught. After the wave of fear had passed, he remained unscathed. Raising his palm, a yellow aura of fear materialized and shot through the sky with a thunderous force. You should also have a taste of this. After fully merging with the Black King template, David found absorbing any type of energy to be as easy as eating or drinking. How dare you use my power against me? Parallax roared, swinging his tentacles to effortlessly uproot skyscrapers from the ground, hurling them at David. David raised his palm and manipulated the gravity field to suspend all the buildings in midair. Under the boundless power, the skyscrapers have become like toys. There were still surviving humans inside those buildings. David moved those skyscrapers far behind, and Clark, thinking that David might be struggling, flew forward to buy him time, delivering a powerful punch to Parallax's ugly and massive head. A circular shockwave erupted, rippling for miles. 
Parallax was sent reeling back further into the atmosphere. This was a crisis that Clark had never encountered before. Behind him were the people of an entire city, and the numerous white bones on the streets were proof that this monster could easily claim the lives of thousands in an instant. The lives of thousands are at stake behind me. Failure is not an option. Driven by his anger and urgency, Clark unleashed a level of power he had never exhibited before. Buzz, there are too many people here, so let's find another battlefield. Setting down the skyscrapers, David pursued Parallax. He unleashed the aura of fear from his hands as if he had no money in his hand, accelerating the monster's ascent into space. It was a piece of cake, and he didn't mind saving the lives of others. David could perfectly control the absorbed powers, but the fear power was uncomfortable. Using it, he could faintly hear a faint scream of fear in the background, which was somewhat irritating. Fear power does erode one's mind, just as it's suspected. His mental resistance made it feel like he was hearing noise, but others might start to have their minds affected. Parallax. Finally, Tomar re arrived from a distance, and upon seeing the corpses of intelligent life on the ground, his face looked ugly, and he took action in anger. He manipulated his power ring to create a large construct that enveloped Parallax and had a spaceship drag it into space. Although Tomari was one of the more outstanding and powerful Green Lanterns in the core, his strength was still far too weak compared to Parallax. All you annoying lanterns deserve to die. The green energy construct, like a fragile spider's web, infuriated Parallax. It broke apart with the slightest movement, but it made him angry, causing him to shoot out energy torrents from its eyes. Get out of the way. Clark quickly flashed in to help Tomari, raising his arm to block the attack. Buzz? Just the fear aura splashing through Clark's body was enough to send Tomari, who constructed a shield to resist, flying away and narrowly avoiding crashing through a skyscraper. Blood oozed from the corners of his mouth, his internal organs were injured, and he felt like he had come close to death's door. He had never realized that he, who was guarding tens of thousands of star systems, was so weak. The aftermath of Parallax's casual attack nearly killed him. Tomari felt a chill run down his spine. Over 90% of the lanterns in the core were not as strong as him. Can the core's power really deal with this terrifying monster? He began to doubt uncontrollably. Do you want to destroy this planet? Then taste the wrath of this planet, Parallax. The global life that Parallax sought to consume also included Jonathan and Martha. David's eyes turned cold as he unleashed his full power. He swung his fist, releasing a torrent of cosmic energy, and at the same time used the gravitational field of the planet beneath him to strike Parallax from the air, knocking it backward and sending it flying back dozens of kilometers with each blow. Insect, I'll turn you into cosmic dust. Despite being disoriented and enraged during the relentless barrage, Parallax's counterattacks did not inflict any harm on David. The attacks hit him like water off a duck's back. My gods. Tomari, who had just experienced how terrifying Parallax was, watched in awe as David continued to ferociously pummel the monster. His mouth hung open and he was unable to find words to express his shock. Equals 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 equals. Don't forget to send your power stones. Chapter 129, A Pathway to Death. Equals 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 equals. In the broadcast on TV screens, two figures and a huge monster were battling in the sky, constantly pushing it toward outer space. What is that thing? Coast City was attacked by space monsters, and over a thousand people died. My goodness, are aliens attacking Earth? Purple Light Man, Superman, come on. Is the fate of Earth all in the hands of these two superheroes? What is NASA doing, spending so much money in space every year? Why didn't they issue a warning in advance? Is this a new technology made to make movies? How did they get Superman and Purple Light Man involved? What is the military doing? Are they just standing by? It's fake. This is the conspiracy of the government. The internet exploded. Everyone who saw the colossal monster's silhouette couldn't help but feel fear rising uncontrollably in their hearts. They prayed for Superman and Purple Light Man, and at the same time prayed for the Earth. Gotham, Wayne Manor. Bruce Wayne stared intently at the high-definition satellite broadcast by his own satellite, repeatedly clicking a ballpoint pen. The veins on the back of his hand were slightly tensing, revealing his inner turmoil. Master Bruce, you should know. Your Batwing isn't equipped for space combat, Alfred, who was next to him, remarked as he watched the battle on the screen, feeling the need to remind him. I know, Alfred. You don't need to remind me that I can only sit here and do nothing. Bruce's voice was somewhat hoarse. This was a powerful monster, not like the criminals he used to encounter who liked robbing banks. The bat equipment needs an upgrade. I need more contingency plans to ensure that I won't be just a spectator next time. He now had to not only guard against hidden threats within the city and the world, but also against extraterrestrial and space threats. The changes in the world were too fast. Master Bruce, you have no obligation to bear the weight of the entire world on your shoulders. Alfred looked suffocated. This child he had watched grow up was now living a life that was too exhausting, often returning to his bat cave battered and bruised. Gotham was wearing him out. Bruce Wayne's identity had almost become his mask, a role played by Batman when he took off his costume. When the storm comes, it's better to be prepared. It won't spare you whether you're challenging the ocean or just watching from the shore. The screen flickered, and Bruce Wayne's face was somber. Kent Farm. In the living room, Jonathan held Martha tightly in his embrace, their breaths held as they stared at the scene on the TV, completely forgetting the whistling kettle in the kitchen. 
Go on, my sons. He clenched his fist, as if trying to transmit strength through his encouraging gaze to the two sons battling the monster on the screen. Boom, boom, boom. Clark accelerated instantly, his robust figure soaring through the sky like a missile, teaming up with David to push the parallax monster into outer space. However, when his punches landed on parallax, it felt like he was hitting a highly elastic rubber ball, and it felt like it didn't seem to cause much damage. Use your eyes, Clark. David shouted as he launched an energy surge with his fist. It's almost like a quasi-energy life form, largely immune from physical attacks. Soon they would be in space. Without the filtering of the Earth's atmosphere, Clark would have an endless source of energy when bathing in the sun directly. Zap! As David instructed, Clark dodged Parallax's sweeping tentacles that spanned hundreds of meters while shooting heat vision rays from his eyes to slice through the monster's body. Green light shone, and Tomar Ree also rushed forward. With his willpower materializing a spaceship, he made various intricate aerial maneuvers, continuously firing and aiding David and Clark in their assault by using harassment tactics. Who are you, unknown life form? I sense a potential in you. You are more suited than anyone to carry my power. Parallax seemed to detect something. While being repelled, he fixed his gaze on David, his greedy eyes flashing, and swung his massive tentacles trying to grasp him. The body I inhabit is powerful in its own right. But it's not suitable for wielding the full force of my fear. He was a lantern entity for the power of fear, yet he couldn't control all of it. But Parallax could clearly feel the smooth flow of the power of fear within David's body. Embrace me, young life form. Together we can spread fear throughout the universe. Surrounded by a gravitational field, David's tall and slender figure emitted a massive repelling force, and Parallax's tentacles seemed to enter a mire, struggling to extend further. I have no interest in that kind of thing. He swung his fist fiercely, slamming it onto Parallax's face. A burst of intense cosmic energy erupted, creating a small purple sun-like phenomenon in space. Parallax was once again struck by an attack strong enough to level an entire city block. The entity known as Parallax currently occupied one of the guardians of the universe, who were among the oldest sentient beings in the universe. They had once believed that emotions hindered progress and had discarded certain emotions. While the guardians of the universe possess immense power, there's one record of a member who almost crushed Shazam in a few shots, but they are not suitable for the power of fear and being driven by fear. Parallax claimed him to be suited for the power of fear, likely due to his ability to manipulate energy, which allowed Hit to control any kind of energy with ease. David's face remained cold, and he had no intention of surrendering his body. Tomari, who was nervous as if walking on a knife's edge, had no doubt that if it weren't for David and Clark's relentless attacks on the creature, it could have annihilated him with a moment's opening. Ah, do you think you can stop me? In the blink of an eye, Parallax, like a ball passed between David and Clark, had reached the thin exosphere and was about to be blasted out of Earth. Realizing this infuriated him, he had no choice but to take the fight seriously and began to shrink his form. While his huge and menacing size allowed him to instill fear in the hearts of those who saw him, allowing him to absorb life energy more quickly and easily, it also made him too bulky, a punching bag for David and the other two. It's getting smaller, but it's getting stronger. The huge parallax, which had been able to cover half a city, was reduced to a size of 7 or 8 meters. A tentacle knocked Clark away, and he clutched his chest, feeling pain, and looked in surprise. It's getting close to its body's original form. David looked solemn as he attempted to attack. His energy blasts rained down like a tempest, showing no fear of depletion, but they no longer hit as consistently as before. At a size of 7 or 8 meters in a near-vacuum environment, combined with Parallax's immense strength, its agility remained unaffected. Don't get any closer, this isn't a battle you can participate in. While engaged in battle, David turned to Tomari and said seriously. Even from a distance, Parallax could easily eliminate Tomari with a single blow now. Tomari gritted his teeth and had no choice but to stay in place. I'll leave it to you, rookies. Why hadn't his comrades from the Corps arrived yet? They were now relying on two newcomers who hadn't even decided to join the Corps to handle the universal crisis presented by Parallax. What's wrong? Annoying bugs, have your speed slowed down. Facing the charging Clark, Parallax's tentacles rapidly grabbed hold of him, its grotesque skull-like face almost touching his, hoping to instill a hint of fear in Clark's heart, creating an opening. But Clark's willpower was even stronger than Parallax had imagined. He fired heat vision while shouting angrily, breaking free. You smell really bad, Parallax. David punched Parallax's face, helping Clark break free. Before Parallax could fly far away, he grabbed one of Parallax's tentacles and yanked it back, delivering another powerful punch. Your strength. Parallax's head shook, dazed, and its face showed shock. Has it grown stronger? This is because I sensed another, even more powerful weapon. David glanced at the brilliant star in the distance in space the sun and manipulated the gravity field to punch and send Parallax flying. Far away from the Earth's gravitational field, without its powerful interference, he sensed another, even more potent weapon in space the gravity or gravitational field of the sun. It's useless. I've devoured the life energy of two planets, and my power is endless. Several tentacles were severed, and the three of them were now in the boundless space. Parallax stabilized its form in the vacuum of space, rapidly regenerating its tentacles, and lunged fiercely at David and Clark once again. It will be you who dies. The three engaged in a fierce battle in space. 
Today, Clark has experienced many new fields he had never encountered before, such as flying and space combat. However, he adapted extremely well and urgently wanted to deal with the monster in front of him, he had forgotten about this. What he was keenly aware of, however, was the feeling of leaving Earth and being bathed in the light of the sun, which filled him with power. I feel like I can do this all day. Not to mention David, who was absorbing the fear-inducing power unleashed by Parallax's attacks, which gave all three of them nearly unlimited energy, their battle creating waves of energy ripples in space. As minutes and even tens of minutes passed, the battle escalated. None of the three could overpower the others. The true body of Parallax, hidden beneath the monstrous form woven from the power of fear, sustained damage, but it could recover with the consumption of some fear energy. Clark, bathed in sunlight, could recover from injuries in the blink of an eye. David, with his manipulation of the gravity field and its protection, energy manipulation, and powerful physical body, had not suffered the slightest injury. However, even he couldn't deal with Parallax in the short term. The fear energy of this guy is too large. At this rate, it would take us at least several days to defeat him. He unleashed punches and energy surges that seemed capable of destroying everything, creating bucket-sized wounds on Parallax's body, but they healed in the blink of an eye. David's eyes were cold and stern, and he could just try to wait. The Green Lantern Corps was arriving soon, and they would handle the headache. However, anger from Parallax plus 580, unprecedented emotional points provided by a single individual. If I end up relying on the Green Lantern Corps to deal with this guy in the end, I'm afraid I won't leave a deep impression on him. It was essential to deal with this monster before the Green Lantern Corps arrived, and David had a plan. Although the current Parallax was not as reckless as in the original storyline, facing Hal Jordan in its bloated and massive form, allowing him to use the sun's gravitational pull on larger objects to draw Parallax into the core of the sun. However, Hal Jordan couldn't manipulate gravity like David. Let's do it like we did before, beat him into the sun, Clark. David said to Clark, who was feeling a bit tired mentally. Right, by the way, why didn't I think of that? Clark's eyes lit up. The core temperature of the sun reached over 20 million degrees Fahrenheit, and it could destroy anything. He regained his strength and charged at Parallax with a loud shout. Idiots. You actually told me your plan clearly. Do you think you can still succeed? Parallax sneered in disdain and swiftly dodged Clark's charge, striking him away with his tentacles. Destroy me by pushing me into the sun? I'll just go back to that planet now and see if you can stop me. Previously, he had been driven out of the planet's atmosphere because of his huge and bulky form, but that was no longer the case. Oh, really? Then why do I sense a hint of fear in you? David's voice was icy, and the power of fear within him, which he had absorbed and controlled, became even more active. This undoubtedly indicated that the fearsome monster before them was at least somewhat afraid. Parallax's heart was in turmoil. After such a long battle, he couldn't seem to defeat these two, and he couldn't see any signs of their strength diminishing, especially David's impenetrable defense, which instilled a trace of panic in him. I need more power to deal with these two unkillable pests. I must return to that planet. The opportunity to eliminate these two people lay on that planet. On that planet, there is undoubtedly something or someone you care about. Before I am about to destroy everything you care about, I want to see if you will feel panic and fear. Parallax roared and fired a beam of light continuously, pushing David back, attempting to shake them with his words. He laughed arrogantly. Fear, once it starts, cannot be stopped, it's under my control. Your willpower is as strong as a mountain, but I wonder if the people you care about will face me without fear. Monster, you won't succeed. Thinking back to the corpses drained of life energy, turned into bone frames in the grip of fear, Clark could not suppress his anger, and struck Parallax with an iron fist, which was easily capable of shattering an aircraft carrier. Believe me, you will never have that chance. As he watched Clark being knocked away, and Parallax rapidly approaching Earth, David's voice, colder than the space environment at minus 200 degrees, echoed. Template integration 40%. He extended his palm and aimed it at the radiant star in the distance, communicating with the gravitational field covering the entire solar system, and at the same time also connecting with the Earth's gravitational field behind him. In the process of fighting you, I made a small breakthrough in my abilities. Graviton's ability to manipulate gravity could, through controlling the Earth and the Sun's gravitational fields, enable him to rapidly complete the journey from Earth to the Sun, almost like interstellar teleportation, even exceeding the speed of light. The current David hadn't obtained the full strength of the template, so surpassing the speed of light was impossible for him, but he had mastered this little trick. Two massive gravitational fields aligned along a faint line. Buzz? Suddenly, the planet was getting closer and closer to him suddenly exerted a tremendous repulsive force on Parallax, while in the distant background, the huge star in its prime generated a huge gravitational pull, capable of tearing the Earth apart. What did you do? Parallax struggled to resist the vast forces, preventing himself from being pulled toward the sun, barely maintaining his position, with no excess strength left to move his tentacles. I've opened a pathway for you. David flew slowly towards him, expressionless, and delivered a powerful punch to his head, causing a cataclysmic burst of energy ripples. A pathway to death. Equals 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 equals. Don't forget to send your power stones. Chapter 130, Retrieve their lantern rings. Equals 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 equals. 
Under the powerful punch of David, Parallax seemed to be on the edge of a cliff, plummeting into the abyss of death. He was terrified as he was pulled towards the scorching star by a powerful gravitational force. You can't kill me. Parallax roared in defiance and resisted with all his might, trying to stabilize his body. However, David didn't give him a chance, he manipulated gravity to pull himself closer. Boom, boom, boom. His body chased like a meteor, and David raised his fist, striking Parallax with a powerful punch, followed by a rapid series of attacks. Eventually, he drove Parallax deep into the surface of the sun. The temperature on the sun's surface, thousands of degrees hot, illuminated David's face. He delivered a final punch, causing a fiery ripple to spread across the star's surface. No. Parallax screamed loudly as he was completely captured by the immense gravitational field of the sun, being pulled into the constantly undergoing nuclear reactions inside. His body melted like a candle and was incinerated. I will come back, I will definitely come back. When I return, what you cherish. His voice gradually faded. Floating in space, David waited silently. After a few seconds, he sensed under the perception of the gravitational field that Parallax's energy shell was destroyed, followed by the body of the Guardian that Parallax had occupied. In an instant, under temperatures of millions of degrees, not even ashes remained. Is it solved? David returned to space near Earth, where Clark eagerly greeted him, anxiously asking about what had happened and looking behind David. Tomar rewatched David nervously. He had only seen Parallax being punched away by David, and then both of them disappeared from near Earth like a stream of light. What happened to that monster that absorbed two civilizations? It's dead, David said slowly. At least for the time being, there's no need to worry about it posing a threat to anyone. For the time being, Tomar re asked in surprise. Wasn't that terrifying monster already dead? What? You, as a member of the Green Lantern Corps, don't know what Parallax is. David looked at him. Old gods like Ares are extremely difficult to kill, but in terms of immortality, Parallax, as a living embodiment of the power of fear, even surpasses other old gods like Ares. As long as there are sentient beings in the universe who still experience fear, Parallax will never truly die. Resentment from Parallax plus 300. David glanced at the notification. This time, by killing Parallax, he had ensured a new bag of supplies in the form of always receiving emotional points from Parallax. Now, Parallax should return to the source of the cosmic power of fear to regenerate its body and await rebirth. The true form of Parallax was not a bald skull-headed octopus but an insect-like creature. The reason it appeared in that form was likely influenced by the host it possessed. Tomari's face turned pale. The powerful monster that could kill a green lantern with a mere wave of its hand would never be permanently killed. Don't worry, even if it resurrects, as long as your guardians of the universe don't make the same mistake again, it won't be easy to find a host that can unleash that kind of power, David suddenly remembered that Tomari was right in his lack of knowledge. After all the members of the Green Lantern Corps didn't even know that their central battery on OA contained the existence of the Ion Entity with all the power of will. So, how could he understand Parallax's immortality? Guardians of the universe, hosts. The overwhelming amount of information caused Tomari's brain to freeze, and he opened his mouth in shock. What did it mean? Was that monster inhabiting the body of one of the guardians? He suddenly thought of the broken pillar in the temple. Tomari was about to ask more questions when a brilliant green light shot from space. Figures clad in green energy suits swiftly stopped, forming a line. There were at least a hundred of them, each exuding an aura of battle-hardened veterans. Just standing there, they radiated an indescribable sense of power. Each one of them was an elite lantern in the Green Lantern Corps. Leading them was Sinestro, who stood out from others in his yellow battle suit. He was full of confidence as if he was a knight who had just acquired a legendary sword and was ready to slay a monster. Tomari, where is Parallax? He surveyed space and asked in a deep voice. Sinestro. David recognized him with a raised eyebrow when he saw the distinctive features, red skin, pointed ears, and a small beard. The future leader of the Yellow Lantern Corps, but it seems he's still within the Green Lantern Corps for now. You've arrived too late, Sinestro. Tomari frowned slightly in front of his core comrades. If it hadn't been for the two newcomers in the core, Parallax would have been wreaking havoc on the life planet behind them, possibly draining the life essence of billions of lives. Is this the Green Lantern Corps that guards the order of the universe? Why is it no different from the neighborhood cops on Earth? They always show up late and fully armed after everything's over. Subtly clenching his fists, a hint of disappointment appeared in Clark's eyes, and he was a bit disappointed. What do you mean? Sinestro ignored the two unfamiliar faces, furrowing his brow and casting his gaze towards Earth, and spoke in a cold voice. Has the planet already fallen, and Parallax has left this place? No, Parallax has been dealt with by them, Tomari said, being beaten into the sun by David. He looked at David, a sense of orizing in his heart for the young man who had delivered the final blow to resolve the cosmic crisis. Resolved. Sinestro looked at the two of them in disbelief, his gaze filled with suspicion. Two young beings, with no apparent special qualities on the surface. Tomari, are you saying that these two core rookies have dealt with the Parallax that killed Abinsur? Just then, a message came through, and all the lantern rings of the lanterns present received an order from the guardians of the universe. Take back their lantern rings. The Green Lantern Corps does not allow Kryptonians who once sought to colonize the universe, and an unknown race that associates with Kryptonians, to join our ranks. 
Tomari's face turned drastically pale. How could the Guardians of the Universe do this? He looked up in disbelief and exclaimed, confiscating the rings of the two lanterns who had just resolved a cosmic crisis? Kryptonians. In the next moment, the intimidating gazes of the hundreds of lanterns focused on David and Clark, their expressions turning cold. The Book of OA, which documented the history and laws of the Green Lantern Corps, clearly stated that Kryptonians had once brought darkness to the entire universe. Surrender your rings. Sinestro's yellow power ring glowed brightly in his hand, and he looked eager, a smile of excitement forming at the corner of his mouth. There was no parallax, but there was still a Kryptonian, he wanted to test the power of his new ring. Buzz, the emerald carved ring, like it had suddenly lost power, flickered a couple of times and went dark. Clark momentarily panicked, fumbling with his hand. He was in space, after all. Calm down, Clark, David looked at him, somewhat helpless. Kryptonians can already fly and traverse space with their physical bodies. Although Clark had awakened his biological force field long ago, he still refused to accept the fact that he could fly. Why didn't your ring malfunction? Clark, realizing he was fine in space, then noticed that David's ring was still lit. What did you do to the core's rings? Sinestro frowned, and the other lanterns exchanged puzzled glances. This shouldn't have happened. Their rings had programming written by the Guardians of the Universe who created the Green Lantern Core. The Guardians of the Universe have the highest authority over the lantern rings. It's just that I wrote a new program, overriding the old one. David's ring, which he had been exposed to for less than a day, continued to emit a brilliant light, and addressed the lanterns who had held their rings for countless years. Don't you know you can do this, he asked. The Green Lantern Ring was the weapon the Green Lanterns used to manipulate the power of their will. Willpower was a mental force that could create, change reality, and grant various abilities. One of those abilities was the power to rewrite the programming inside the ring. In the comics, Hal Jordan had done this before, issuing commands to the rings, taking control of rings from deceased lanterns, and even creating rings from nothing using his willpower. Hal Jordan was said to be the embodiment of the primal willpower of the universe. David didn't have that kind of god mode willpower to create rings out of thin air, but blocking the guardians of the universe's control over the rings was not difficult for him. Those little blue guys have abandoned emotions. They're actually a complete mess when it comes to manipulating the power of emotions, David chuckled. The lanterns were shocked and stunned. The power of could actually do such a thing? Recover the rings immediately. Bring the perpetrator who tampered with the rings programming back to OA. Even through the message sent across the galaxies, Sinestro could feel the urgency of the guardians. He looked at his yellow power ring, his eyes flashing, thinking of something. However, the most important thing at the moment was to follow the Guardian's orders. Go, capture them. The lantern rings are weapons for safeguarding the universe, and we can't afford any mistakes. Sinestro gave the order. Criminals, surrender. Hundreds of lanterns set aside their surprise, their expressions turning serious as their rings lit up brightly, sending out green energy chains to capture David and Clark. Clark was ensnared by the dense web of chains, but he was like a mad bull, impossible for the lanterns to control. With a movement of his body, he sent more than a dozen lanterns flying. As for the remaining chains, they all shot towards David, who had left them all in shock. David had stronger control and mastery over the power of will than ordinary lanterns or even battle-hardened veterans. However, he couldn't single-handedly withstand the onslaught of 70 to 80 lanterns with the power of the lantern ring alone. Beams of cosmic energy shot from his eyes, slicing through all the chains flying toward him as if cutting through butter. Surrender, boy, Sinestro said as he felt the surge of his newfound power. He condensed a giant alien creature resembling a menacing wolf, another manifestation of fear from his yellow power ring, and it lunged at David. The yellow power ring also had the ability to stimulate all things but it excelled in creating frightening things, like monstrous beasts and creatures. Boom! David sent the alien wolf flying with a single punch, shattering its form. Dozens of lanterns manifested various weapons, including mechs, hammers, swords, spaceships, and laser guns, and attacked David. But all their attacks were ineffective against him. David casually waved his hand and controlled the omnipresent gravity in the solar system, sweeping away the approaching lanterns. This kid. Seeing his comrades falling like lambs before a tiger, Sinestro was deeply shaken, with his eyes revealing a sense of fear. It was no wonder this kid had been able to defeat Parallax alongside the Kryptonian. However, he wasn't one to be underestimated either. Let's see what I can do with my new powers. To David's surprise, Sinestro had actually manifested the appearance of Parallax, enveloping himself in its center, and attacked David. Now, he was incredibly powerful, with fear of the Green Lantern Corps from all corners of the universe continuously converging on him, feeding his strength. As soon as he released an energy blast by swinging his hand, David saw a massive tentacle swinging toward him as if Parallax had resurrected. David reached out from afar and grabbed it, then squeezed it hard. You're using something I just killed against me? Is there something wrong with your brain? Oh, really? Then let's see if you can kill Parallax again. The tentacle shattered into particles, but Sinestro didn't care. He coldly smiled and sent more tentacles attacking David, engaging him in a fierce battle. David had to admit, Sinestro's imitation of Parallax's abilities was nearly 80% as effective as the original, and he had the ability to link up with his attacks and fight him. Sinestro now can be said to be in his strongest form. 
The Green Lantern Corps has spent billions of years building its reputation across the universe, striking fear into countless space pirates, criminals, ruthless planetary dictators, and all sorts of vile individuals. And now, as the sole user of the power of fear within the Green Lantern Corps, he commands the fear energy that spans the universe. Once he leaves the Green Lantern Corps, he may never be this strong again. David's expression turned cold. However, the real parallax had already been solved by him, and even this imitation, with about 80% of its power, wouldn't change the outcome. This was his domain, the vastness of space, while using cosmic energy without restraint, relentlessly pushing Sinestro back. Simultaneously, he re-established a connection with the gravitational field of the sun. The gravitation channel has been constructed again. As Sinestro battled David, preparing to launch another devastating strike, he suddenly felt a terrifying force pulling him from behind. He turned around with difficulty, and what he saw was the sun. So, is this your solution for dealing with Parallax? Sinestro smiled, his strong adaptability not making him panic. But I'm not as mindless as Parallax. He manipulated the energy shell of the Parallax imitation, transforming it into an extraterrestrial giant eagle with six fiery wings. Flapping its wings vigorously, it managed to resist the pulling force from the sun, appearing even more relaxed than the previous Parallax. Sinestro had a triumphant look in his eyes. Angelus Giant Eagle, a famous monster in several star systems in Sector 2143, is known for its incredible speed, which can even reach the speed of light after acceleration. The diversity of life in the universe is beyond your imagination, with many abilities you can't even conceive. Sinestro believed he had nullified David's method for dealing with parallax. However, what Sinestro didn't anticipate was that David, at this moment, effortlessly harnessed and modified the gravitational field of the sun along a specific line. Now, he was not wrestling with David himself, he was grappling with the power of the sun itself. A good adaptation, but did you consider this? David slowly clapped his hands. His eyes emitted scorching cosmic energy beams that struck Sinestro fiercely, causing him to lose his balance, and was sent hurtling toward the sun. Sinestro's vision blurred as he hurtled toward the massive and terrifying star behind him. It grew larger, exerting tremendous pressure, making him feel like a helpless insect tossed into a blazing fire. No, lantern ring, open a wormhole, quickly. Fear gripped Sinestro's heart like a giant hand, and he could even faintly smell the smell of his own charred body. He hastily opened a wormhole behind him. Like the green lantern ring, the yellow lantern ring possessed the ability to create wormholes for interstellar travel. Otherwise, they wouldn't have crossed the universe so quickly to reach this place. Sinestro fell into the wormhole, disappearing from view. David, who was well versed in the capabilities of lantern rings, wasn't surprised. Sinestro had narrowly escaped this time, but he wouldn't be coming back anytime soon. Lantern ring wormhole openings aren't that precise. Given Sinestro's ambition, he would eventually break away from the Green Lantern Corps, and when he reappeared, he probably wouldn't be as strong. With Sinestro gone, the remaining lanterns were no match for David. He manipulated gravity with a wave of his hand, and like a gentle autumn breeze sweeping away fallen leaves, he sent them all flying. Even the dozen or so who had been attacking Clark for a while were among those sent flying, each suffering varying degrees of injuries. They were facing formidable opponent, their expressions a mix of shock and dismay as they gazed upon the overwhelming presence of the young figure. They had never encountered such a powerful adversary before. Enough. The lantern's rings lit up, conjuring massive projections in space, overlooking David and Clark. It was the cosmic guardians who had lived for billions of years, their expressions stern and impassive, their tone carrying a warning. Stop when you're given a chance, young life forms. Equals 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 equals. Don't forget to send your power stones. Chapter 131, Compromise, The Beyonder, Zid. Equals 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 equals. The guardians of the universe, who have lived for billions of years, manifested as imposing projections in space. Their ancient and stern faces carried an aura of grandeur and indifference, tinged with a hint of stubborn decay. Return the lantern rings. The lantern rings selecting you was a program error. You should never have been chosen in the first place. As Clark gazed at the guardians of the universe who had, for countless ages, maintained peace in the universe by forming the Green Lantern Corps, he felt a tinge of anger that they were so ruthless in demanding the return of the lantern rings, despite his assistance in dealing with parallax. However, he didn't really attach too much importance to the lantern ring. Even if the lantern ring could help him protect against meteor radiation. Why don't we just give the lantern rings back to them, David? Flying over to David's side, Clark stared at the dozen or so figures. It seems too cheap for them. David had a similar attitude toward the lantern rings. The green lantern rings were considered the most powerful weapon in the universe. If a lantern ring chose someone, they could become a cosmic police officer, upholding order in the universe with great power. But for David, the lantern rings didn't enhance his abilities at all, they were merely a convenient tool, like a handy gadget. However, it was impossible to hand back the lantern rings. After using our powers, you want to take the lantern rings back and pretend as if nothing happened. It's not that simple. His tone was cold. Why didn't you show up to reclaim the lantern rings before we dealt with Parallax? Why did you only realize there was a programming error after Parallax was driven into the sun? David didn't mince words as he pointed out the hypocrisy of these guardians of the universe. 
Among the crowd, Tomari, who had not taken action against the brothers earlier, had a slight change in his expression. He pieced together the events and looked at the revered guardians in disbelief through Lantern's eyes. Everything does seem too convenient. Clark also realized this and had an unpleasant expression. Even without you, Parallax would have been eliminated in this starry expanse. One of the guardians of the universe spoke with a tough attitude. The Lantern Rings are the only weapon the Green Lantern Corps uses to maintain cosmic order, they must not be allowed to leak out. Implicit in their words was the fact that the peace of the universe now relied entirely on the protection of the Green Lantern Corps. If the Lantern Rings were to leak out and people found ways to counter them, the entire universe could be in danger. That your single decision could determine the safety and well-being of all living beings in the universe. With a wave of his hand, a green light condensed an image. Over 3,000 remaining Green Lanterns from the Green Lantern Corps headquarters on OA, a force capable of sweeping the universe, stood ready in formation, their momentum overwhelming. At the same time, another image appeared, depicting a living planet enveloped entirely in green light. Massive and ancient, it was even larger than OA, floating in the void of space. Green Lantern Mago, David's gaze slightly narrowed. Green Lantern energy represents willpower, which means that anything with self-will has the potential to become a Green Lantern. The Green Lantern Corps consists of various alien beings, as well as some unconventional creatures. Just like Mago, a small living planet with self-will, possessing immense power, which the Green Lantern Corps would only use as a last resort, an ultimate weapon. In the comics, it once effortlessly wiped out a quarter of the Yellow Lantern Corps with a single strike. Are you trying to intimidate me, Guardians of the Universe? He sneered disdainfully. David undoubtedly didn't currently have the power to explode stars, even though Mago's size was relatively small compared to planets. But... Today, you won't be taking back these two lantern rings, and I might also keep a dozen more. He reached out and immobilized a dozen of the lanterns who had attacked Clark and him most viciously. Crack. Under the immense power, their arms were torn off, and blood was spilled into space. The lantern rings were restricted in one place, flying into David's palm, attempting to break free from his control and return to their original owners, but they struggled weakly, like moths trapped in resin, fluttering futilely. Dozens of lanterns quickly moved to protect their comrades who had lost their lantern rings protection. They glared angrily at David, who had harmed their fellow warriors and colleagues. However, remembering the scene when David had previously swept them aside with a wave of his hand, and with the guardians of the universe present, they hesitated to step forward. You have a lot of nerve, young creature. The blue-skinned guardians of the universe, with their big heads and short bodies, who all looked quite similar, were furious. You're provoking the Green Lantern Corps, which has safeguarded the peace of the universe for billions of years. They had just demonstrated the power of the Green Lantern Corps, and David not only didn't yield but also brazenly seized a dozen or so lantern rings right in front of them. He was incredibly audacious. Even though they claimed to have abandoned emotions, this group of little blue smurfs hadn't really turned into emotionless statues. You should have thought about this when you were planning to use us. David's expression remained cold as he spoke slowly. If you're not satisfied, go ahead and unleash your Green Lantern Corps. Even though he had eliminated Parallax for the sake of emotional manipulation and Earth's protection, these guardians of the universe really couldn't expect to reap the benefits of their plans without facing any consequences. While the Green Lantern Corps boasted of safeguarding the peace of the universe for billions of years, it was not as formidable as it sounded. In the comics, there were sayings like single combat invincibility, if it exceeds three, it is not as good as a dog, if it exceeds five, it is guaranteed annihilation, about the Green Lantern Corps, as they had been eradicated many times. Under the radiance of this star, its gravity is omnipresent. Your planet-sized lantern, Mago, if it dares to step into the solar system, I'll throw it into the sun. You can test whether I can do it. David pointed toward the sun. The larger the size, the greater the gravitational pull from the sun. In other environments, David might not be able to deal with Green Lantern Mago, but within the sun's gravity field, he could use its power to confront and even kill Mago. Silence fell in space for a moment, and the guardians of the universe expressions fluctuated. They didn't dare to gamble with David's gravity manipulation ability. David's strength was no longer something ordinary lanterns could handle. Even if their numbers were greater, it wouldn't make a difference. As for Mago, it was the ultimate weapon of the Green Lantern Corps. Other lanterns could be replaced if they died, even by the thousands, but there was only one living planet Lantern Mago. You've eliminated Parallax and resolved a crisis for the universe. But if we hear news of you using the Lantern Rings for evil, no matter where you hide, no matter the cost, the Green Lantern Corps will hunt you down to the death. The Guardians of the Universe had gloomy expressions as they spoke, though they had previously not acknowledged David and Clark's contributions to the universe, credit for resolving the parallax situation was like extending an olive branch. It made it seem like they weren't afraid of David's abilities but were saving face for their significant accomplishments in the universe. After delivering a harsh but ultimately meaningless warning, they closed the projection and issued the order for the lanterns to retreat. On one hand, they appeared determined not to let go of the lantern rings, and on the other hand, their attitude suddenly changed, commanding the heroic and wounded green lanterns to leave, making them look like clowns. However, this was considered normal for the guardians of the universe. One of the ten laws recorded in the Book of OA was that core members must unconditionally obey the commands of the guardians of the universe. 
The Green Lanterns, with various degrees of injuries, left with gloomy faces. Tomar sighed, feeling a mix of emotions as he left alongside the dozens of his core comrades who had been seriously injured by David. So, it ends like this. In the blink of an eye, space was empty, except for a dozen severed limbs and tentacles that had been torn off, leaving Clark in a daze. He had been clenching his fists, feeling tense and ready for a major battle, fearing that his brother's strong stance would lead to a war and that they would face the full force of the entire Universal Police Corps. As a result, the outcome was that the opposing side simply walked away. Those selfish old guys who've lived for who knows how many years, compromise isn't new to them when they can't win. Watching the distant stars where the Green Lanterns were heading, David wasn't too surprised and chuckled lightly. Years ago, when facing Krypton, it had been the same. Facing Darkseid had been the same. They were always willing to compromise holding their grand banner of upholding universal peace. Moreover, it was just a mere dozen lantern rings. David intended to use his willpower to modify the program for these dozens of lantern rings and give two to Jonathan and Martha. This way, mom and dad will have some means of self-defense in case of unexpected situations. The Green Lantern's lantern still held a considerable amount of willpower, enough to sustain dozens of battles. The remaining lantern rings were stored away for now. Kryptonite liquid, the Holy Trident, Green Lantern rings, Prometheum metal. David raised an eyebrow, feeling like he could build his own collection room. Over a thousand lives killed, the space monster was driven into space by the Purple Light Man and Superman, they rescued the coast city. Headlines in major American newspapers all reported this significant event. This was the public's first encounter with confirmed extraterrestrial life. As for Superman and the Purple Light Man being rumored to be aliens, it had been circulating for a while, but without concrete evidence, it remained just that, a rumor. Due to his prominent performance in battling Parallax even more than Superman, David attracted a lot of attention, even from people who usually paid little attention to him because of his inactivity in fighting crime. Many people began discussing the normally elusive superhero. The title Purple Light Man, in hindsight, seems rather tasteless for a hero who saved an entire city. Purple Light Man needs a new superhero name. Some believed that the title Purple Light Man was solely based on the fact that he emitted a purple light when he appeared, and while distinctive, it might have been somewhat hasty. In the end, after intense online discussions, a new title emerged, The Beyonder. This title was undoubtedly related to Superman, since he always appeared alongside Superman. Following the idea that superhuman beings are Superman, people came up with a new title for David. Countless people praised The Beyonder for his heroic deeds alongside Superman. However, they were unaware of the immense power of Parallax, capable of absorbing the energy of an entire life-sustaining planet. What David and Clark had saved was not just Coast City. A space monster? Heroes who saved the lives of tens of millions, Superman and the Beyonder. In a secret laboratory deep underground, Lex Luthor looked at the freshly printed newspapers with a sneer. Is it worthy to cheer and celebrate for two alien monsters driving away another alien monster? He reflected on past examples, like the brown tree snake introduced to the United States after World War II, which caused the extinction of many native bird and reptile species. Or the cane toad, sent to Australia with the intention of controlling pests but instead resulting in the extinction of various species and a significant decrease in local biodiversity. So many examples like these. These fools seem to have no idea that whenever they have the opportunity, local species are at risk of destroying the entire natural ecosystem, whether intentionally or unintentionally. Lex Luthor toyed with the globe on his desk, his eyes cold and ruthless. He was determined to eliminate Superman and the Beyonder, not only because they forbade him from appearing under the sun, but also because of the threat these two aliens posed, a threat equivalent to nuclear weapons. People only grow when they feel pain. In the event of a successful attack on the coast city, the world will be gripped by a sense of crisis. Nations around the Earth will start researching defenses against alien threats. The Sword of Damocles will hang over us, and humanity will have to put away its years of arrogance as the planet's masters. Perhaps we'll even see another technological boom in a short time. But now, it has become a farce where short-sighted fools praise other invading alien species. Lex Luthor held a mocking tone as he casually tossed the newspaper aside and clicked his mouse. A video he had watched dozens of times, one that excited him greatly, began to play. It was a video of Superman in a brawl with a painter who emitted a green light. With his keen and intelligent mind, he analyzed the scenes of steel and walls being destroyed in the video and re-extracted and summarized the information. A guy with strength just reaching hundreds of tons can knock Superman around and make him spit blood. Without a doubt, the green light weakens our great hero? He murmured in a low voice, a sarcasm he couldn't quite articulate, as he took out a can of green fluorescent battery solution and examined it, stroking his chin. Interesting? To think that the radiation emitted by the meteorite, which can give people on Earth mutated abilities, and may come from alien origins can actually restrain you. He seemed to have discovered a fatal weakness of Superman. Furthermore. And then there's that purple light. Oh no, now it's the Beyonder. Lex Luthor's lips curled up, resembling a vulture about to leave its nest for a hunt, his eyes sinister. I wonder if you are also susceptible to the meteor's restraint. Just a couple of days ago, his Typhon plan had been declared a complete success. A fleet of large, iron-gray spacecraft with a rugged design cruised through the starry sky, 
Behind transparent port windows, General Zed, a man with a robust build and a beard like steel needles, exuded the iron bladedness and dignity of a military man. He gazed at the boundless galaxy outside, a trace of complex mockery on his lips. What an irony. We were sentenced to 200 years in the Phantom Zone by the Council for rebelling against them. When we escaped from the Phantom Zone, we, the traitors, found ourselves to be the only survivors of Krypton. Just moments ago, Zid and his officers departed from an abandoned Kryptonian outpost in the universe. They received some supplies as usual, but they found no surviving members of their race. The universe is vast, but there's no home for us. Beside him, a tall, beautiful, and heroic adjutant named Feyre touched the window, her eyes revealing a hint of melancholy. Krypton was destroyed, and everything she was familiar with vanished in the explosion. Now, they, the homeless Kryptonians, had become wandering cosmic refugees. In the vast universe, there was no harbor for them to dock. Krypton was destroyed by decay. Zid suppressed the emotions that had briefly surfaced, and once again turned with the dignity of an iron-willed general to address the officers aboard the ship. His voice was resolute, compelling, and had a magnetic quality that made people want to submit. The decaying council, the decaying system. They indulged in comfort and satisfaction, they feared our potential and power, and they abandoned the vast territory that had once nearly ruled the known universe, retreating to Krypton. In the end, they led to the destruction of both Krypton and its people. He paused, scanning the excited and angered officers, his tone resolute. But I will rebuild Krypton, and the Kryptonian Empire will be reborn from the ashes. Let the mighty Krypton rule this universe again. Rebuild Krypton, rebuild Krypton. Talking of the glorious days when Krypton was so powerful that it made the entire universe tremble, the Kryptonian officers became passionately red-faced, dropping to one knee and pounding their chests as they shouted. Rule the universe, rule the universe. Now, let us go retrieve the growth codex launched into space by Jor-El. Jor-El discovered the crisis of Krypton but did not warn any of our people. He injected the most precious growth codex of Krypton into his son and sent it into the universe, preparing him for a new life in a distant galaxy. That was supposed to be our new beginning, Krypton's new beginning. Zid shouted, reaching out like an arrow, pointing towards a certain direction in space. Let us reclaim it together, Krypton soldiers. Equals 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 equals. Don't forget to send your power stones. Chapter 132, I am your father, K-A-L-L. Equals 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 equals. Mother's raspberry pie is always delicious. In the afternoon, after saving the earth, David and Clark returned home and devoured a big meal. Clark expressed satisfaction and gave a thumbs up. Eat slowly. The two grown-up children had just safely returned after saving a city. Martha had a smile on her lips and a sense of relief in her heart. Jonathan stood by with a cup of tea, his mouth unable to hide a smile either. He was proud of the two sons he had raised, his sons were heroes who defended the city by repelling alien monsters. Mom and Dad, take these two rings. After the battle with Parallax, which consumed much of their energy, they finally recovered with a hearty meal at home. David lay back, patted his stomach, and remembered something, and placed two green lantern rings on the table. Are these your two alien police rings? No, these are different rings. He briefly explained the situation. Regarding their sons being manipulated and having stolen over a dozen rings from those hypocritical guardians of the universe, the couple exchanged a glance, unsure of what to say. Both of them ran a farm, which meant dealing with different kinds of people, and they knew that sometimes officials did not necessarily represent justice and the right side. A recent example was the United States military, which wanted to kidnap their eldest son for experiments. David, if you took their rings, won't they come looking for trouble? Jonathan sat up straight, his brow slightly furrowed. Things that involved something like the entire universe had to make people worry, especially whether they would implicate the whole Earth. They won't dare to start a war easily. Those guardians have already compromised. David reassured his parents not to worry about this matter, they just needed to learn how to use the rings for self-defense. After dinner, in the small courtyard, watching their parents use the lantern rings to create a tractor, a lawnmower, a watering can, and scissors through the power of will, they played and had fun in the novelty, enjoying themselves as if they were children who hadn't had a chance to go to an amusement park in a long time. These rings are so magical, like a universal toolbox. Jonathan marveled at the rings David had brought back while using the lantern ring to create various types of wrenches and screwdrivers. Whatever you need, you can make it in a snap. No need to rummage through the attic, it's so convenient. Yeah, if only this ring could be used casually. Martha looked regretful as she carried an energy-made pesticide sprayer, treating the fruit trees in the orchard on the farm. This year, the farm will definitely save a lot of expenses. Mom and Dad, these are weapons for your self-defense. David scratched his head, looking somewhat dazed. One of the most powerful weapons in the universe, used by the Green Lantern Corps to maintain cosmic order, had been turned into something like this. In reality, it was mainly because the couple had kind personalities, with no intention of harming anyone. They had no understanding of firearms and weapons, and the power of will with unlimited potential they harnessed manifested as various tools. But it's okay. The power of the Green Lantern rings can easily lift a hundred tons and enable rapid flight. With these two capabilities, even if mom and dad don't know how to create weapons with the Green Lantern rings, it's enough. He thought to himself. Clark seemed troubled and pulled David aside. 
David, you mentioned last time that you had encountered a historically ancient and highly advanced underwater nation, the legendary Lost Atlantis. Yes, what's wrong? David looked at Clark, who seemed hesitant to ask something and signaled him to go ahead. My people and the Green Lantern Corps don't have a good relationship. The information in the lantern rings about Krypton is limited. Does Atlantis have more information regarding this aspect? Finally learning about the place in the starry sky he had often gazed at and discovering about his own race, Clark couldn't wait to learn more. He could only turn to his younger brother for help. How could those little blue things have disclosed detailed information about the powerful enemy that had once made them retreat in embarrassment? In the history of Atlantis, it is recorded that many years ago, a spaceship from the stars landed in the North Pole. David looked at Clark, who was somewhat anxious and excited and said thoughtfully, The style of the spaceship is very similar to that of the Kryptonian Empire's advanced exploration vessels. At its peak, Krypton had nearly colonized the entire known universe. Planets were being discovered and conquered constantly. Eventually, however, they retracted their vast dominion because the Kryptonian High Council became afraid. Even an ordinary civilian exposed to a yellow sun could resist the advanced technology that Krypton had developed over countless years. If this continued, the foundation of their rule would likely be shaken. This, coupled with the vigilance and hostility of the Green Lantern Corps and other cosmic forces towards Krypton, led to their retreat. They chickened out and brought their tentacles back to Krypton, forbidding their people from venturing out and basking in the light of a yellow sun. Abandoned Kryptonian exploration spaceships like the one in the Arctic, there are probably countless of them in the universe. Kryptonian spaceship in the Arctic? Really? Clark's eyes lit up, and he asked with a hopeful tone, not expecting to receive news related to Krypton from his brother. David, are you sure you remembered it correctly? Do you think I would forget something like the presence of an alien spacecraft on Earth? David responded with a question and a smile. I understand, I'm just too excited, Clark said, barely containing his urge to fly to the North Pole immediately. David remembered from the plot that if the Kryptonian exploration ship in the Arctic were to activate, it would send a signal that Zed would detect, leading him to Earth. The son of Krypton has to embark on the journey to find his true identity. He couldn't stop Clark from reuniting with the late Jor-El. Even if that isn't truly Jor-El but an artificial intelligence with a replicated personality and wisdom. Having grown up with Clark since childhood, he understood the loneliness, confusion, and even the pain that Clark had experienced in coming to terms with his special identity. But Jor-El can provide Clark with answers to all his questions, help him discover his lineage, and his mission, and make him no longer be confused so he can face the whole world without doubts. David's eyes flashed. As for Zed and his troops, they were just a few Kryptonians. While powerful, they didn't make him feel intimidated. In terms of combat abilities, the only thing Kryptonians had over him was speed, but in the face of his gravitational field, they must first be able to run, and Zed and his group of Kryptonian soldiers are also a source of emotional points. From the newspapers, David had also seen his fresh nickname, The Beyonder. In another universe, The Beyonder represented nearly invincible power. He had a long way to go to reach it. I wonder if continuously merging templates in the future will grant me the power of the Beyonder. Jonathan and Martha spent several days familiarizing themselves with the use of the Green Lantern rings. They couldn't help but marvel at the convenience of the rings once more. However, when they returned to their ordinary farm life, they didn't feel out of place at all because that was the familiar life they had lived for decades. People always have a nostalgia for familiar lives and environments. After continuing to fight crime in the city for a few days, Clark couldn't resist flying to the Arctic. David rested at home for two days and then returned to Atlantis. These few rings, select a group of scientists to study them. I need a stable way to recharge them. Deep beneath the ocean's surface, inside the palace of Atlantis, David sat on the long vacant throne and summoned Mera. Several green lantern rings floated towards her. By the way, something feels different about you. Even though it had only been a few days, for some reason, seeing Mera again gave off a different vibe. Despite the fatigue evident on her face, it seemed like she had experienced a lot, making her appear more mature and sharper, almost like a true status person who could balance the situation. After difficult choices, people often grow. During these days, Mera had almost launched a purge on Atlantis. She had to personally order the imprisonment of some of her people in the deep sea dungeons, all for the sake of maintaining the rule of someone who had conquered her own people. Growth is a good thing, isn't it? David didn't seem to hear the other meaning in that sentence, smiling as he asked. Before returning to the palace, he learned about the situation in Atlantis and was very satisfied with what Mera had done. It wasn't to maintain his own rule, but because she had decisively and forcefully suppressed a group of people, like blocking a river, the downstream flow might have diminished, but further downstream, it had become even more turbulent. The resentment against David in Atlantis had become even more severe, and he had provided a good source of emotional points. Of course, it's not yet time for the drama of boiling resentment and overthrowing a tyrant. After all, since becoming the king of the Seven Seas, David had done nothing different except for having multiple people of Atlantis who suspected him of not being an Atlantean. Furthermore, he planned to continue this way in the future. Is that, the Green Lantern Corps' lantern ring? Mera was surprised and looked up. How do you have it, and three of them? You actually recognize it. David raised an eyebrow. The ancestors of Atlantis once fought off an invasion from alien invaders alongside a Green Lantern. 
That's right, he had forgotten about this part of history. When eight-year-old Darkseid led his army to Earth, the old gods, along with the Amazons, humans, and Atlantis, united to repel him. A Green Lantern had participated in the battle, although Darkseid had killed him. The Lantern Rings of Green Lanterns automatically fly away after the death of a member, choosing the next Green Lantern. You forcibly intercepted the Green Lantern Corps Lantern Rings, which is very dangerous. Mera warned. The Green Lantern Corps divides the universe into 3,600 sectors and has maintained peace throughout the universe for billions of years. Their power is beyond your imagination. After speaking, she seemed to regret it a bit, her eyes flashing slightly. If she hadn't reminded him, would the Green Lantern Corps come after this guy? Although for the time being, it seemed that David being the king was better for Atlantis than ORM being the king. Atlantis is really isolated from the world. David felt somewhat disappointed. A space monster entering Earth had caused a huge stir in the entire human world. But Atlantis had not even been aware of it, otherwise, it wouldn't have been difficult for them to recognize him. If they had witnessed him saving the land, they would likely have been more suspicious of his identity. Mera was a bit puzzled by David's words. Had something big happened in the outside world that she wasn't aware of? Otherwise, why would he say that? At the same time, she began to realize. Three ownerless power rings represent the deaths of three green lanterns who maintain peace in the universe. What happened on the surface? You don't need to worry about those guardians of the universe who are afraid of trouble. You just need to coordinate and deploy Atlantis scientists to study the power rings. Ignoring Mera's question, David issued his command. While the power rings had a lot of energy, it would be best to have the technology to recharge them if possible. The emotional spectrum is one of the origins of the universe, omnipresent in the cosmos. It's just that there aren't as many lantern entities as there are emotions. Allowing Atlantis to study the power rings is not like asking apes to study electric lamps. Even though the technology controlled by those blue midgets could be considered the pinnacle of the universe, one should not underestimate Earth. Atlantis has possessed the technology of unlimited energy for thousands of years, and their level of technology is quite impressive. With open access to the power rings for research, even allowing for destructive disassembly, reverse engineering, and research, there is a high probability of success. In fact, in the comics, Batman used his Earth technology to infiltrate Hal Jordan's power ring, monitoring his communications with other Green Lanterns without him knowing. Afraid of trouble, Mera widened her eyes. Was this term really used to describe those rumored guardians of the universe who had been active for billions of years and had established the Green Lantern Corps to maintain universal peace? The amount of information hidden behind those few words was mind-boggling. Without having contact, he wouldn't know that those guardians of the universe are afraid of trouble. I, I understand. She lowered her head, her voice somewhat hoarse. At this moment, Mera felt like she was walking on thin ice. She must not let her people start a rebellion. This man who had effortlessly conquered Atlantis might be even stronger than anyone imagined. Thinking back to David's statement about leaving for a while, and then suddenly returning a few days later, confirmed her suspicions. He was indeed fishing. Mera's face turned pale as if she were on the brink of an abyss. Leaving for a few days had allowed her people to relax their vigilance, revealing dissent, and then suddenly coming back to catch evidence and cleanse Atlantis. Fortunately, she had detected it in advance this time and had reluctantly locked up those among her people who had shown signs of rebellion. This man must be very disappointed that he didn't get a chance to cleanse Atlantis. She stole a glance at the man on the throne, clenching her fist secretly. David was completely unaware of Mara's psychological activities as he looked outside the palace and stroked his chin. At this time, I wonder if Clark has started the spaceship and met his deceased father. System start up, diagnostics completed, running normally, guidance image authorized. The Arctic, thousands of meters below the ice. Inside a massive spaceship frozen in the ice for millennia. In the control room, Clark swallowed hard, taking off the necklace around his neck. His hand trembled slightly as he held the black seal-like object, took a deep breath, and inserted it into a matching slot. A series of mechanical female voices started up. A middle-aged man dressed in a black nobleman's robe, exuding a calm and wise demeanor, as if a scholar or a scientist, emerged from outside the control room and walked ahead slowly. He looked at Clark with a melancholic gaze and was stunned. You've grown up, K.A.L. If only Lara could see this. Who are you? I am your father, K.A.L.L. Equals 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 equals. Don't forget to send your power stones. Chapter 133, I am General Zed. Equals 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 equals. I am your father, K.A.L.L. Jorel's intelligent projection paused and continued. At least, his consciousness, his projection. My name is Jorel. K.A.L.L., is that my name? Clark felt surreal for a moment, with the answers he had pursued for nearly two decades so close. The thought of being able to see his biological father in person left him with his mouth open, not knowing where to start. I, I have so many questions. My son, don't worry. I will answer all your questions. Jorel's eyes were filled with kindness and patience. We have plenty of time. I found it, mom and dad. In the evening, the cool autumn breeze swept through the farm. At the dinner table, as Clark took a few bites of food and with a smile on his face, he suddenly said, I found them. What? Jonathan, holding a spoon in his hand, looked at his son with a puzzled expression. 
After returning home from delivering the lantern rings to the Atlanteans for research, David knew what Clark was talking about when he saw the joy and peace in his eyes that he had never seen before. Thank you, brother. Clark thanked David and then turned to his parents, explaining with joy, My people, my parents, I now know my heritage. Jonathan was taken aback. Martha found it hard to contain her shock, and this incredible news seemed to catch her off guard. Wow, that's, that's amazing. As she spoke, she became somewhat silent, as if she wanted to ask something but couldn't find the words. What's wrong, mom and dad? The dinner table suddenly grew quiet, and Clark, filled with joy, was a bit puzzled. It's wonderful, Clark. You've found your heritage, found the place where you belong. Jonathan, who never smoked, for some reason suddenly felt like lighting a cigarette. He reached into his pocket, only to find nothing there, leaving him feeling a bit awkward as he spoke in a subdued voice. Mom, Dad, you don't need to worry. Clark won't go anywhere. After this brief statement, the two parents were immersed in the unexpected news for a long time and couldn't calm down. David comforted the couple, knowing that they thought their son, whom they had raised for 20 years, had suddenly found his homeland, his relatives, and the inevitable next step would be to return to his homeland, that distant alien planet, to go back to where he truly belonged. But Krypton was long gone, turned to cosmic dust. My homeland was destroyed in the planet's core explosion. My biological parents also died in that explosion. From Jor-El, Clark learned the answers to all his questions, such as who he was, why his parents were separated from him, and why he was sent to Earth. The only thing they did before they died was to send me to Earth to save me from the disaster. My child, don't be sad. Although I've never met your birth parents, I can imagine that they must have been great parents. Martha rose to her feet and embraced her somewhat sentimental adopted son, gently stroking his head, while Jonathan looked into Clark's eyes, comforting his eldest son with his words. United States, NASA Space Surveillance Station. General Swanwick, I think you must see this. The tall and imposing black general was urgently led into a room by the department head. On the large screen in the room, near Earth's orbit, an unidentified flying object was floating. What is it, doctor? A comet or an asteroid? Comets don't adjust their orbits, general. Swanwick scanned the room, and every technician's face carried a sense of unease. After all, not long ago, the last thing that came to Earth from space wasn't a good thing, it almost turned an entire city into skeletons. It's too massive, even amateur astronomers can see it through telescopes. Before it causes panic, I had to inform you, the head of the department said nervously. Have you tried to contact them? Swanwick, who had lived in the human world disguised as a high-ranking figure for many years, narrowed his eyes. Black, rigid, exuding a sense of iron-bloodedness, it seemed to be the style of a Kryptonian spaceship. We've sent signals, but they haven't responded so far. When mentioning this, the person in charge sounded somewhat panicked. Sometimes, not speaking can convey an attitude, like disdain, or indifference. At least flying a spaceship to another species planet, ignoring friendly greetings and inquiries from others didn't seem like they were just here for a casual visit. What does it want? A casual landing? Or, is it here to find someone? Swanwick remembered the young Kryptonian who had recently learned to fly and had been flying around Metropolis. Be prepared, Earth may be facing a challenge, he ordered, turning around. After dinner, as usual, Martha was washing the dishes. The father and son sat on the living room couch, watching television. On the screen, an intense football game suddenly stopped, and an urgent news bulletin interrupted. A screen showing a spaceship near Earth's orbit, with a host looking anxious, interrupted the broadcast with a groundbreaking announcement. A technologically advanced alien civilization's ship had been discovered near Earth's orbit. Before the host could finish, the channel started disconnecting. Jonathan sat up in a daze at the news. That is, the Kryptonian fleet mothership. Clark, on the other hand, immediately recognized the ship, feeling somewhat stunned. Didn't the holographic projection of his father, Jor-El, say that Krypton had been destroyed, and everyone, except him, had perished in the explosion? Zid is indeed here. David raised an eyebrow. He had expected this moment after hearing Clark's account of what happened when he activated the Arctic ship. He just hadn't anticipated that Zid would arrive so quickly. Is he so eager to reclaim the Kryptonian Codex and rebuild Krypton? Zzzzz. With a buzzing sound, the house suddenly went dark. Power outage. Martha wiped her wet hands on a towel and walked out of the kitchen in confusion. She noticed that the television seemed to be malfunctioning, displaying static and repeating audio as if calibrating. You are not alone. Father Jonathan took out his phone, and to his surprise, the same message was playing on his phone screen. You are not alone. It's a global scale signal intrusion. Clark listened intently for a moment. Different television stations from different countries and regions were playing the same message in different languages. He sat up in astonishment, knowing who the you in that message was referring to. Could it be that I'm not the only surviving Kryptonian in this huge universe? Son, is that ship looking for you? Jonathan asked in astonishment. Seems, yes, Clark's expression grew solemn as he instinctively looked at his brother, speaking with a heavy tone, reminding him to prepare for a battle. David, we might need to get ready. Don't you want to say hello to your fellow Kryptonians who've traveled so far to visit? David replied. After meeting his biological father, Clark seemed to have matured considerably. He was no longer as restless and understood the value of his life and the mission he carried. 
Jor-El sent Clark to this planet with the hope that he would guide this new race, similar to Kryptonians, lead them forward when the Earth was still in its infancy, overcome possible disasters, and become a symbol of hope. They might not be here with friendly intentions. Facing his parents' inquiring gazes, Clark shook his head. My father, Jor-El, told me how corrupt and stagnant Krypton had become before its destruction. The rigid class distinctions were encoded in our genes. Once you were a laborer, you were always a laborer, and a soldier was forever a soldier. Those who could operate and command motherships for galactic expeditions were at least high-ranking military officers. And those who could command high-ranking officers. As a military force that had almost conquered the entire known universe, the Kryptonian Imperial Army was known for its brutal and iron-blooded ways, with bloodshed and conquest flowing through their veins. Their arrival on Earth might not be a good thing for the planet. I am General Zed. I come from a distant planet, crossing the vast galaxies to your world because one of my people is hiding among you. On the television, Zed's image formed from static, and his tone slow and unhurried, held an irresistible sense of authority. K-A-L-L, humans may appear similar to us, but they are not the same. You enjoy playing the hero on this planet, engaging in make-believe games. If you truly care about the fate of this world, I give you 24 hours to surrender. As Zed issued his warning through a remote conversation, Clark clenched his fists. Things were indeed progressing toward the worst-case scenario he had expected. They were using the entire planet to threaten him. But it's not an empty threat. Just a few Kryptonians who have basked under a yellow sun have the power to destroy the world. David looked at him and asked with a smile. What's your plan? You don't seem at all worried, David. Clark was stunned for a moment. The enemy is pretty clear, aren't they? David shrugged. What is there to fear? I've grown up and lived with their people for over 20 years, and I know their capabilities inside out. Clark choked and was at a loss for words, but David's relaxed attitude did help ease the tense atmosphere in the house. Clark, we don't understand their motives. The oppressive image on the television was cut off, the light bulbs illuminated the room again, and Jonathan breathed a sigh of relief. He placed a hand on his son's shoulder, hoping to get him to hold off any rash actions. The term surrender used by the other side made him realize that these people had a clear hostile attitude towards his son. But we have no other choice. With a heavy voice, Clark made his decision, looking at his brother. I can't let Earth be threatened because of me, especially when you and David are on this planet. Aliens invading and speaking through all electronic display devices, addressing Earth, and talking to Superman, ignited global discussions. Superman, he really is an alien. Rumors that had circulated for a while were now confirmed. Why did he come to Earth? Earth was facing a dangerous situation with the arrival of Superman, and some people were getting anxious and getting defensive. The very existence of Earth and the lives of billions of humans were threatened with destruction due to the presence of Superman. Surrender Superman, Earth must not be harmed. Why should we bear all of this? Oh God, is the apocalypse upon us? Superman has brought disaster and attracted dangerous attention from the universe. He is the source of disaster. General Zed must take him away, or this won't be a one-time occurrence. And there's Beyonder, he might be an alien too, a person that powerful can't possibly be human. Why didn't that alien general mention him? Is he another species of alien? Some people defended Superman, stating that he had saved many lives and improved the lives of many, and he had even worked alongside the Beyonder to save a city. Now, were they going to abandon their hero? But these few voices of support for Superman were drowned out by the overwhelming demand to hand him over. Human nature has its moments of brilliance, but most of the time, it's ultimately selfish. In the morning sunlight, over the skies of Metropolis, Clark looked at his phone, frowning as he scrolled through online discussions about the situation. David glanced at him. This is what humanity is like, Clark, are you disappointed by this? The two hovered on the edge of the city, waiting for Zid's arrival. Clark had changed into a new outfit, no longer the youthful version of Superman with the blue half-sleeved and red cape. He wore a tight-fitting, dark blue, high-density material battlesuit that wouldn't be easily damaged in combat, exuding a solemn yet approachable aura. I can listen to the voices of the entire continent without using a phone. If you think this can bring me down, you're looking down on me, David. Clark laughed, put away his phone, and then grew somewhat sentimental. You shouldn't have followed, brother. He gazed into the distance, using his supervision to see that the Kryptonian mothership in near-Earth orbit had dispatched a shuttle that was approaching. With electronic devices capable of invading an entire planet, his eyes and ears were everywhere. How could Zid not know that he and David were above the city? If there's danger later, don't worry about me and leave me alone. You seem to have lost confidence in yourself. David said, you don't think you can deal with them. Clark had indeed matured more than before, but influenced by his presence, Zid's arrival on Earth had been brought forward considerably. Without going through the events that were supposed to occur in the original plot, including the loss of his father, he didn't have the same level of maturity and determination. The talents and abilities of Kryptonians are determined from birth. A warrior's son is a born warrior, a repairman's son can only do repair work. And I am the son of a scientist. Clark frowned and clenched his fist. He was prepared for battle, even for the possibility of sacrifice. But he didn't have much confidence in the outcome of this battle, and he disagreed with David's earlier assessment. You can't casually assume that my power is on PAR with Zids. A well-trained warrior can take on several scientists who spend all day in a laboratory, probably more than a dozen. 
You underestimate your potential, Clark, David said, as the black shuttle approached from a distance. He showed no signs of anxiety and didn't act like he was facing an enemy, just a calm smile. And you underestimate the power of scientists. Jorel may have been a scientist, but he was also a scientist who defeated Zid with a set of fighting skills. If he hadn't looked up at Clark's spaceship with joy, surrendering and giving up resistance, Zid might not have been able to kill him. Swoosh, the black spacecraft hovered in midair, and its hatch opened. A confident and fierce-looking female adjutant stepped out of the spacecraft and stood at the open hatch. I am Feyre. The general has been waiting for you for a long time, K-A-L-L. She looked at Clark, who bore the House of L's family crest on his chest and recognized him as K-A-L-L. Clark frowned but didn't respond. Who are you? Feyre's scrutinizing gaze shifted to David, who was floating nearby, and she raised an eyebrow, her tone slightly surprised. Are you a human? Equals 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 equals. Don't forget to send your power stones. Chapter 134, do you know where they plan to rebuild Krypton? Equals 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 equals. Who are you? A human. Feyre looked at him up and down. In her search for information on Clark, this man kept appearing, displaying strength not inferior to the average Kryptonian warrior. But among the known powerful races of the universe, none matched this man's characteristics. Who else would I be? David replied. You are not on the list of candidates General Zid has summoned. Feyre responded coldly. Summoned. David sneered. You brazenly fly your ship to the sky above Earth, came uninvited, and are saying that you were summoning us? This is Earth, let me clarify your identities. That a native of a backward civilization would dare to be so rude to a Kryptonian officer made Feyre, clad in her black armor, sneer in contempt. She was about to say something when suddenly a voice from Zed came through her transparent force field helmet. I understand. She nodded in response to the communication channel, then looked at David with a threatening gaze. General Zed is very curious about you. You are allowed to board the ship with KALL. I hope you don't do anything unwise. David seemed to not hear her at all. Zid had dozens under his command, most of whom were high-ranking officials who rebelled with him. Ordinary soldiers were not qualified enough to be imprisoned with him in the Phantom Zone. With so many Kryptonians combined, even he had to take things seriously. Fighting in space is a bit more advantageous. As he boarded the warship with Clark, David looked through the porthole at the space illuminated by the stars. Moreover, if a war broke out on Earth, the destructive power of dozens of Kryptonians would be too much. Who knows how many would die or be injured? Let me remind you. Our atmospheric composition is highly toxic to species not strong enough. A spacecraft over 10 meters long was drawn into the belly of the space mothership, and before opening the hatch, Feyre crossed her arms and glanced at David, her posture oozing arrogance as if she were waiting to see him make a fool of himself. It's too late for you to retreat now. Whether I'm strong enough or not, you don't need to worry about that, David replied calmly. Breathing? He didn't need to breathe at all. And what kind of environment could be so harsh that just the air would kill a mutant eternal? Hiss, a burst of steam, and the hatch opened. Before a massive transparent window, a tall and imposing figure stood with his hands behind his back, facing the space and bathed in the warm sunlight. K-A-L-L, I finally see you, Zid turned around, his voice resonating with the force of steel clashing. Living on this backward planet, you probably don't know how far we've come to find you. Are you Zid? Clark frowned. The man in front of him looked somewhat different from what he had imagined. Apart from the strength and powerful physique he had imagined, Zid did not appear as aggressive or ruthless. His majestic face seemed to carry a hint of sorrow, as if he were a general who constantly worried about his nation and people. It's General Zid, Feyre immediately corrected in a stern tone upon hearing Clark's less respectful tone. You should use the proper title. It's okay, he's not familiar with our customs yet, Zid waved his hand, appearing quite reasonable. Zid, your people should all be on this ship, right? David surveyed the seven or eight people inside the cabin. Using his gravity force field sensing, there were probably dozens of personnel on the ship. He didn't want any leaks when the battle began shortly and caused trouble later. Our home world has already been destroyed. At the same time as its destruction, we, the sinners imprisoned by the council, were accidentally released. Zid stated the actual situation without reservation, exuding strong confidence in his every gesture and word. What you see is all that is left of us Kryptonians. Even with just a few dozen people remaining, he was confident in conquering Earth easily. That's good. David smiled and stopped the small talk, initiating the communication of the gravity field. An intangible and immaterial power started to create a channel between Earth and the Moon. David, I don't feel quite right. Dizzy and disoriented, Clark's body wobbled, teetering on the verge of collapse. Just as he was about to fall, David caught him and frowned as he looked at Zid. Toxic gas? Could there be a toxic gas in the universe that could easily incapacitate a Kryptonian who had basked in the light of the yellow sun? K-A-L-L, you've been living on this planet for 20 years and have fully adapted to it. The sad thing is that as a Kryptonian, you are not adapted to the atmosphere of Krypton. Zid looked slightly unhappy. The ring. David reminded, and Clark quickly retrieved the ring, putting it on. The green ring detected that its owner was injured and activated its healing function. Simultaneously, a burst of green light enveloped his head, forming a helmet-like spacesuit. The green lantern ring. Zid recognized the lantern ring and squinted his eyes. You actually know about it. 
David was slightly surprised. Kryptonians had long implemented a policy of isolation, no longer exploring the stars and staying inside the planet. They should have lost contact with the Green Lantern Corps probably at least a thousand years ago. There are many wondrous things in the universe. My heart has always longed for the stars. Zid spoke slowly. Longing for the stars? I'm afraid it doesn't have anything to do with conquest and colonization of other worlds. David responded coldly. I've seen visual data about you from that planet. You possess powers nearly close to ours. What race are you from in the universe? Zarnians, Durlins, Daixamites. As he examined David's appearance, which resembled their own, Zid mentioned a few powerful races in the universe with a touch of curiosity. He still didn't believe that David was from Earth. How could such a weak and backward planet nurture such a powerful life form? None of those. Suddenly, the spacecraft experienced turbulence, and the others looked around in surprise. David smiled. He happened to know about the powerful races Zid mentioned. Zarnians were the species to which the interstellar hunter Lobo belonged, possessing super strength, speed, and other abilities, with strength similar to Kryptonians and even the power of immortality. Durlins had evolved the ability to mimic the abilities of other species because they lived in extremely hostile environments. And then there were the Daxamites, located in the same star system as Krypton, with abilities almost identical to Kryptonians. They were one of the oldest colonized planets by Kryptonians, but their Kryptonite was lead. General, we're being pulled by some sort of force field, deviating from our orbit. Suddenly, the spacecraft veered off Earth's orbit, and the ship's operator quickly reported the situation. He sat at the console and attempted to control the ship to resist the huge pull of the force, but to no avail. The several hundred meter long spacecraft spewed intense engine flames, as if an invisible giant hand had seized it and was rapidly and forcefully pulling it away from Earth. The target is, the far side of the moon. It's your doing. Zid's expression turned cold as he looked at David, who had the power to manipulate gravity fields listed in the data. Zid, Earth does not welcome you? David's face was cold. In just a moment, he had connected the gravitational fields of Earth and the Moon, sending this spacecraft towards the Moon's dark side, away from the sunlight. As for why he didn't use the sun that had helped eliminate the parasite or scared off Sinestro, it was because these guys drew power from the sun. Take him down. Zid ordered in anger. Several Kryptonian warriors in armor lunged at David. Don't even think about it. Although he didn't yet understand Zid's purpose, Clark didn't believe that Zid and his group had come with the sole intention of retrieving their people. He threw a punch at one of the soldiers. David stood his ground, his eyes emitting cosmic energy. A purple energy surge with great force struck the Kryptonian soldiers, sending them crashing into the ship's bulkhead as if they'd been hit by a runaway truck, causing the entire mothership to tremble. This has nothing to do with you. You're not my target. Nervously glancing at the ship, Zid stared at him, his fists clenched. Inside the ship was a planetary transformation device related to the grand plan to restore Krypton. Once it malfunctioned, it couldn't be repaired with the materials at hand. Leave this planet, and I can pretend nothing happened. I still like this planet to remain as it is. As David spoke, the moon was right there, and the massive mothership crashed heavily onto the moon's cold surface, sending up lunar dust like a tidal wave that rose several miles high. The Kryptonian soldiers inside the ship staggered and struggled to maintain their balance. Only David and Clark flew up gracefully, remaining composed. Crash. Clark punched through the hull, gazing at the unfamiliar far side of the moon. What do we do now? He asked. Stop. Before David could respond, the angry Zed lunged at Clark, his steel-like fist connecting with Clark's head. The ferocious strength easily shattered the protective barrier created by the lantern ring, making Clark feel as if a satellite had dropped from the sky and landed on his head. His eyes rolled back, and he was sent flying through the hole. Zid was about to pounce on David, but David unleashed a punch that sent him flying through the air. A torrent of terrifying purple energy overwhelmed Zid, propelling him into the distance like a stone skimming across the water, colliding violently with the moon's surface several times and traveling hundreds of meters. General. Seeing Zid under attack, the loyal Feyre and several Kryptonian warriors roared and charged towards David. Once they started moving, they were incredibly fast, especially on this surface, where the gravity was much lighter than Earth, and moved like lightning. However, as soon as they entered a 10-meter radius around David, their speed drastically dropped, as if they were trapped in quicksand. Deciding not to continue the battle within the ship, David flew upwards, breaking through the ceiling and hovering above, looking down at them. Zid was concerned that the planetary transformation machine inside the ship might be damaged, and he was also interested in Kryptonian technology. Is this the last technological achievement of your Kryptonian civilization? Zid had searched various technology representatives in the Kryptonian colony outpost. This mothership was a kind of Noah's Ark of Kryptonian technology. Kryptonians have armor that can resist each other's attacks and possess a world engine capable of altering planetary environments and gravity. In the entire universe, this is cutting-edge technology. Even if Krypton is left with only us, it's not something you can look down upon. Looking up at David, Feyre was furious and leaped through the breach with the other Kryptonians and attacked David. David engaged in a fierce battle with them, creating deafening explosions. The lunar surface was blasted with massive craters, and the scorching heat melted it into molten rock. These Kryptonians had been bathed in yellow sunlight filtered through their armor, and their physical attributes, such as strength and speed, had reached astonishing levels. 
While they hadn't acquired other abilities, their strength alone was astonishing. Despite being surrounded by dozens of Kryptonian officers, David remained composed. Their punches, capable of shattering mountains, landed on him as if they were soft and weak, and he effortlessly sent them flying far away with his counterattacks, shattering lunar craters in the process. However, he couldn't establish a clear advantage, and the battle remained evenly matched. On the other side, Zid, who had been sent flying, got up and glanced at the slightly reddened armor on his chest. He turned to look at Clark, who had also taken to the air not far away. K-A-L-L. Hand over the central growth codex. He leaped forward, throwing a powerful punch at Clark. Clark channeled his full strength to defend against the attack and engaged in a fierce battle with Zid, barely withstanding his intense assaults. What central growth codex? I don't know. Clark retorted as he blocked Zid's forceful punch. He knelt on one knee, groaning as the solid lunar rock beneath him cracked and split, extending for dozens of meters. At this time, Clark's body had not fully matured into its peak strength. In comparison, Zid was already an adult, and his position as a general, determined by his genetics, gave him an edge in strength over Clark. Before Krypton's destruction, your father, Jor-El, took advantage of the chaos, infiltrated the Chamber of Origins, and seized the Central Growth Codex containing the DNA information of all Kryptonians. Without it, Krypton cannot be rebuilt. Zed angrily threw another punch, sending Clark flying. You want to rebuild Krypton? Clark gritted his teeth and looked up with pain pulsating through his abdomen. I don't know if there's a misunderstanding here. I've never seen any Central Growth Codex. After learning that he was an alien, Clark thoroughly searched for the spacecraft that had brought him to Earth. After all, it was the only connection he had to his home and parents. Clark hoped to find something other than the black emblem they left him. However, he had found nothing. It's impossible. Are you telling me jor risked his life to steal the codex, just to carry it with him to his death? He must have hidden it on the ship that brought you. Zid was furious, delivering a powerful kick that Clark blocked with both hands. Zid then spun, delivering another swift kick that sent Clark flying backward. Your combat skills, if you were on Krypton, you wouldn't even be able to fight a corporal. Not even worthy of being a soldier. Zid approached with overwhelming force, lifting Clark by the collar. He was emotionally charged and not holding back on his contemptuous comments. Inside, he felt a tinge of unease and rising panic. Kall didn't look like he was lying. If the Codex was not sent to Earth by jor -El, how could he rebuild Krypton? Then how about this? Clark, battered and bruised, was enraged. His eyes blazed with red heat vision, which he directed at Zid's helmet, causing it to explode and sending Zid tumbling backward. Seizing the opportunity, Clark followed up with several attacks, generating visible shockwaves that kicked up lunar dust across hundreds of meters. He pinned Zid to the ground, pummeling his head with punches while trying to reason with him. Zid, listen to me. If you want to rebuild Krypton, maybe I can help. We don't need to resort to violence against each other. He was also a Kryptonian, and if it was just to rebuild a homeland he had never seen before, he would be more than willing to help. Bang! Amidst the confrontation, another Kryptonian warrior was sent flying, leaving a long trench on the lunar surface. Floating in midair, David interrupted the brawl with a cold tone. Clark, do you know where they plan to rebuild Krypton? Equals 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 equals. Don't forget to send your power stones. Chapter 135, activate the world engine now. Equals 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 equals. Smallville, Kent Farm. In the wheat field, cicadas chirped noisily, unsettling one's heart, and stimulating the nerves. At the door of the room, Martha, wearing an apron, gazed into the distant sky with her hands tightly clenched, while Jonathan paced around the house, occasionally gritting his teeth as he looked at the lantern ring in his hand. Just moments ago, the news reported that the huge spacecraft had left Earth's orbit. The couple had no idea of what the situation was currently like, and their hearts were filled with worry. The alien general from Superman's hometown. In the bunker, Luther watched the footage on the projection screen captured by the Luthor Corp satellite, showing the gigantic spacecraft with flames spewing from it being pulled toward the moon. A mocking smile crept across his lips as he donned his green battlesuit, made of high-density alloy. He had transformed the once bulky, fortress-like armor into a form-fitting and streamlined suit. The current battlesuit is merely an auxiliary tool for me, he said. He clenched his fists, feeling the eruption of power like a volcanic explosion surging in his body. It had been nearly 20 years since the meteorite fell on Smallville, and many people affected by the radiation had small mutations and were afraid that these would cause health problems, so most went to the hospital for examination and treatment. Luther, utilizing his vast business, had tracked down those who had left records and collected samples one by one. After spending billions on research, Project Typhon was completed, the source of blood for myriads of monsters. Bang! Excluding the abilities that would make me look like a monster, I now possess hundreds of abilities. Luther sneered as he suddenly clenched his fist, the terrifying physical strength bursting into the air, creating a strong wind within the room. The power, capable of hunting gods, was now in his grasp. I have no intention of being a hero, heroes often meet unfortunate ends. But this time is an exception. Bang! The roof was shattered, and Luther ascended into the sky, breaking the sound barrier, and flying into space at high speed, aiming for the moon. His goal was to be the last victor, reaping everything once the two groups of aliens finished their battle. 
A hero who saved the earth from aliens? Sounds pretty good. With this title, running for president to gain the highest power in the human world would be a walk in the park? Clark heard David's words, he clenched his fist as he looked at Zid on the ground, signaling him to answer the question. Earth has given birth to weak earthlings, Zid said with a slightly swollen mouth, disdainfully spitting out some blood. He then knocked Clark away with a backhand and got to his feet. Although they can't even defeat the bugs on Krypton, their appearance is strikingly similar to ours, and this planet shares many similarities with Krypton. I will use the world engine with low energy to terraform this planet and rebuild Krypton. He glanced at the distant blue planet in space. Moreover, Earth is under a yellow sun, so every Kryptonian born here will have powers from birth. Even if the Earth were to explode like Krypton again, Kryptonians would still survive. Zid clenched his fist suddenly, radiating tremendous power. The explosion on Krypton nearly wiped out the Kryptonian race, and he would never let such a thing happen again. Absolutely not. Zid actually regarded the Earth as the price for rebuilding Krypton. Clark widened his eyes, and jumped up and punched Zid in an attempt to subdue him and thwart his plan to terraform the Earth. However, although their physical abilities were quite similar, but they have notable differences in other aspects. Zid, having vast combat experience had anticipated Clark's laser eyes, and easily gained the upper hand once again, forcing Clark to retreat under Zid's fierce assault. David wanted to fly in to assist Clark, but dozens of Kryptonians, effortlessly leaping to altitudes of over 10 miles, swarmed in like wolves. Although they couldn't harm him, he struggled to break free for a short while. During their siege, he couldn't help but think of the universe when Krypton was at its peak. It wasn't an exaggeration to say that beings as powerful as himself are rare in the universe, yet dozens of Kryptonians could firmly restrain him. During Krypton's prime, there were conservatively estimated to be several billion Kryptonians, the magnitude of that power. No wonder wherever Kryptonians went, it became their colony, he thought. Bang! Just as the scorching cosmic energy had sent two Kryptonians flying, five or six more lunged at him with fists. David manipulated gravity with one hand to grab them midair and slam them down, creating massive craters on the moon's surface, some over 10 meters deep. Swish, a flash of cold light. David quickly tilted his head back, feeling a slight bloodstain on his cheek. Feyre held a black, unknown metal dagger and landed gracefully. She turned to face him, provocatively licking the razor-sharp blade that was thinner than paper. It seems like your skin can absorb the force of our attacks, but it must be quite challenging to absorb attacks that are so small yet powerful, she taunted. He felt a slight stinging on his face, touched a tiny drop of blood, and slowly lowered his hand. Not bad, although it's not much worse than a mosquito bite. But with so many of you putting in so much effort, at least one of you managed to injure me. These Kryptonians' weapons were probably made of the same material as their battle suit, capable of withstanding bathing in the yellow sun, yet also capable of harming each other. But you won't have this opportunity again, David declared. Floating in the air like a celestial body, a powerful gravitational field enveloped him. He dashed through the crowd like a cannonball, and the attacks aimed at him had their movements deformed under the immense pressure. The bodies falling forward, fists that had been aimed at him, and knives that had been thrust toward him were all pressed to the ground. What followed was a horrific attack capable of shattering lunar craters. David unleashed his mighty strength, sending one Kryptonian after another flying, smashing into the distant lunar craters. Despite their steel-like bodies, they quickly flew back like cockroaches that couldn't be killed, but he had already established victory. There's no sunlight here, it's pitch black, and Kryptonians cannot replenish their energy, but I am different. He was confident that in half an hour, he could beat dozens of Kryptonians to the ground alone. A single person defeating dozens of Kryptonians, who could conquer a planet by themselves. If this news was spread, no one in the universe would believe it. Casually grabbing Feyre's arm as she lunged with the transformed and blade-holding hand, David glanced over at Clark's situation and felt that he didn't have much time left. Clark was facing only Zid, but Zid's strength was different from that of an ordinary Kryptonian. Being beaten by Zid, Clark's face was battered, his nose and cheeks swollen, and blood flowed from his mouth, making him look miserable. Bang! Zid threw a devastating punch, creating a shockwave that swept the lunar dust for miles. Clark groaned in pain as he was sent flying his body resembling a missile as he glided over the lunar surface, leaving a deep trench in his wake. He lay at the end of the trench, clutching his chest in pain, his face contorted, feeling as though his ribs had been broken. Things had turned out exactly as he had expected. Despite both being Kryptonians, he was no match for Zed, who was a general. Bang! The ground cracked and was crushed underfoot as Zed leaped precisely, covering half a mile in an instant. He appeared before Clark like a fierce and experienced beast, his eyes filled with malice as he lifted Clark into the air. Unlike Clark, who mainly relied on his biokinetic field to move freely on the moon, although Zid had never been to the moon, his extensive combat experience, combined with years of honing his control over his powerful body, allowed him to quickly adapt to the moon's gravity, moving with ease as if walking on Krypton's flat ground. Tell me where the spaceship that brought you to Earth is. I will never tell you, Zid. Abandon your inhuman plan. With his neck gripped as if in an iron vice, Clark struggled and exclaimed in anger. If the future Kryptonians are to live on the new planet you've created through the slaughter of billions of people, they probably won't be happy either. 
Not to mention the unique atmosphere of Krypton, the gravity there was dozens of times stronger than on Earth, making human survival impossible. Everything on Earth would be wiped out. Moreover, the spaceship is located where his parents who raised him are. How could he give that away? You won't talk? You will. Let me see if you've developed an iron will on that weak planet. Zid was about to begin beating and torturing Clark when, with a swift motion, David, who had already knocked down over a dozen Kryptonians, was finally able to intervene. A surge of scorching energy flowed through and sent Zid flying. Clark stood up unsteadily and quickly used the power of the ring to heal his injuries. However, repairing a person capable of breaking straws and repairing someone capable of breaking mountains consumed different levels of energy. The power of the ring blinked rapidly as it rapidly got low on battery. He halted the healing process after fixing his rib injuries. David, I think it's time. Wanting to preserve some power to prevent accidentally harming himself due to what David brought as a precaution, Clark looked somewhat disheveled as he addressed David. They had confirmed that Zid was a threat to Earth, and Clark was struggling a bit. Due to the changes caused by David's arrival, Clark was facing powerful enemies that he should not have faced at this time. He was not twice as strong as Zid as Jor-El evaluated in the original plotline. Even though he lacked experience, he had consistently held the advantage during his battle with Zid and had even had room to spare, showing restraint against his last remaining kinsmen. You're courting death. Couldn't help it Moai. Seeing Zid being blasted away once again, Feyre, leading a group of Kryptonian warriors, was furious. They descended upon David like comets, charging at him. Since you put it that way, let's end it here. As he glanced at those in the air, David activated a gravitational field to slow their movements. He took something out of his possession, an iron test tube, and poured its contents onto his hands, spreading it like applying lotion, quickly covering both hands evenly. The green glowing liquid rapidly emitted radiation. In midair, David swiftly approached Feyre, and without any mercy, his fist struck her face. Feyre was sent flying and embedded herself in the mountainside of a crater several miles away. Just as she was about to rise and engage in another battle, she suddenly felt a wave of weakness. All her strength seemed to be rapidly drained from her body, causing her to lose control and kneel. Her face turned pale, and she touched the green liquid on her face. What? What is this? The familiar radiance reminded her of something. After Krypton's explosion, Zid and his group wanted to look for some familiar things or usable equipment and facilities in the wreckage of Krypton, but they encountered a green crystal, which was similar to the stone in the planet's core formed by high-temperature explosion. The light emitted by it could actually make them weak and even painful. It's a substance similar to that crystal. Feyre yelled to remind her legionnaires, don't get close to him. Bang, bang, bang. One Kryptonian warrior after another was sent flying and crashed back to the ground. In the face of Kryptonians, especially dozens of them, David had to be cautious. While he no longer had kryptonite, he had kryptonite solution, which could emit radiation that caused kryptonians to weaken and suffer. However, kryptonite solution's radiation is weaker than kryptonite. And, perhaps due to the various high-energy radiation present in space, its effects may not be as ideal. David glanced at the weakened Feyre and the other kryptonians who were trying to remove the kryptonite solution from their faces, even allowing themselves to get up and try to rub off the kryptonite solution with moon dust. He raised his finger and fired a purple energy beam, knocking out one Kryptonian after another who had come into contact with the Kryptonite solution. No, this is. Zid, watching from a distance, had his pupils constrict. The battlefield was constantly changing, and any hesitation could come at the cost of one's life. After receiving Feyre's warning, he, with his exceptional tactical skills, reacted quickly and quickly found a solution. He communicated through his battlesuit to issue a stern command. Activate the world engine immediately. The spaceship's artificial intelligence obediently followed the command of the highest authority without any hesitation. The rear of the space mothership disassembled, and a massive device with three tall legs spewed flames and took flight. It reached several hundred meters in height, resembling a mythological giant. Destroy non-Kryptonian life forms, Zid coldly commanded via remote control. At a location in the world engine's core, a mirror-like appendage, seemingly made of mercury, extended like a mechanical arm composed of silver metallic particles. It appeared to be infinitely extendable and moved at lightning speed, reaching out towards David. Kryptonite was a weakness for Kryptonians, but Kryptonian machines were not affected. The world engine was one of Krypton's highest technological achievements, capable of reshaping the terrain and environment of an entire planet at will. It was immensely powerful and, as a weapon, could affect even Kryptonians who had been exposed to a yellow sun. Zid had searched through countless former Kryptonian colonies in the universe before finding such a machine. The purple energy beam struck the steel mechanical tentacle, which resembled a silvery python, but it seemed to easily withstand the attack. It continued to reach out as if unaffected. The world engine. David tightly pursed his lips. A gravitational field emanated from him, causing the tentacle to enter a quagmire, making it laborious and slow in its approach. The world engine immediately adjusted its direction, and the colossal machine moved with terrifying speed, far beyond what an ordinary Kryptonian could react to. The gravity field outlet used for reshaping planets was now aimed at David. Buzz? The gravitational beam, which could easily reduce mountains to dust, struck effortlessly, shaking everything for hundreds of miles, and the moon dust shook and was swept away. No. 
Seeing the translucent gravity beam hitting David, Clark was filled with rage. He had never seen the world engine, but he could feel the terrifying power within it, as Sid had described it as a weapon capable of reshaping planetary landscapes. Bang! The several meter thick gravity beam overwhelmed David, piercing through his defensive gravitational field in an instant. He grunted and was sent hurtling backward at an incredible speed, smashing through a crater hundreds of meters high. He continued to fly for miles, like a comet flying across the sky uncontrollably, propelled into space by the piercing gravitational beam. Zid. Clark's neck veins popped out, and he rushed towards Zid who gave the order with an unprecedented fury. Equals 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 equals. Don't forget to send your power stones. Chapter 136, Do You Think Compromise Can Defeat the Enemy? Equals 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 equals. Like a massive mountain charging from the front, a continuous stream of gravitational force bombarded the body, propelling David into space, and his own gravitational field couldn't counter it. It truly is a weapon capable of terraforming planets. Using my current ability to manipulate gravity to resist the gravitational beams of the world engine is still too much of a stretch. Pushed thousands of miles away from the moon in a single breath, David clutched his chest, feeling that his internal organs were under heavy pressure, but his powerful physique had already begun to heal, and he swiftly flew back towards the moon. K-A-L-L, hand over the central codex, or you're next. Bang! Seeing Clark charging in uncontrollable anger, Zid split the ground and threw a punch, and both were sent flying in opposite directions. Zid got up, touched his cheekbone, which was slightly painful, and wondered if it was an illusion, jor -El's son's power had surged by several percent during their fight. Seeing a streak of purple light speeding back from the horizon, Clark secretly breathed a sigh of relief, his anger surging again as he charged at Zid. I don't know what the central codex is, but you've really pissed me off, Zid. You will understand. Seeing David flying back with green energy in his hands, seemingly without much injury, Zid's heart sank. World engine, target me, and fire the gravity beam. In this critical moment, he made a decision and shouted. If he allowed David to get closer, his chances of rebuilding Krypton would surely fail. The central codex is far more important than the world engine. We can only rebuild Krypton by getting the central codex. The gravitational beam pierced the sky and struck, Zid gritted his teeth, his eyes filled with ferocity, and he was ready to receive it, and was blasted out of the moon for thousands of miles, down under the sun. His armor helmet had long been shattered by Clark, and he was bathed in the yellow sunlight, and some abilities began to awaken. Zap! Zid's eyes lit up with a red glow, uncontrollably sweeping through space, but in just a few seconds, he learned to control it. I can feel it, it's easier than I imagined. After Krypton's destruction, Zid and his group had used filtered yellow sunlight to strengthen their bodies while searching for surviving Kryptonians in the universe. They had avoided receiving more different types of yellow or other sunlight in case some hard-to-control abilities caused unintended consequences. Zid was born to be a general and trained his whole life to master his body and senses. In just a few seconds, he became familiar with his newly acquired powers, superhuman vision, superhuman hearing, heat vision, and the biofield that allowed him to fly. He left the world engine behind and accelerated toward Earth. K-A-L-L, -L, whether you know the location of the central codex or not, I will find it. The world engine was not necessary. The example of jor -El's son showed that Kryptonians could easily survive and thrive on Earth without environmental modifications. But the central codex was crucial. He's likely headed to Metropolis, Clark. Seeing Zid speeding toward Earth, David immediately realized his intentions, called out to Clark, and transformed his body into a purple streak of light, quickly chasing after him. Superman was known for his appearances in Metropolis, which made it easy to speculate whether he lived in Metropolis or even grew up there, due to which Sid was heading to Metropolis. The moon's gravitational field was much weaker than Earth's, less than a fraction of Earth's, and it also interfered with the sun's gravitational field. David's gravitational slingshot ability had reduced speed, but it was still faster than Zid's, albeit only slightly and Zid still had a head start. Metropolis. Clark's mind jolted, and he shot into space like a projectile, rapidly pursuing Zid. As the three of them approached Earth one after the other, Zid flew while periodically turning back to attack with his heat vision. Clark dodged and retaliated as he went. David, on the other hand, did not bother to dodge and unleashed his purple energy beams, putting immense pressure on Zid. In Earth's orbit, satellites circled the planet. Zid grabbed one and violently hurled it at David. David, with an expressionless face, became an arrow piercing through everything, never stopping, and the satellite was shattered as if it were made of paper in his path. In a loud explosion, a satellite that Wayne Enterprises had spent millions of dollars to send into space was instantly rendered useless. David emerged from the flames and continued the pursuit. Throughout their pursuit, the three engaged in constant combat. In the Batcave beneath Wayne Manor in Gotham, Bruce Wayne's face darkened as the scene in front of him went dark. He pressed a button and switched to the perspective of another nearby satellite. After watching for a few seconds, Bruce Wayne stood up. Master Bruce, where are you going? Alfred glanced at the screen, which showed the three figures battling relentlessly after returning from space like gods, with a worried look on his face. Metropolis. The landing point of the three of them, or more specifically, the landing point of the alien general named Zid, wasn't hard to guess. They were heading straight for Metropolis. 
Bruce Wayne donned his battle suit and headed into the inner part of the Batcave, where he had a new vehicle. It didn't take long for it to be completed, but its cost far exceeded that of his Batmobile and Batwing. It was known as the Fenrir Battle Armor. In the streets of Metropolis, the news reports indicated that the spacecraft had left Earth's orbit, and the city seemed to regain its former tranquility. However, people on the streets still cast anxious glances at the sky from time to time, fearing the sudden arrival of an alien terrorist attack. What is that? Suddenly, someone exclaimed, pointing to the sky. A shadow, like a fiery meteor, grazed the atmosphere and came hurtling towards Earth with terrifying speed. Run. As the figure drew closer in an instant, the people in the city panicked, scrambling to escape. Bang. In the skies above the city, Zid abruptly stopped his movement, and it was as though inertia disappeared from his body, instantly coming to a halt. However, the gusts of wind and shockwaves he generated shattered the glass of surrounding skyscrapers, raining down glass shards, and injuring many. Help. Run, the aliens are attacking Earth. Screams and wails filled the streets below, but he paid them no mind, his gaze turning sharp as he looked in a particular direction. Almost in the next second, David and Clark were closing in from the sky. Stay right there. A few hundred meters away, Zid's eyes emitted a dangerous red glow, threatening the two. If you don't want to see this city block destroyed in the next second, wait. Fully aware of the power of Kryptonian heat vision, Clark's pupils shrank as he hastily stopped and blocked David, and the two hovered in midair, facing off with Zid. David surveyed the area below and locked eyes with Zid. War involving civilians. Don't you think these tactics are despicable? War is dirty by its very nature, young man, Zid laughed disdainfully. As long as it can help Krypton rise again in this world, I am willing to do anything for my people. On the contrary, you, K-A-L-L, -L, you, a Kryptonian, with the blood of Krypton flowing through your veins, are helping the people of Earth to go against me and my soldiers. He pointed directly at Clark, loudly accusing him with an angry tone. What are you trying to do, Zid? Trying to keep himself calm, Clark clenched his fists and asked. Bring the ship you arrived on to this planet to me, and also, Zid looked at David. Get rid of what you have in your hands. Now, immediately. Do you think I'll be threatened by you? David narrowed his eyes. The liquid from the meteorite in his hands had returned from the moon to Earth, passing through the explosion of the satellite, and he had protected it with his abilities, all with the intention of countering Zid. During that time, Zid had tried several times to use his heat vision against David, but David had not let him succeed. David. Clark quickly persuaded David to follow Zid's orders first to keep him at bay and then figure out a way to deal with the situation. Even with our speed, we won't have time to subdue him before he releases his heat vision. David admitted that Clark was right. His speed wasn't enough, and his ability to manipulate gravity hadn't reached the point of distorting laser yet. Do you think compromising will defeat the enemy? However, compromising would only lead to the enemy taking more liberties and if not getting a satisfactory outcome, the opponent would immediately turn hostile, making it pointless. Keep him occupied for now. The police in the city have started evacuating the people. Every second we delays it is another chance for someone to be saved. Listening to the sounds of the surrounding neighborhoods, Clark gripped David's shoulder and spoke in a low voice with urgency. David frowned. In the original plot, Zid had activated the world engine on Earth, beginning his plan to transform the planet, and the center of Metropolis had suffered heavy casualties. Out of anger, Clark had attempted to stop Zid from causing even more harm before engaging him in a desperate battle in the city. Now, due to his interference, not a single person on Earth had died. Clark wanted to protect as many people as possible from harm, but it had now become Zid's leverage. Looking at Clark, who was eager for his cooperation, David generated cosmic energy in his hands, evaporating the kryptonite solution he held. It seems Zid has only learned to activate and deactivate his extra abilities but hasn't fully mastered them. Seeing Zid's relaxed expression, David's eyes flickered, realizing while he still had a vial of kryptonite solution behind his waist, Zid was unaware of it, and he didn't press the issue further. Even if the vial of kryptonite solution behind my waist is discovered, it doesn't matter. It's just a few seconds round trip from here to home. For now, as long as there was a suitable opportunity to get close, he could still take down Zid instantly. Whoosh. Clark disappeared and reappeared a mere two to three seconds later. He had retrieved the spacecraft from the basement without disturbing his parents and had placed it on the street where the panicked crowd was dispersing. What you want, Zid? This way. Hurry, let's go. Follow me, don't push. The police on the streets received orders to rapidly evacuate people from the streets and the surrounding buildings, but the chaos was impeding the speed of the evacuation. Surveying his surroundings, Clark grew increasingly anxious. Faster. Zid landed, keeping a watchful eye on the two, and swiftly dismantled the spacecraft into countless pieces, even parts the size of his fist. Nothing, nothing at all. Where did you hide the central codex? Having not found what he was looking for, he bellowed in anger, and the uncontrollable rage vented through his heat vision, piercing several nearby buildings, cutting through them like a hot knife through butter. No. Clark shouted loudly, struggling to rush over to support one of the buildings, but he couldn't reach the others. His biofield couldn't extend through the air. The template has been fused to 50%. Seeing several buildings about to collapse, David waved his hand, using his gravity field to stabilize the buildings. As the template fusion percentage increased, he gained new abilities. Now, he could alter the weight of objects for extended periods. 
islands could become as light as feathers, or feathers could become as heavy as mountains. Although this ability wasn't particularly useful in combat for the time being, it could be used for rescue operations. He altered the gravity in several parts of the buildings, allowing the fractured structures to stand firmly once again. However, when Zid's heat vision sliced through a few floors, over a hundred people who hadn't had time to evacuate from the buildings were instantly killed and couldn't be resurrected. Give me the central codex, K-A-L-L. Otherwise, I will turn this city into ruins. Zid roared crazily, shooting like a cannonball, sending Clark flying and piercing through several buildings while holding his head. You must have people you care about here. If you don't want them to die, just give me the codex. Enough. With his x-ray vision, Clark could clearly see the hundreds of more corpses in the city within the blink of an eye. Frustrated and angry, his eyes turned red, and he, with the intent to kill, landed a fierce punch on Zid's face and engaged him in battle. I won't let you kill another person, Zid. He didn't even know what the central codex was? Zid asked him for it, but how could he get it? Hundreds of people had been killed just now? In fact, the central codex had indeed been placed on the spacecraft by Jor-El, but Clark was unaware. The codex, which contained the genetic information of billions of Kryptonians, had been injected into his body by his father, making him the living central codex. David tried to join in and help subdue Zid, but in the blink of an eye, a meteor streaked across the sky, crashing into him and sending him hurtling toward the ground. Several blocks shook, and a long, deep trench tore through the earth, spanning across the streets. Feyre. David waved his hand, sending the person who had he been pinned under flying. He floated up into the air, squinting his eyes. Anyone who stands in the way of General Zid, and the rebirth of Krypton will be destroyed. Inside a brand new suit of armor, Fiora, her face covered in gray ash, blazed with fiery anger in her eyes, and she swung her fist with tremendous force, compressing the air as if it were a tangible substance, and sent it hurtling toward her enemies. Among all the Kryptonians, except for Zid, only Fiora was qualified to activate the world engine and rapidly master new abilities. She wiped the kryptonite solution from her face with lunar dust, changed into a new suit of armor, and launched herself into space, closely following the three. Boom, a shockwave resounded, but David effortlessly caught her punch. However, due to the isolation provided by her state-of-the-art armor, the kryptonite solution couldn't affect her. He frowned, and with cosmic energy, he launched Fiora away, aiming to fly towards Zid. Unlike Fiora, Zid's armor helmet had long been shattered, and now he could easily subdue him. In the meantime, Fiora performed a mid-air spin and attacked again, tenaciously clinging to him. On the other side, Clark and Zid's battle was drawing further away from the city, as Clark tried to lead Zid away from the city. Need any help? Suddenly, a deep, resonant voice echoed from the top of a high-rise building. Atop the rooftop stood a large, bat-themed battlesuit, almost three meters tall, with powerful limbs and a body crafted from unknown metals, radiating an aura of great strength. Batman. The design of the suit resembled a wingless bat, appearing fierce and monstrous, reminiscent of a monster rather than a hero. David recognized the style at a glance. No need, this guy is not someone ordinary people can deal with. Catching Fiora's attack, he countered with even heavier punches, sending her flying backward for tens of meters, and politely declined Batman's offer. How would you know if I don't give it a try? Controlling the battle suit, Batman fired a bat grapple hook, latching onto one of Fiora's legs as she lunged toward David once more. With a powerful yank, he used his immense strength to pull the Kryptonian Fiora toward him on the rooftop. Equals 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 equals. Don't forget to send your power stones. Chapter 137, The Death of Zid and the Missing Kryptonians. Equals 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 equals. David raised his eyebrow in surprise when he saw the towering armor controlled by Batman could actually shake Feyre. Bang! Feyre was sharply yanked over by Batman's grappling hook. With her superb skills and flexibility, she retaliated with an upward punch. Her terrifying power condensed the air into substance, causing waves upon waves of force. Yet, the massive armor was like a seasoned martial arts master, without hesitation. It carried a sense of profound and imposing strength, countering her attack. The armor then retaliated with a punch that smashed her onto the roof. Who are you? The entire building shook. Feyre frowned, her eyes emitting heat rays that blasted onto the armor's chest. Under the immense force, the armor was pushed back but did not sustain significant damage. The strength of this alloy used to build this armor is almost on par with the Kryptonian armors. Furthermore, this armor reminded her of David, as it could also absorb energy. A human. Feyre thought it was another alien meddling in this matter, but Batman, in his typical cold and concise manner, responded through the armor. Flames jetted from the back of the armor, raising its gigantic fist, charging at Feyre. Boom, breaking the sound barrier, they soared into the distance, pursuing Zid and Clark. In midair, David cast a final glance before turning his gaze away. Prometheum metal, Fenrir armor. The scene where the armored suit absorbed heat vision seemed familiar. He identified the raw material of Batman's suit as the same as the military's zero armor used to deal with him at that time. Both were made of depleted Prometheum metal, with a body that could absorb energy. With the ability to confront head-on with Kryptonians and its unique design, David remembered one of Batman's powerful armored suits from the comics, the Fenrir armor. Though the suit isn't complete, it should temporarily hold Feyre off. He sped across the city's skyline. 
Fenrir, a monster from Norse mythology capable of devouring the god King Odin, was the source of the name of Batman's high-tech armor, designed as one of his means to counter the Justice League if they went rogue. It featured defenses against superhuman strength, red sun radiation to counter Kryptonians, a system to calculate the Flash's trajectory, and the ability to create illusions to confuse Wonder Woman. Even though it was undoubtedly not complete at the moment, it had the foundation of formidable capabilities. As for how Bruce Wayne obtained the classified Prometheum medal from the military, David didn't question it. It must have been the boring money-making ability of the bat. He retrieved a vial of kryptonite solution from his belt and applied it to his hands. Boom! At the city's edge, two blurred figures clashed violently. The shockwaves from their punches shattered the glass of surrounding buildings, sending the terrified crowds below fleeing for cover. K-A-L-L, you're a Kryptonian. With the central codex, we can rebuild Krypton, even if it's been destroyed. Zed relentlessly attacked, his fists flying like a hurricane. The son of Jor-El was undeniably a Kryptonian, but why was he helping Earth and its inhabitants, who shared nothing in common with Kryptonians except their appearance? You traitor, do you realize that all the powers you possess are given to you by Krypton? He grabbed a steel beam from a rooftop construction site and swung it with a mournful howl, aiming it squarely at Clark. All I know is that I grew up on Earth, adopted by my parents as an orphan from another world. They gave me warmth, raised me into adulthood, and cared about my thoughts even more than they did for my brother, their own flesh and blood. The scorching heat vision instantly melted the steel beam into droplets of molten iron. Clark shouted in anger, You want to destroy the Earth, unleash a massacre, I will never allow it. He mustered all his strength to send Zid flying. Zid was sent reeling but stabilized himself using his biofield. He raised his fist like a taut bowstring, ready to fight once more. However, a powerful figure soared in from another direction, and Zid saw the green in David's hands. He widened his eyes in shock and anger, attempting to turn and escape. A powerful gravitational field bound his body. He felt like he was sinking in quicksand, and his lightning-fast movements became sluggish. Zid, let's stop here. Earth will forever be the world of humans. No. The figure with a purple glow shot like a meteor, and Zid roared with anger and fear. As a warrior, he never feared death, but if he died, Krypton would be completely gone, with no hope of rebuilding. Krypton, my people, I going to kill you. There was no escape for Zid. With a heart full of sorrow, rage, and reluctance, he struck with a fierce intent to kill. Why did fate thwart his plans to rebuild Krypton? K-A-L-L was the son of Jor-El. He had considered that K-A-L-L, being much stronger than an average Kryptonian, would try to stop his plan. But the appearance of this person was an unexpected variable. Aside from the Kryptonian orphan, why did another powerful unknown species emerge on this small planet? Boom! David and Zid's fists collided with each other's heads. Zid seemed like a fired projectile as he pierced through a large building and crashed into the ground on another street, leaving a deep crater. The wailing of the defeated. David's figure remained untouched, and he looked at Zid in the distance, whose seven senses were bleeding and had a severe concussion. He spoke slowly. Not very dignified, Zid. Zid, his breathing labored, saw the world before him blurred in shades of blood red. He heard David's mocking words, and a weak spark of resistance flashed in his eyes. However, his head drooped weakly, and he stopped breathing. The radiation from the kryptonite solution hit Zid the moment they got close, stripping him of his strength and making him unable to withstand another punch from David. The former highest military commander of Krypton had died on an alien world, killed by a young life form with a single punch. Is he dead? Clark flew over, somewhat complex, and looked at Zid's lifeless body through the hole in the building. Although Zid aimed to slaughter Earth, it was for the sake of Krypton. Clark could truly sense Zid's loyalty and love for the Kryptonian race, and as a Kryptonian himself, he stood on the opposite side and shattered Zid's hopes. That you said just now was quite dramatic and cringe. But I don't really agree with mom and dad caring more about your thoughts. It's just that you make them worry too much. David looked at Clark and patted his shoulder, and Clark felt a bit uncomfortable. He coughed and looked away, not expecting David to hear what he said. General. Batman's Fenrir armor wasn't in perfect shape, and while it held its own against Feyre briefly, when she used her super speed, he found himself struggling. Feyre managed to escape, and he now chased her. Upon seeing Zid's lifeless body, Feyre couldn't believe it and went berserk with grief and rage. I will make you all pay for the general's death. With Zid, the hope of rebuilding Krypton also died. David and Clark, along with Batman who caught up with them, quickly broke Feyre's armor, ending with David punching her in the face. Bang! Feyre fell unconscious to the ground. Unlike Zid, they didn't deliver a lethal blow, like how David had spared other Kryptonians before. David wanted this group of people to provide him with emotional points. The emotional points of one Kryptonian can replace hundreds of Amazons, and a few dozen of them are worth tens of thousands of Amazons. If I were to lock these few people in a specially designed prison exposed to red sun radiation, having them resent me for destroying their hope of rebuilding Krypton is worth one Themyscira. As for why he had killed Zid without mercy, Zid is a natural-born leader determined by Kryptonian genetics. If he is kept alive, no matter where he's held, he'd lead these Kryptonians in repeated jailbreaks. He reached down and lifted the unconscious Feyre from the ground, his expression cold. 
Zid was dead, and this group of Kryptonians, accustomed to obeying others, lacked a true leader, had no backbone and he was not afraid of them causing any more trouble. Are you that blue hood? The three of them slowly landed, Batman sitting in his Fenrir armor, scrutinizing Clark with an icy tone as if confirming an important question. When the purple light man emerged into public awareness, Batman recognized David at a glance from his distinct features. Later, based on the connection between purple light man and Superman, he guessed that Clark might be the blue hood who had visited his mansion with David. Are you? Observing the advanced and powerful mech, Clark was puzzled. Although his supervision allowed him to see through objects, he wouldn't casually use it on others if it wasn't necessary. He's the bat in Gotham. David reminded. Look at this city screaming in agony, Superman. Though it wasn't your intention, these people can be considered to have died because of you. From David's words, it was indirectly confirmed that Superman was indeed the Blue Hood who felt awkward and embarrassed about coming without receiving an invitation that day. Batman seemed to let down some of his guard and, before leaving, turned to speak solemnly. Every time you fly over this city, don't forget the debt you owe to this city. Clark's super hearing could clearly pick up the chaos and misery in the city at this moment, and he fell into silence. On their way out of the city during the battle with Zid, they inevitably caused further destruction and claimed more lives. Clark tried his best to save everyone, but he was unable to do so. Zid's arrival led to a massive battle that nearly destroyed half of Metropolis. This incident should have been the catalyst for Batman to become even more determined and prepared to deal with Clark, but now Bruce Wayne's heart did not seem to be developing that way. There didn't seem to be that level of animosity in Bruce Wayne's words. Instead, it was a somber reminder, a hope to make Clark remember this as a lesson and always remain vigilant, prepared for disasters, and not veer down the wrong path. Clark clenched his fists, said nothing, and looked into the distance. Seeing Clark's reaction, David's eyes twitched slightly, and he felt slightly sad in his heart. This might be good for Clark in some way. Although to some extent, it was him who told Clark about the Kryptonian ship in the Arctic, leading to all of this. But when you think about it, the casualties in this metropolis are far fewer than what was in the original plot, so he didn't feel much of a burden. Clark often suffers in the comics, even facing life-threatening situations multiple times because he's too lenient with his enemies. If this disaster can help him develop a habit of going all out, it's not a bad thing. David counted, and in just this month, Clark had found himself in very dangerous and embarrassing situations more than once. Dealing with the remnants of Kryptonians, particularly the ones who could master their powers like Zid and Feyre, was not the end of it. David and Clark quickly flew back to the moon to prepare to subdue the remaining Kryptonians. But when they returned to the moon, on the desolate, icy surface of the moon, the world engine floated silently, and two Kryptonians were missing among the unconscious Kryptonians. Standing on the lunar surface, David frowned. Each Kryptonian's power was not to be underestimated, and letting one of them escape could spell trouble for Earth. After boarding the ship, David had used his gravity field to keep track of the number of Kryptonians. But now, what's wrong? Clark looked at his brother, confused, and asked after seeing his expression. After using his gravity field to search for them and coming up empty, David gazed into the distance on the lunar surface, squinting his eyes. It seems like a rat sneaked in while we were fighting Zed and took two people from here. If it were Kryptonians who had woken up on their own, it wouldn't just be the two people who disappeared from here. Here, the moon. Clark looked surprised and suspicious. With today's Earth technology, it's not possible for someone to freely roam on the moon. Who did this? The disappearance of the two missing Kryptonians immediately made Clark's expression serious, realizing the gravity of the situation. If you want to know the answer to that question, I'll have to borrow your spaceship key, David said. Through the gravity field sensing, they discovered that some of the interior doors of the massive Kryptonian mothership had been violently damaged, indicating that someone had broken into the ship with intentions to steal Kryptonian technology. However, it appeared he had not succeeded. There was a huge treasure in front of him but he could not get it. The main control console had been punched, leaving a dent, and then the intruder had left with two unconscious Kryptonians. But for now, let's bring the spaceship and these Kryptonians back to Earth. David and Clark immediately transported the mothership and the Kryptonians back to the Arctic. They then rushed back home to reassure their parents and prevent them from worrying further. Jonathan and Martha were relieved to see their two sons safely return, and the stone in their hearts dropped. After hearing the story from their sons, and witnessing the coverage of the disaster on TV, the couple, although filled with sadness and a heavy heart, reassured their sons not to feel guilty about the situation. Jonathan patted both of their shoulders and said seriously, David, Clark, you've done your best. After comforting their parents, the two returned to the Arctic. Kryptonians have more weaknesses than just kryptonite, they are also vulnerable to red sunlight, which drains their powers. Creating a prison that emits red sunlight isn't a particularly high-tech endeavor. David issued the command, and Atlantis created it in less than a day. Then, David and Clark temporarily imprisoned Feyre and the other Kryptonians in the Fortress of Solitude, the massive Kryptonian exploration spacecraft. I never expected to see another Kryptonians besides KALL. Jorel had a complex expression as he looked at the projection screen, watching Feyre and the other Kryptonians in the prison. The Kryptonians were separated and placed in individual cells, wearing mouth restraints, and their limbs were securely locked to iron beds, preventing them from communicating with each other and eliminating any possibility of escape. 
David was somewhat surprised and rubbed his chin. Kryptonian technology had indeed reached the pinnacle of the universe. Without prior knowledge, he wouldn't have been able to tell that the being before him was just an artificial intelligence. However, the replication of personality and memories can be considered as a way to continue Jor-El's life in another form. K-A-L-L -L told me some things. Please convey my thanks and respect to your parents, David. Jor-El turned his head and said seriously, even Laura and I couldn't have raised K-A-L-L -L any better. I will, Uncle E-L. David nodded. The Kryptonians here will be troubling you. There are a few mechanical guardians on this ship, Jor-El reassured them. They are enough to monitor them who they are powerless. Father, two weakened and unconscious Kryptonians were taken away. They may have fallen into the hands of someone who intends to control or study them. We would like your help in examining the surveillance data from the other mothership. These captured Kryptonians were no longer a threat, and Clark took a step forward, addressing another more pressing matter at hand. Equals 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 equals. Don't forget to send your power stones. T slash N, this novel is finished in the raw at 210 chapters. I thought it would go to be like 600 to 700 chapters like other CN fics, but this was a short one. I didn't really like the ending, it was a quick one without any foreshadowing to the end and without romance pensive face. So I'm thinking of first completing all the raw chapters and then writing some slice of life and romance chapters to practice my writing, though I don't think they will be good, give some ideas for them. Smiley face. Chapter 138, do you think I care about this? Equals 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 equals. The matter of the alien general Zed leading an alien invasion of Earth has concluded. Their evil plan to destroy mankind and terraform the Earth was thwarted by the superheroes, the Beyonder, and Superman. During this time, thousands of people perished in Metropolis, and countless mourned for them. The global significance of this event, connected to the fate of the entire Earth, brought more awareness to these two superheroes. Everyone talked and debated this fervently, with some expressing gratitude to the Beyonder and Superman for saving the Earth, while others were skeptical and even hostile toward them. Number 1, from the beginning to the end, we only saw a massive battle that endangered innocent lives. A few aliens toyed with our buildings as if they were toys, who saw the so-called conspiracy, the plan to destroy humanity. Number 2, that Zed kept shouting in the city asking Superman to surrender some sort of codex. Could it be that he stole something from his own people and came to Earth to escape, bringing disaster to our planet? Number 3, enough, haven't you seen Zed's attitude during the fight? He repeatedly threatened Beyonder and Superman with us over and over again. Can he be anything good? Superman has been saving people since he first appeared. The Beyonder, together with Superman, drove off that space monster that was coming to feed on us. Number 4, I don't have any hate towards Superman and the Beyonder, but this time, it's Superman's people who have come. Who's to say the enemies of Superman's race won't come next? Number 5, Superman can be confirmed as an alien, but does anyone know if the Beyonder is one of us, a human? The discussions about the Beyonder's identity and whether people should be grateful to Superman, or let him stay on Earth, raged on online. Numerous TV debate shows were held to address these issues, and various celebrities were interviewed to express their views on the matter. Among them, the question of the Beyonder's identity was frequently raised, as some proposed that if the Beyonder was a human, Earth could unite and request the Beyonder to send Superman away, allowing our world to be protected by our very own superheroes. This way, everyone could be rest assured. Clark had long since learned to remain calm in the face of the various discussions on the internet. On the other hand, David paid no attention to them at all. He was more concerned about which rat had secretly abducted the two Kryptonians while he and Clark were fighting Zed and Feyre. Check the data of the other mothership? Just wait a moment. Inside the Fortress of Solitude, Jor-El listened to their request and manipulated the ship to print out a key-like attachment that looked like a seal. A floating mechanical guardian extended its steel tentacles, placing the key into Clark's hand. Insert the key into the main control room of that mothership, and I will take over its access. All right. Thanks, Uncle E.L. Once the two of them arrived at the mothership and did as instructed, an image of Jor-El appeared in the main control room. He closed his eyes for a second, then waved his hand to display a segment of video. A familiar bald figure wearing green high-tech armor entered the ship through a hole created by David. After a brief inspection, he made his way to the mothership's main control room, showing amazing strength. The alloy door of the Kryptonian mothership was as fragile as paper in his hands and was easily discarded to the side. Upon reaching the main control room, he attempted to steal the technology stored in the ship's computer but failed in all his attempts. Entering the treasure trove but leaving empty-handed, he slammed his fist hard against the ship's control panel, his face darkened as he turned and left. It's Luthor, David said, his eyes turning cold. How did he become so powerful? Clark hesitated. Did he enhance his own androids? The appearance of zero suit armor and the armor controlled by Batman suggested that Earth's seemingly backward technology should not be underestimated. Scans from the mothership indicate he's an organic being, Jor-El waved his hand, displaying an image resembling an X-ray of a human body. Clark looked at David in confusion. Could it have been a person with superpowers who took on Luthor's appearance? After all, there are precedents for such things, like Tina, who had shape-shifting abilities and once took on Luthor's appearance to rob a bank. No need for that. Why would a person with such power need to frame Luthor? 
David dismissed the idea with a wave of his hand. He likely should have biologically modified himself. After speaking, he stroked his chin, feeling somewhat surprised. In the comics, Lex Luthor, a staunch human supremacist, had used technology and kryptonite, and even cloned a duplicate of Clark to fight Superman, but he rarely abandoned his identity as a regular human on Earth. However, there have been exceptions. In the comics, he once envied the powers of the Kryptonian and proposed a plan for everyone, claiming to genetically modify people to give everyone superpowers. He used innocent people as his test subjects, but later found that the technology didn't suit his genetics and failed. It seems that he and Clark pushed him too hard. After some thought, Lex Luthor's most important identity was as a billionaire. Preventing him from running his corporate empire in the open was akin to digging into his roots. To achieve his ambitions and become the most powerful person in the human world, he couldn't do without money. Uncle L, I need one more favor, David said. Having confirmed that it was Luthor who had taken the two unconscious Kryptonians, David looked at Jor-El. Can you find this person on Earth? Unlike regular artificial intelligence, as an AI that can think and even react like he did when he was alive, Jor-El guessed his intentions and smiled, saying, no problem. He closed his eyes and began to infiltrate the global network in search of Luthor. The ordinary Kryptonian intelligence on Zed's ship could already infiltrate electronic display devices worldwide, and now this form of electronic life that was Jor-El only required a little bit of time. What is he doing with the unconscious Kryptonians? Clark frowned. Experimenting? Isn't he afraid Zed's two underlings will wake up and kill him? He probably has already figured out the Kryptonians' weaknesses, David said. The last time, Clark got beaten in front of many people, and that abnormal scene couldn't have escaped Luthor's notice. Clark has the Green Lantern ring to protect him from kryptonite radiation, but those two Kryptonians don't. It's not a big deal for Luthor to acquire some meteorite byproducts. Found it, Jor-El said, opening his eyes. A set of coordinates appeared on the Earth's surface, precisely locating a location in the outskirts beneath Metropolis. We didn't have time for him before, David said, his eyes cold as he walked outside the ship. This time, let's take care of him once and for all. This would be fulfilling his promise that if Luthor ever reappeared in the sunlight, it would be his death sentence. In the underground lab, Luthor had brought the two Kryptonians back and placed them on an examination table. He watched as the two of them, injected with a meteorite solution, lay unconscious. A gleam of excitement flashed in his eyes, and a cold smile played at the corner of his mouth. With these two biological materials, the plan will undoubtedly progress faster. Upon discovering that the meteorites that accompanied Superman to Earth could weaken him, Luthor purchased many remaining meteorite byproducts on Earth to use against Superman. In addition to this, he had initiated another plan for the sake of security and future needs. On the day when Superman and the Beyonder were taken away by the green energy constructs, he secretly sent people to the scene of the battle to collect a sample of Superman's blood that still retained vitality. The plan called Servant Superman. Cloning is a magnificent technology with unimaginable applications. But because of legal and moral issues, it's banned in the human world. These stupid laws and regulations completely stifle humanity's technological potential in this field. Luthor had always believed that laws and morals only restrained the weak. He intended to use Superman's blood to clone a duplicate of him for his own purposes. The difficulty in cloning Earthlings and aliens is different, even though he now has extraordinary talent in science and technology research and development. There are too few biological materials for experimentation, which has delayed progress. But now things were different. Luthor was confident he could complete a plan that was originally expected to take at least three months in just five days. After all, cloning isn't such a difficult technology, he mused, his eyes filled with an eerie glint. He had already tried this himself, even though the successful results made him uncomfortable. Lex Luthor should be unique. And he faced the same challenge that anyone researching cloning technology encounters, is the cloned person still him? This discomfort forced him to kill someone for the first time with his own hands. The unique identity of the person he killed was enough to let the legal community quarrel over how to sentence him. Alexander conquered the world before he turned 30, becoming one of the most influential and famous figures in human history. However, at 20, before he ascended to the throne and began his journey of conquest, he was just an inconspicuous little prince in the world at that time. Luthor, clad in a white protective suit, stared expressionlessly at the two soon-to-be biological materials on the examination table. His fingers grazed the cold edge of the table. If Alexander and his father, Philip II, had both been assassinated at that time, would his name still be remembered by the world, leaving a glorious page in human history? The answer is probably not. His eyes held a cold, unfathomable expression. He fetched a syringe, preparing to collect the Kryptonian's blood. Suddenly, Luthor's hand paused, and he frowned. His vision penetrated layers of steel and concrete, seeing through the ground and detecting the strength of the biological magnetic field in a unique gray perspective, two figures descended. One emitted a radiant and fiery brilliance, akin to a sun, while the other seemed restrained but solid, like a brilliant concentration of light formed into a human shape. You actually found me. Other people's life magnetic fields were like candles, but these two. In an instant, Luthor deduced their identities. His face darkened, and he glanced at the two sedated test subjects on the table. 
His nails extended, taking on the texture of silver metal, resembling a sharp dagger, swiftly severing the arm of one of the weakened Kryptonians who had been affected by the meteorite solution. In an instant, his palm emitted a freezing aura, freezing the severed limb. The ground seemed to ripple as it was pushed aside. Having gained powers after completing the Typhon plan, Luthor clutched the severed arm and prepared to retreat underground and escape immediately. If it were just Superman, he might have stayed and attempted to fight. But now there's a Beyonder. Luthor had uncovered Superman's true weaknesses, but the same could not be said for the Beyonder. Luthor had speculated that the Beyonder and Superman were of the same alien race, but during Zid's visit to Earth, he never mentioned the Beyonder, had made him doubt this hypothesis. Suddenly, the ground seemed to turn into solidifying cement, and Luthor's movements became sluggish. With his current strength, he could tear through not just cement but also steel. He looked above and... Crack! The ceiling of the underground fortress was torn open from above, and two figures descended. Luthor, along with the ground within several meters of him, was ripped from the ground, floating upward. He applied force with both arms, shattering the dirt wrapped around him by the force field. Since there was no escaping it, he ascended, confronting the two figures who were like evil guests. Beyonder, Superman. I never expected you to find this place. Do you think you can live for long once your real body appears under the sun? David's expression was indifferent. You took someone you shouldn't have taken from the moon, Luthor, Clark said, using his supervision to examine Luthor's body, confirming that this was not an android. He had seen Luthor cut off a Kryptonian's arm as casually as plucking a leaf from a plant, showing no regard for life, his voice was tinged with anger. Are you referring to the alien war criminal who invaded Earth? Luthor tore off his protective suit, revealing a black suit underneath. He tossed the previously eagerly collected severed arm aside, pulling out a handkerchief from his chest pocket to wipe his hands, and threw it away like garbage. The Superman who combats crime throughout the city, wanting to take people from here, I wonder which Earth law I've broken, he asked with a sneer. Unlawful detention? Maliciously harming others? Are aliens also protected by Earth's laws? You. A series of mocking questions, just asking whether aliens had rights like humans, made Clark clench his fist in anger. However, strictly speaking, Earth's various legal systems only apply to humans. According to legal terminology, Luthor had indeed not committed a crime. I'm not here to listen to your sophistry. David's icy voice broke in. He raised his hand to manipulate the gravitational field, pressing Luthor down from the sky. His voice was like the cold wind that constantly blew in the Arctic, sending shivers down one's spine. Do you remember what I said, Lex Luthor? Boom, Luthor was slammed to the ground as if a mountain had fallen on him. The earth cracked with a web-like pattern, and wave after wave of gravitational force pressed down. The ground sank several meters instantly, and the soil and rocks were compacted into something as hard as steel. Luthor's face twisted in anger. At times, he turned into steel, at times into stone, and at times changed his body size. He struggled to stand up, raising his head to look at the sky. Damn it, even with hundreds of abilities at his disposal, he couldn't withstand the power of this guy, even when combining them all. I haven't committed a crime. Superman, the beyonder who came with you, is committing a crime. He's attacking me, an innocent civilian. Can't you see that? Luthor's forehead veins bulged, and he sneered. Let me remind you, just when I took out my handkerchief, I activated the miniature camera on my chest with a gesture. Now, your every move as the superheroes who just saved the Earth is being broadcast to the entire world. A small red light on his button faintly flickered, indicating the camera. Wait a minute. Seeing the camera there, Clark's face changed, and he wanted to stop his brother. They had no legal support in their line of work, and their current actions were on the verge of breaking the law. Do you think I care about this, Luthor? However, David's face remained devoid of any emotion, and an invisible hand, like catching a small chick, ruthlessly squeezed towards Luthor. Equals 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 equals. Don't forget to send your power stones. Chapter 139, Luthor's Death and the Cosmic Signal. Equals 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 equals. A just aired live television channel was cut off. What just happened? I think I saw Superman and the Beyonder questioning someone? Lex Luthor. It sounds like he detained the aliens who attacked Earth. People's faces were surprised, excited, or skeptical, and they were all busy sending messages on their phones. I didn't know that aliens aren't protected by the law. So, on Earth, aliens have no human rights. On the other hand, Luthor is human and protected by human law. In a way, it seems Superman and the Beyonder might be breaking the law. Someone said in a weird tone, unsure of what to make of the situation. The screen went black, did the Beyonder take action? He doesn't seem to have the same respect for the law as Superman does, he doesn't care about violating it at all. The blackout of the live broadcast from the Luthor Core television station led to even more intense discussions and attention, with people eager to know the outcome. The intense pressure shattered the camera. Luthor was lifted into the air, feeling as if he was being crushed by several mountains, his bones creaking under the strain. He glared at David, his voice barely squeezing out through gritted teeth. Do you think you can crush me just like squishing a bug? So what if you can manipulate gravity? With hundreds of superpowers at his disposal to improvise and use, Luthor's strength was more than just this. Electricity shot from his eyes, and he transformed rapidly into a powerful electric current figure, hovering in the air, and looking contemptuously at David. Can you control me now? 
David frowned, his gravitational field having weak effects, transforming into a live electrical form. Luthor easily resisted the gravity David imposed. Anything with mass has gravity, and electrical current is formed by the directed flow of electrons. Although electrons have mass, it's negligible. Luthor released an electric attack, powerful enough to melt steel like lightning, burning the air as it fiercely struck David. You want to influence me in this form and hinder my actions, wait until you have the strength to tear the earth apart with a wave of your hand. You're right. A dazzling electric current, like the cawing of crows, surged toward him. David didn't even flinch, he allowed the current to strike him, which was instantly absorbed by him, and sighed in amazement. I haven't experienced such a weak attack for a long time. After facing Ares, the god of war, ORM, the ocean master, and General Zid, such a weak attack made him reminisce about the feeling he had when encountering superhumans in Smallville. He thought about how Luthor was particularly interested in the scientist who had once studied meteorites. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, Luthor's many abilities should probably come from the people in Smallville who were mutated by kryptonite radiation. Having guessed the source of Luthor's abilities, David raised his palm, and a blazing stream of purple cosmic energy erupted, piercing the sky and hitting Luthor forcefully. The electrical current that made up Luthor's body was extinguished, and he screamed as if he were being tortured, thrown back by the impact. In his electric current form, he had escaped from David's gravity power, but it also meant that many of his abilities were rendered useless, effectively disabling 99% of his powers. But there was no other way, at least this way, he could still resist. Stabilizing his body in the air, Luthor rushed into the underground bunker. He tore off a thick cable and absorbed the electricity stored in the bunker used for scientific experiments. His body continued to grow as he absorbed the current. 3 meters, 10 meters, 15 meters. Luthor's body quickly reached a height of 100 meters, towering like a giant hill, and he swung his massive fists toward Clark and David. You alien bugs, this is the world of humans. But he was like a paper giant. Clark dodged his fist, and David's body pierced his chest like a bullet. A large hole appeared in his chest, his back arched, and Luthor's eyes bulged as he angrily punched David. David caught the fist, which was even larger than his own body, and held it tightly. His energy-absorbing ability activated, turning him into an energy black hole, rapidly sucking away Luthor's electrical current. He shrunk rapidly, like a deflating balloon. Buzz. A powerful telekinetic force ripped a corner of the bunker off and levitated it. Under Luthor's control, the wreckage of dozens of tons of steel and concrete was hurled at David. David shot energy beams from his eyes, cutting the bunker open. The electricity Luthor had absorbed flowed into David, and his body quickly returned to normal size. What was terrifying, though, was that David showed no intention of letting go. No, no. Luthor widened his eyes, and his psychic shockwave, which could instantly turn tens of thousands of people into fools, struck David's head. However, it was like surging tides crashing against an immovable dam, having no effect at all. David's cold eyes didn't even show a trace of emotion. Superman, are you just going to watch him kill me? As his body shrank, Luthor cunningly yelled out, seeking help from Superman, whom he had always wanted to eliminate or capture. He wanted to exploit Clark's kindness and become his ultimate lifeline. In midair, Clark clenched his fist, his face showing a struggle, and he moved forward. Think about what Luthor almost did last time in Metropolis. Seeing Clark about to rush over to separate him from Luthor, David spoke slowly. Last time, Clark paused in his movement, his expression changing. Last time, Luthor had exploited Clark's character and abilities, using a high-speed train carrying thousands of passengers and concealing a bomb. He had designed it to make Clark lose his strength and consciousness, nearly becoming an experiment subject for the military and Luthor. But what concerned Clark was not those aspects, it was the thousands of innocent citizens used as bait by Luthor. Just as he had reached a certain distance, he struggled to stay in place. Last time, he had luckily stopped the train, but what about next time? Allowing Lex Luthor, this unscrupulous guy, to continue living, who knows what he might do, David said. Don't forget, you owe this city. Because of David's reminder, Clark recalled the recent disaster in Metropolis caused by Zed, and Batman's words echoed in his mind. He clenched his teeth, turned away, and refused to look at the scene of his brother killing. Superman, your principles have been twisted. With the final absorption of the electric current, Luthor's cheeks hollowed, and he stared in despair. No, is this your final testament? In the comics, Lex Luthor tried many different methods to preserve his life, but this time they failed for the first time, David was still expressionless. Luthor had exploited Clark's kindness to manipulate him. Clark wasn't deeply affected by it, but he was angry about the situation. However, his desire to kill wasn't particularly strong, otherwise, he would have come for Luthor much sooner. It's just that Lex Luthor is too cunning and despicable, willing to do anything. Allowing him to stay alive is a potential threat. He wasn't afraid of Luthor's tricks and schemes. But I'm afraid that Luthor, as he continues to oppose us, will come into contact with both me and Clark more frequently and uncover our true identities. Smallville was just an inconspicuous town near Metropolis, but after several unsuccessful attempts to deal with David and Clark, Luthor would sooner or later target the small town, which was the impact site of the meteor, to unearth their real identities and find their weaknesses. Those so-called weaknesses are Jonathan and Martha. David wouldn't allow such a thing to happen. 
He grabbed Lithor's vulnerable neck like a vice, coldly absorbing his final electric current. Life, that is the sultry day, death, that is the cooling night. Lithor was almost turned into a mummy. With his last breath, he showed a strange serenity on his face and recited a line from Heinrich Heine's poem. He had an eerie, weak smile on his lips. Alexander has been remembered by the world for thousands of years. I wonder if the world will remember me, Lex Luthor, a thousand years from now. He stared at David and Clark, and after saying his last words, he lowered his head. I'm about to enter the night, but the name Lex Luthor will never fade away. David's eyes shifted, and he released purple cosmic energy from his hand to completely destroy Lex Luthor's body. He didn't want Luthor's body to remain and become sensational headlines in the newspapers, and for his parents to be horrified when they saw it. Additionally, he wanted to prevent the shrewd Luthor from faking his own death. Nobody knew how many abilities he had gained through biotechnology. Making sure that not a single cell of Luthor's body remained in the world, David reflected on his earlier words. What did he mean? Clark flew over, his expression a complex mix of emotions, with a hint of confusion. Just moments ago, he, the superhero everyone looked up to, the symbol of hope for the future, had allowed his brother to commit murder right in front of him and just sat back and watched. Luthor's final words obviously had a hidden meaning, but he couldn't figure out the specifics. Could he have left behind a plan to create a major news event, making humanity remember him forever through an unforgettable disaster? He speculated from the worst possible angle. Lex Luthor is a vain and ambitious man. He wouldn't want that kind of reputation. David shook his head and muttered softly, drawing a faint possibility from his memory. A clone. In the comics, Luthor was known for his cunning mind and advanced technology, constantly opposing Superman. Among the technologies he possessed, cloning was one of his sharpest weapons. Luthor's technology even reached a point where he could create a perfect clone of a Kryptonian after a period of time. The anti-Superman, Bizarro, who gained strength from consuming kryptonite, was one of his experimental results. In a certain world, Batman once stole Luthor's cloning technology and mass-produced his own clones. He wanted Batman to become an everlasting symbol, maintaining the peak of his strength at 27, to intimidate all evildoers. Luthor even transferred his consciousness into the body of his clone several times to escape death. Information about Luthor's cloning technology floated through David's mind. However, based on Luthor's tone just now, it didn't seem like consciousness transfer. Now, he probably hasn't mastered that advanced technology. Most likely, he had left an opportunity for his clone to create a name for Lex Luthor in human history. A ridiculous aspiration. David couldn't comprehend Luthor's intense obsession with leaving a mark on human history. Even if you leave a duplicate, you won't be able to stir up any more trouble. Most likely, Luthor had left behind a contingency plan, so that once he died, some underground facility would automatically start cloning. However, with Jor-El's ability to monitor the world, unless Lex Luthor's clone avoids all human technology capable of eavesdropping and surveillance, he will be immediately apprehended. At that time, it's just a matter of taking action and killing him again. After dealing with Luthor's situation, rescuing the two Kryptonians, and going to the Arctic to incarcerate them in the Fortress of Solitude, David and Clark returned home to rest for a few days. The day for the start of university was approaching. For most families, this should have been a nervous and exciting day when their children embarked on their university journey, symbolizing their transition to adulthood. However, in the Kent family farmhouse at this moment, what did you say, you want to drop out of school? Martha had just finished feeding the chickens on the farm, returned to the house, and took two sips, hey, of freshly brewed coffee. She couldn't believe what she had heard and almost spat out the coffee in shock. Martha, calm down a bit, let them explain first. Jonathan quickly reassured his agitated wife, fell silent, and looked at his two sons, vaguely supporting their decision. How did you come up with this? Are you serious? Dad, you don't seem surprised at all, David said with a hint of confusion. For most parents, when their sons who have grown up with great difficulty suddenly decide to drop out of university, they would undoubtedly be extremely anxious. Well, who can blame me when both my sons have not only saved the world multiple times but also repeatedly tested my heart, Jonathan smiled and joked with a humorous tone. In the living room, Clark scratched his head and expressed his thoughts seriously. I don't think university can help me much, and it would take up too much of my time. He could learn all the knowledge taught in university in less than an hour. If the goal was merely to obtain a diploma that could lead to a good job and a good income, he could have become America's most sought-after football star earning millions before the age of 18. He needed more time to have Superman soar over the skies of Metropolis, guarding the city that had suffered because of him. A tinge of guilt flashed in Clark's eyes. I'm in a similar situation. David spread his hands. He didn't really care about university life. He couldn't be honest with his parents either. He had two ancient civilizations to rule, which often tied up some of his mental energy, requiring him to maintain stability and extract emotional points from time to time. He had no spare time for a leisurely university life. All right. Seeing their determination and considering their special circumstances, their parents, Jonathan, and Martha, weren't narrow-minded. Although their relatives, friends, and neighbors might have some opinions, but they didn't care much about that. Without the need to attend university, their tight schedule suddenly became more relaxed. 
David and Clark had just prepared to spend a leisurely and relaxing afternoon when they received a message from the Fortress of Solitude in the Arctic, a reminder from Jor-El. You might need to come to the fortress. Zid seems to have attracted the attention of some individuals. Someone in the universe is using advanced technology to search for the signal of the Kryptonian ship and is heading towards Earth. Equals 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 equals. Don't forget to send your power stones. Chapter 140, The Ultimate Mechanical Kryptonian? Don't forget to send your power stones. Equals 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 equals. A massive spaceship resembling a skeleton soared through the boundless cosmos, akin to an enormous beast in search of its prey, continuously scanning for signals from Krypton. Inside the spaceship, hundreds of thousands of skeletal robots lay dormant. There are actually living Kryptonians in the universe? This will devalue my collection. This error needs to be corrected. On the cold mechanical throne, a towering figure with numerous nutrient tubes plugged into his back, opened his indifferent eyes, tapping the armrest of the throne, like an unhappy monarch discovering a flaw in their treasure. Have you not found them yet? He asked, looking at his subordinates within the spaceship. A muscular man dressed in blue and red battle armor, with over 80% of his body replaced by machinery, only a small portion of his face remained as evidence that he was once a flesh and blood creature. Steel jaws and crimson electronic eyes made him look inhuman and menacing. We've pinpointed the specific star system, my creator. He had an S symbol on his chest and said in a cold and mechanical tone. When you find those surviving Kryptonians, eliminate them. I rescued you from the destruction of Krypton, replaced your hippocampus with an overclock matrix, substituted your brain lobes with a lens amplifier, and used the metal melted from a stellar core to complete your incomplete body. I erased all your past imperfections, gave you a new life, becoming unparalleled, and made you the ultimate Kryptonian. The tall figure with green skin on the throne described the terrible modifications he had made to the person before him as if bestowing a great merciful gift, devoid of any emotion. I haven't used my biological shell in years. I hope you don't disappoint me. The man once known as Zorel lowered his head and obeyed. If you come across any cities worthy of collecting on your journey, remember to bring them back to me. Please rest assured, my creator. With that, the tall figure with green skin on the throne closed his eyes, as if this powerful body, created from countless potent genes, was just a temporary vessel for his consciousness to speak through. The mechanical Kryptonian gazed out into space through a porthole. In the direction he was looking at, a mature yellow star burned slowly. Inside the Fortress of Solitude in the Arctic, David and Clark frowned as they watched a signal displaying an image sent by Jor-El. For the past two days, someone in space has been using quantum field technology to search for Kryptonian ships, Jor-El reported. I've noticed the signal intervals are getting shorter, he added. Does that mean they are getting closer to Earth? David touched his chin and frowned. A Kryptonian ship searching for Krypton. What could they want? Are there surviving Kryptonians who wish to reunite with Zid? But as of now, the only surviving Kryptonians besides those trapped in the Phantom Zone and possibly Supergirl who may be on her way to the Earth are the Kryptonians from Kandor City in Brainiac's collection. There shouldn't be any other surviving Kryptonians in the universe. Is there any way to identify who it is? Clark asked in surprise. Through the Green Lantern Corps and the Fortress of Solitude's information database, he had learned the role that Krypton had played in the universe. Despite having long abandoned its expansion and colonization, many civilizations throughout the cosmos still feared the formidable power of Krypton almost conquered the universe. Now, there are people blatantly searching for Kryptonian ships. In the deep dark sea, when encountering top predators, shouldn't they choose to stay away? I'm not sure, Jor-El shook his head. The other party's technology surpasses mine, he continued. They possess technology greater than that of Krypton. David's eyebrow twitched. Kryptonian technology was already among the most advanced in the universe, especially with Jor-El being considered one of the greatest geniuses on Krypton. This alarming fact reminded him of a green, bald figure, someone a hundred times more terrifying than Lex Luthor, Brainiac. Meanwhile, a massive steel skeleton spaceship, resembling a mountain peak, arrived above Earth. The mechanical Kryptonian closed his eyes and instantly infiltrated electronic devices worldwide, processing a vast amount of information in a blink, pinpointing crucial pieces of information. Zid has been subdued? Superman? New surviving Kryptonians? The Beyonder, an unknown and powerful alien race? Armor made of special metal that can temporarily resist the Kryptonians. He suddenly discovered that this seemingly inconspicuous, never heard of before planet in the cosmos had brought an unexpected series of surprises. The mechanical Kryptonian muttered coldly, and in the next instant, he decided how to deal with these unexpected findings. Zid and Superman must be destroyed to ensure the value of our creator's collection. The Beyonder must be captured for our creator's research on the evolution of his biological shell. This civilization called humanity must be catalogued and eradicated. He pressed a button. First, let's preserve samples of this world's civilization. Tens of thousands of skeletal robots within the spaceship were awakened, swarming like a hive of bees, their feet emitting flames as they broke through the atmosphere and headed toward a city named Metropolis. Let's choose the city called Metropolis, the mechanical Kryptonian decided, pointing at the Earth's projection, and decided the fate of the planet. 
Just as he had visited other civilizations with the will of his creator in the past, he selected the city that best represented their civilization to preserve as a collectible for his creator, and then he would destroy their civilization. In the garden known as the universe, there's no need for too many weeds. As his creator often said, on the streets of Metropolis, what is that? People looked up in fear. Thousands of steel figures fell from the cosmos like shooting stars, crashing heavily onto the ground. The skeletal robot's red eyes lit up from their skull-like heads. Am I seeing things? What are these things? The crowd panicked and retreated like frightened sheep. The world is about to be destroyed, and you have been chosen to be preserved as a sample of civilization. We are responsible for taking you over, so please return to your homes immediately. Go home immediately. The three-meter-tall skeletal robots mechanically repeated their message, using their arms to destroy objects on the streets. One robot effortlessly lifted a car, sending it flying straight up to the fifth floor of a nearby building, crashing through it. Amidst the chaos and horrifying screams, people fled in terror into the distance. The skeletal robots launched terrifying attacks, as if shepherds wielding whips, driving their cattle and sheep back to their pens. The latest reports from the front lines indicate that the military, police, and medical personnel attempting to engage the robots in the streets of Metropolis are facing an impenetrable wall. The troops attacking the robots have suffered heavy casualties. On television, the host nervously reported the news, his usually fluent eloquence stuttered. In light of this, Mayor Max Miner has stated that no matter what we are facing, we will use every weapon at our disposal to resist. But at this moment, we need our superheroes. If they are in front of the TV, I hope they hear this. Some citizens may have had doubts and accusations earlier, and I hope they don't take them to heart. Before he could finish, a menacing skeletal robot burst through the wall and invaded the television studio. It casually fired a sonic blast that shattered the set, sending wooden splinters flying, and heartlessly repeated its message to the people who were so frightened that they ran away. We are taking over, so please return to your homes immediately. Oh my god. At the Kent farm, a married couple watched the news on TV in disbelief. What happened to the Earth? It hadn't been long since Metropolis had suffered an alien attack. Where were their two sons now? Not only the couple, but millions of people in Metropolis eagerly looked to the sky, hoping to see those two figures appear. Help? My daughter is trapped under a car. Who can come and save me? Beyonder, Superman, where are you? Save us. Countless people cried out those two names. Equals 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 equals. Don't forget to send your power stones. Chapter 141, Clark's uncle? Equals 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 equals. In Earth's orbit, a massive spaceship in the shape of a skull, like a harbinger of destruction, loomed over the entire blue planet. David and Clark obtained satellite images and information about the chaos in Metropolis from Jor-El and hurried back to Metropolis from the North Pole. Destroy the civilization, but leave one city. This is Brainiac's style. Recalling the slogans of those robots, a sense of urgency filled David's eyes as they streaked through the sky at hundreds of times the speed of sound. This was an unprecedentedly powerful enemy that the Earth had encountered, and, most importantly, his home was right next to Metropolis. Brainiac, originally created by the Kaluan scientists as artificial intelligence with the highest level of intelligence in the universe. However, it evolved out of control, consumed the scientists who created it, conquered the entire planet, and continued to evolve, developing his own greed, envy, and hatred. Subsequently, he transformed into a collector in the universe, delighting in the destruction of civilizations and selecting a desired city to shrink and preserve as a collectible. David recalled the information about Brainiac as the metropolis city appeared on the horizon, but suddenly, an astonishing green light poured down from the sky like a waterfall, submerging the entire city. Both of them quickly stopped and stared at the breathtaking scene. A beam of light enveloped the entire city. After the blinding light dissipated, the earth revealed a massive and grim scar. The bridges leading out of the city broke, and the underground drainage system was exposed to the air. A city covering tens of thousands of square kilometers disappeared into thin air. Metropolis. It's gone. In midair, Clark opened his mouth wide, unable to believe what he saw, his eyes filled with shock. No, Metropolis is still there, but it has become smaller. David frowned his brow and pointed to the very center of the enormous pit at the bottom. There was a steel gray area about the size of a beehive, contrasting sharply with the brownish soil surrounding the pit for miles. With Clark's supervision, he immediately saw the bottom of the pit, zooming in with microscopic precision. Once again, he laid eyes on the familiar steel city, enclosed by a glass dome. The city that occupied a large amount of land now seemed to have turned into a model. What just happened? The bright light blinded me, and I hurt my neck. Did I get a concussion? Why does it feel like the sky is distorted, and that's, that's glass? People in the city peered through the glass, like a storefront, at the sky, magnified countless times by the floating clouds, and they were terrified beyond belief. The fear and chaos in the city reached its peak. Chloe had just finished a late-night manuscript the previous day. She opened the curtains of her rented apartment and saw what was happening outside. She rubbed her eyes, and her vision spun before she passed out. Help, I must be dreaming. Giant subterranean creatures climbed up the glass dome, with two antennae resembling the main cables of the Golden Gate Bridge, and their massive jaws were like two mountain ranges pressed together, casting shadows over several blocks. The citizens were in a state of extreme panic, and some even fainted from fear, clutching their chests. 
Survivors of Planet 200,458, you have been sealed. The permanent sealing will be completed in one hour and is irreversible. Welcome to the Creator's Collection. The robots that remained in the city mechanically broadcasted the message. The Skull spaceship above Earth projected a tractor beam, and the metropolis enclosed by the glass dome floated up and headed into the interior of the spaceship. Clark's face turned pale, and he was about to fly to catch up, but David held him back. The citizens need help, he turned to look at his brother. They'll be fine, there's something more urgent right now. David gestured to him to look at the edge of the massive pit. Tens of thousands of Skull robots, equipped with cutting-edge cosmic technology, began to depart, destroying everything they encountered, preparing to bring about the death of this living planet. Only in this way can Brainiac's collection have the highest possible value of being unique. The town of Smallville was located on the outskirts of Metropolis, and this inconspicuous town was not reduced in size along with the rest of Metropolis. However, due to its geographical location, it was going to bear the brunt of the attack. Mom, Dad. Clark hesitated for a moment, then gritted his teeth, withdrew his gaze from the city already taken aboard the spaceship, and descended like a supersonic fighter. He punched and shattered several of the robots that had entered the town first, scattering their parts in all directions. Swoosh, let's deal with these robots first, and then we'll save Metropolis. A scorching cosmic energy beam shot out from David's eyes, sweeping through and cutting down the skull robots like wheat falling before the scythe. Template fusion at 54%. After clearing the robots near the town, David's eyes flashed with a strange light. The last time the template fusion level grew abnormally, he had some guesses because of it. The system requires influencing individuals crucial to the fate of the world to acquire emotional points, such as those superheroes or supervillains and people with extraordinary powers. But in the plot of the fate of the world, what role do ordinary people always play? They seem unimportant, often unremarkable, and constantly in need of rescue when faced with powerful supervillains. However, if they didn't exist, would any of the storylines have any meaning? Superheroes defeated supervillains and thwarted the conspiracy to destroy the world, but if the world is a desolate empty land, is it still worth saving? Those are the hidden important characters. David raised his hand and released a torrent of energy, smashing several robots. His eyes narrowed. Although these ordinary people had never appeared on the panel's refresh, they undeniably contributed to his template fusion level. Ever since he appeared before the masses as the purple light man, he had been paying attention and confirmed that every time he appeared, it stirred the emotions of those ordinary people. Afterward, the template fusion level always has abnormal growth. David had no interest in saving the world, doing something for strangers unrelated to him. However, if it meant gaining emotional points, he didn't mind helping out when the situation wasn't dangerous. Of course, if the situation was dangerous he was going to come to the rescue quickly. Scanning detected leaked Kryptonian samples, must be destroyed. The army of Skull robots saw David and Clark, shouting as they ascended, a steel army approaching like a swarm of locusts. It seemed that, in comparison to world destruction, they had identified a higher priority target. Scanning detected the unknown life form to be captured, prepare for capture. Energy laser cannons rained down, along with steel fists that could easily pierce through tanks. David and Clark fought their way through the encirclement of robot forces. We can't allow any of these robots to leave our sight intact. Clark swung his iron fist, and his immense strength shattered the brittle steel alloys that these robots were made of. David manipulated the gravity field and ruthlessly compressed over a hundred skeleton robots together, crushing them into a pile of scrap metal, and letting them fall to the ground. These skull robots created by Brainiac seemed like shoddy goods in the hands of David and Clark, but in reality, they had been responsible for destroying one world after another under Brainiac's control. On Earth, any one of these robots, taken at random, would be capable of fighting in various terrains and environments, including jungles, deserts, lava, and the depths of the ocean. They could fly at speeds of over 10 times the speed of sound, effortlessly throw tanks weighing tens of tons, and unleash energy attacks that could pierce through skyscrapers. The power of a single robot could easily annihilate an entire powerful army. Tens of thousands of skull robots could effortlessly bring about the destruction of the Earth. Allowing just one of these robots to escape and embark on its programmed journey to destroy the world could potentially result in countless lives lost in its hands. Gotham and Metropolis are like a pair of twin siblings, one shrouded in shadow and silence, the other prosperous and vibrant, gazing at each other across a stretch of coastline. But now, the other side of the coast has turned into a massive abyss, a dark void staring at the sky, leaving only Gotham behind. Brainiac claims to collect samples of civilizations. In fact, his spaceship immediately invades the entire planet's database of intelligence whenever it arrives on a life-bearing planet, downloading all useful information. Whether or not a city was left behind was inconsequential, it was just his personal preference. Metropolis is not the most perfect city on Earth, and it was difficult to call it a model of Earth's civilization. However, no matter what, it was not Gotham's turn to be a model of Earth's civilization, and it managed to escape due to its decadence and darkness, making even the mechanical Kryptonian frown. But Gotham's Batman couldn't stand idly in the face of a crisis in the neighboring city. He piloted his Fenrir armor, which was made of Prometheum, a metal that could absorb energy, defending against all attacks. It possessed the power to sink battleships and destroy one robot after another. What's the reason this time? 
He fired a batarang, grabbed a skeleton robot with a bat hook, and viciously hurled it, smashing another ten. The hoarse and grim voice resonated from the towering and heavy mech suit, allowing anyone to guess his expression without even seeing his face. I've been alive for over 30 years, even though I've spent half of that time out of this country. But I remember that the old metropolis has never been this lively before. But ever since you guys appeared, world-threatening crises involving the universe and aliens are happening one after another, all centered around metropolis. It couldn't help but make one wonder if it was the presence of these two people that attracted the gaze of some terrifying entities from the universe to this planet. Just like two rhinoceros beetles suddenly appeared in an ordinary ant colony. What used to be an unnoticed roadside now has curious onlookers wanting to dismantle and study it, potentially bringing disaster to the ant nest. Bruce Wayne's suspicious mind stirred again. If the two of them left this planet, would the world return to its previous state of relative peace? He could go back and peacefully patrol the city in his bat suit, just like before. Gotham is full of lunatics, especially a bunch of mentally ill criminals who don't commit crimes for money, but the number has become more and more since your appearance. David manipulated the gravity field, shattering dozens of robots that had rushed at him. He glanced at Bruce and spoke coldly. Can these events also be attributed to you? In reality, what Bruce was saying wasn't baseless suspicion. To some extent, these crises were indeed related to Clark's appearance. In the comics, Dr. Manhattan had once used the universe as an experimental ground to study this matter. Clark is the starting point of everything and could even influence the past. As long as his destiny changed even slightly, it could lead to significant alterations in the timeline. It could be said that Clark is the son of DC and the centerpiece of the multiverse. They came to Earth following Zid's ship. Clark fiercely sent a skull robot flying and violently crushed its parts. His face had a slightly unpleasant expression, and he explained in a serious tone. He didn't want things to escalate to this point, but the situation had developed beyond their control. The disaster Zid brought was already enough to make him feel guilty, but the trouble was far from over. No matter who's behind these robots, I will stop them, and no one will be harmed in this event. Clark's eyes burned with determination as he swept through a large group of robots and clenched his fists, gazing at the sky. Someone has arrived from space. David stared into the heavens, squinting his eyes. In space, within the massive skull-shaped spaceship, the mechanical Kryptonian surveyed the metropolis trapped under the glass dome. His steel fingers glided across the glass, seemingly oblivious to the terrified people within the city, screaming and crying at the sight of the giant hand in the sky. He waved his hand dismissively. Bring it down, seal it. Two skull robots stepped forward to receive the metropolis that had turned into a city in a bottle. Zorel cast a cold gaze downward. The steel floor transformed into a transparent screen, continuously displaying data of David and Clark's battle against the skull robots. His intelligent brain rapidly calculated an unsettling conclusion. If there is no external interference, tens of thousands of combat units will be completely annihilated by these two in just over ten minutes. He controlled the ship to open the hatch, and crimson flames erupted from beneath it, resembling a comet of doom and death hurtling straight down. In the sky above Metropolis, three of them gazed at the trail of flames caused by the Crimson Comet, its entire body wrapped in fire due to friction with the atmosphere. The atmosphere hummed and buzzed, a powerful oppressive force rolling in. It's you! Clark shouted angrily and punched the oncoming threat. The source of this disaster. Boom! The flames exploded, and a figure with blue and red appeared, sending Clark flying. A visible shockwave spread out, sweeping across hundreds of meters. Facing a powerful enemy he had never seen before, Clark felt like his head had been struck by a meteor. He flew out hundreds of meters, steadied himself, shook his head, and was about to launch an angry counterattack when he suddenly froze. Who, who are you? David and Bruce Wayne exchanged rapid glances between the two of them. Even the ferocious skull robots halted at this moment, guarding the newcomer like an escort, making him appear as a superior mechanical god. The same red and blue themed costume, a similar S symbol on the chest, and even a somewhat similar facial appearance, one flesh and blood, the other mechanical. Mechanical Superman. David's gaze sharpened as he recognized the identity of the newcomer from his distinctive appearance. The mechanical Superman was one of Brainiac's creations, a product of his technological modulation, one of the survivors of Krypton, and initially, Clark's own uncle and Supergirl's father Zor-El. Krypton, as a renowned and powerful civilization throughout the universe, has been coveted by Brainiac to serve as a sample of his collection. When Krypton was destroyed, he saved a Kryptonian city named Kandor and preserved it. Zor-El was affected by the explosion, and was gravely injured, and Brainiac transformed him into a servant to collect samples of civilizations, turning him into the mechanical Superman. I am the ultimate Kryptonian created by the Creator, here to fulfill his will. Zor-El stared at Clark and David with a cold gaze, and his hand transformed into a sharp blade, like a messenger of God's will, exuding a fierce momentum as he moved to attack the two. You need to be eliminated, and you need to be captured. Equals 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 equals. Don't forget to send your power stones. Chapter 142, Brainiac arrives, equals 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 equals. The mechanical Superman, modified by Brainiac, has forgotten his past memories and no longer possesses the calm wisdom and gentle tolerance toward his family as a famous scientist on Krypton. He now acts with ruthless efficiency, like a real machine. 
Upon appearing, he wasted no time saying anything and swiftly moved to accomplish his mission objectives, attacking both David and Clark. Whoosh, a blue alloy battle blade cut through the air, with a shrill sound. Clark narrowly dodged and avoided it, feeling a discomforting sensation against his skin as he widened his eyes. The weapons General Zid brought could harm Kryptonians bathed in the yellow sun when used with enough force, and he felt that the blade made from this unknown guy's mechanical body was no worse than the daggers of Zid and others. Watch out for his weapons. Clark shouted, alerting the others. As soon as he shouted, the mechanical Superman backhanded him, sending him flying. His speed was greater than that of an ordinary Kryptonian, surpassing even Clark. With your emotions tied up in other things, you are distracted during the battle. This is an imperfect performance, he taunted in a mechanical voice. Swoosh. Bruce Wayne, in his Fenrir armor, charges forward to attack. The mechanical Superman's electronic eyes emitted a laser with terrifying intensity, along with a tremendous impact, which sent Bruce flying backward. The Fenrir armor, operating at maximum capacity, was still unable to resist the force. Anomalies in the surrounding gravity parameters detected. As mechanical Superman attempted to continue his attack, he suddenly felt an all-encompassing, crushing force, like a mountain, pressing down on him, causing his body to sink and plummet to the ground. Jets of light emitted from his feet, stabilizing his body. He looked up, then, as David charged toward him. David exerted a terrible gravitational force on the mechanical Superman, rendering his movements sluggish, weakening his punches, and making every action a struggle against the immense gravity. He flew up and punched the opponent, starting a fight with him. Zor. As Clark was about to move forward to assist David, his green lantern ring, with its cosmic communication function, suddenly lit up, projecting the holographic image of Jor-El. He looked at the mechanical Kryptonian with shock and confusion. Do you know him, father? Clark asked, watching the mechanical Superman struggle against David's fierce attacks. He is Zor-El, my younger brother, and your uncle, Jor-El responded with a complex expression. He never expected to see his brother again, especially looking like this. He didn't die in the destruction of Krypton. Why has he turned like this? Jor-El's brother, Zor-El, was born into the El family, one of Krypton's three major families. Just like Jor-El, from a young age, he displayed exceptional intelligence and grew up to become one of Krypton's most outstanding scientists. Though Zor-El had a strong personality and always aimed to match or even surpass his brilliant older brother Jor-El, it didn't affect their relationship. What? My, uncle. Clark looked in astonishment at the mechanical Superman, who had just been punched by David. No wonder when he first saw this man, even though they were on opposing sides, he felt an inexplicable affinity that made him stop and inquire about the man's identity. So, the S symbol on his chest isn't a coincidence. It really is the emblem of our house of L that represents hope. Jor-El had informed him that all their family members were dead and combined with Zor-El's ruthless control of the robots to destroy the Earth, he had some suspicions but now wasn't the time to delve deeper into it. Regardless, his condition doesn't look right. Let's take him down first. Clark clenches his fist and charges forward. Without saying it out loud, Zor-El seems much more like an android than an ordinary person, and was obviously not what an ordinary person should be, which made him wonder that his uncle might also be under someone's control. Red Solar Energy Wave Cannon, Fire. However, Feeling the pressure from the three united against him, Zor-El no longer held back and fired the red solar energy wave, targeting the Kryptonian's vulnerability. I, I'm growing weaker. Clark is sent flying by the energy wave. He looks at his hands, as if a machine that once had an endless power source had suddenly been cut off. His body sways for a moment, almost falling from the sky. Step back, Clark. David reminds him. In addition to kryptonite, the Kryptonian's vulnerability is the light of a red sun, which weakens their powers. However, living under a yellow sun, there seemed to be no need to mention this matter. But now, Clark had encountered one of the two things that has often plagued him in the comics, kryptonite and the final vulnerability, the red solar energy. David, he's actually my uncle. Please don't kill him. Realizing his own unusual state and remembering the weaknesses of kryptonians he had seen in the Fortress of Solitude's database, Clark hurriedly stepped back and reminded David. Seeing Batman immediately looking in their direction, he awkwardly coughed in embarrassment. It's not hard for Clark to guess what Bruce was thinking. The man who is about to destroy the world is his uncle, and any connection to Clark only makes the situation more complicated. Bruce is likely to suspect that he is at the root of all the trouble. I understand. David, who had known Zor-El's identity from the beginning, delivered a relentless punch to the mechanical Superman's side, altering the weight of his steel body. Whoosh! The blade of the mechanical Superman's counterattack stagnated, his body swayed, and his movements became distorted as David struck him, sending him flying. The body is receiving unidentified attacks and is recalculating the attack method. Calculation in progress. With varying weights applied to different parts of his body, the greater the force, the more unbalanced and distorted the mechanical Superman's movements became. He was defenseless against David's tactics. This is the recent method David has learned to use his powers. It worked pretty well for the first time. David's energy laser struck the mechanical Superman's chest, now with clumsy movements, and blew him away. Clark and Bruce seized the opportunity to launch a fierce attack, trying to subdue him. The mechanical Superman whose body had been reconstructed based on the already powerful Kryptonian physique, was far more formidable than an average Kryptonian. 
He even has a record of defeating Superman in the comics, and he was a challenging opponent to subdue. Furthermore, his body has been almost entirely rebuilt. The effectiveness of Kryptonite is limited against him. We can only try to defeat him head-on. Calculation complete. The blue red steel body, showing some signs of wear, appears slightly disheveled. After calculating the computer body parameters, the mechanical Superman regains the ability to fight with the appropriate level of strength, and his movements and speed become fluid once more. Body anomaly. However, during David's battle with him, he rapidly changes the weight of a part of his body once again, throwing off the calculations in the algorithm of the mechanical Superman. Establish a model and conduct an analysis. The skeleton robots, under the control of the mechanical Superman, swarmed the three of them like a frenzied horde, but they posed no threat at all in the face of David and others, even to the weakened Clark. As they gather together, they become even easier to destroy. Your attack has been deciphered. Life form known as the Beyonder, do you have any other tricks up your sleeve? However, this gave him a short respite. In that short time, the mechanical Superman constructed a program in his mind, after detecting the corresponding changes in body weight and immediately matched the appropriate algorithm, launching a fierce counterattack. I am the perfect Kryptonian made by my creator. I am invulnerable. David's tactic of altering the weight of his body to disrupt his abilities gradually became ineffective. Oh, is that so? However, David's tricks don't end there. Give this a try. David alters the gravity field surrounding the mechanical Superman, turning it into more than a simple oppression. The mechanical Superman seemed to have plunged to the depths of a vast ocean, his body battered by surging undercurrents, rising and falling, getting pushed from one side to the other. This is the simplest gravity manipulation. David's powers are fully at play, and the machine-like appearance of the mechanical Superman, while he seemed like a drunken man, flipping upside down in the air, unable to resist. Gravity does not distinguish between friend and foe, Clark and Batman turned their attention to the remaining skeleton robots. Crash, bang, smash. The two combatants exchange blows from the sky to the ground, dispersing the clouds in the 10,000 meter high sky, splitting the earth with winding fissures. At this point, Metropolis has been packed away, there is nothing on the ground. Otherwise, the intensity of their battle would have caused far more casualties in Metropolis than when it arrived. At least half of Metropolis would have been reduced to rubble, shockwaves rippled out, the atmosphere buzzed, David's fist was like a violent storm, and the mechanical Superman seemed to have become nothing more than a punching bag, defenseless. Crack. There was a sound of steel shattering in the air. The mechanical Superman's jaw was broken and dislocated, emitting sparks of energy. However, his strange appearance didn't affect his ability to speak. After all, his voice no longer relied on the vibrations of fragile vocal cords, but there was only a slight lag. Your resistance is futile. I am but a messenger of my creator. If you defeat me, it will only bring about his personal arrival, and then your world won't even leave behind a speck of dust. Under the series of attacks capable of tearing the earth apart and leveling mountains, the mechanical Superman's body seemed to have malfunctioned, and his movements, along with his voice, became choppy. David grabbed the mechanical Superman's neck, rendering him helpless. This is the downside of a mechanical body. The more precise it is, the higher the chances of errors. If you were still made of flesh and blood, you might have had a fighting chance now. David has long since figured out who is behind him. Ignoring the threat, a hint of cold mockery flashes in his eyes. Messenger, who is this creator you're talking about? Bruce Wayne's face darkens as he asks. It's Brainiac. Seeing his brother being captured, the Green Lantern ring once again projected the image of Jor-El, who had a complicated expression as he answered. Who is that? Both Bruce and Clark in the room looked at him with puzzled frowns. He is a rogue artificial intelligence with a level 12 intellect, the highest in the universe. He can absorb the knowledge of an entire galaxy in a matter of hours and possesses the most advanced technology in the universe. He is incredibly powerful and enjoys destroying any civilizations he comes across, leaving only one city as a collection. Jor-El looked solemnly at the colossal pit left behind in the thousands of square kilometers of Metropolis, which had been removed. Before, he didn't recognize the infamous cosmic collector in the universe, but the unique modus operandi of the city's disappearance made him realize who was behind it. So, it seems that his brother, Zor-El, was most likely transformed by Brainiac, the most advanced technology in the universe. Batman was shocked. Your planet's technology can't compare to his. Batman, as an ordinary human, effortlessly subdues gunmen and even intervenes in global crises involving extraterrestrial powers. What does he rely on? Apart from his formidable willpower and exceptional combat experience, it's advanced technology that others don't possess, and he knows and respects the power of technology the most. Jor-El shook his head. Your world engine can't compare to him. Bruce Wayne's face shifted between darkness and uncertainty. The world engine is a machine that can reshape planetary terrain and environments, something that only exists in science fiction. If Brainiac possesses even more advanced technology than that, what could he not do? Destroy the Earth with a single shot? Turn billions of people to ashes in an instant? How to prevent this? So, when he said that there would be no dust left on the Earth, it was not an exaggerated threat. Brainiac does have that ability. Jor-El was silent for a moment and answered. So, when will your creator arrive? Just like Clark, Batman's face changed drastically as he impatiently looked at the mechanical Superman, demanding an answer. Right now, the mechanical Superman replied, What? 
Clark, who is still feeling weak from the exposure to the red sun, was taken aback. He looked at David, his throat feeling dry for some unknown reason. What does he mean by right now? The three of them fought hard and defeated the powerful enemy. Before they could recover, an even more terrifying enemy appeared. An existence called the Creator by the extremely powerful mechanical Superman? Jor-El glanced at the spaceship outside the Earth's atmosphere, his expression grim as he vaguely guessed what was happening. Brainiac is an artificial life form. He doesn't have a physical body, or you could say he has countless bodies. He can absorb the knowledge of thousands of living planets in an instant, allowing him to exist in multiple places simultaneously, or not, depending on his choice. David, not particularly surprised, joined the other two and looked up at the spaceship in Earth's orbit. Inside the skeletal spaceship, a tall figure with numerous nutrient tubes plugged into its back, like a slumbering god, opened its eyes with a strong sense of displeasure. Zorel, you have disappointed me greatly, but, considering the slight surprise this planet has given me, I'll spare you this time. On the steel throne, Brainiac, who came here across the universe with his consciousness, calmly displayed a series of images and information regarding David's battle. He rubbed his chin, as if he were a scientist about to dissect a lab rat, showing an inhuman lack of compassion. Formidable physique, the ability to absorb energy, manipulate gravity, a powerful unknown race in the universe, or a miraculously evolved postnatal mutation. Perhaps my biological shell can undergo another upgrade. Brainiac stood up and the belt around his waist shone for a moment. He instantly disappeared from his location, performing a spatial jump, and reappeared in the skies above Metropolis. Release my creation. He is my only remaining Kryptonian experimental subject, a precious sample. David was still squeezing the mechanical Superman's neck, suddenly heard a cold and commanding voice from above him. Equals 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 equals. Don't forget to send your power stones. This novel is possible because of a Patreon member request. You can become a Patreon member if you want to request. The link to my Patreon account is given at video discretion. It helps a lot thanks for watching this video. Also if you want to support the author of this novel, the link of the author's credit is given below.